pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I think we're going to have a lot of fun this evening on some of the topics we're going to discuss. Uh, a couple of them are going to be a surprise. We are going to have uh, tonight uh, some information that uh, Brother Cripps is going to be uh, bringing us that I think is going to be uh, not only... A good topic to discuss as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but also just you know for the general listening audience because we're gonna we're gonna all add our two cents in on that. I think it's gonna be wonderful. Uh, and then also we're gonna have Q's Corner, that's what I call it, where Brother Ben is gonna share us the latest uh, information that he has discovered about the whole Q anon. Uh, I don't know if we can. It's fair to frame it as a phenomenon. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I would just call it the QAnon phenomenon because we don't really know what's going on with that. Right. And then also uh, Sister Angel is going to surprise us with her topic a little bit later this evening. But I wanted to take the time to say hello to everyone and, and coming out this evening and joining us. Um, I really do appreciate your time. And I hope this will be as as, as it, I know it will be for us because we really do look forward to this and enjoy it because normally when we're talking to other people, we might get that little twilight zone moment where they're looking at us like, like they, you can hear the music because they don't, they don't know what we're talking about. They don't understand. And when we can come together and share our ideas and bounce them off of one another, knowing we're not going to get that twilight zone moment <laughs> from the other people we're talking to, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite fun. But tonight on the panel, I have brother Jason Chris, would you like to say hello brother yeah sure hello everyone I'm excited to be here sorry I missed uh, last week but I felt like it was a good thing uh, let the ladies have it on that one and they did such a great job with the with their particular topic I had wanted to to kind of weigh in on stuff but I had such a busy day last uh, Saturday and and sister Lisa doesn't hold things against me for sure and I know that uh, uh, it's not a big deal but I just wanted to uh, say that I love uh, showing up and I'm glad I'm uh, allowed to come back again and again. I like being uh, on the show. So I look forward to tonight and everyone's topic and look forward to having people help me with my topic because I definitely do want some feedback on on that. And we'll get to that uh, shortly, but I'm glad to be here. And I'll just say a quick hello to everyone in the chat, people that uh, a lot of you I, I keep seeing again and again, and I consider you uh, friends and brothers and sisters in the Lord. So that's good. Glad you're here. Thank you so very much, Brother Cripps. I appreciate that. Uh, I have someone in the chat asking, do you have a channel that uh, they can check out? So if you could put that, uh, if you're able to pop over there and put the channel name you'd like them to check out, because I know you have a couple of different. The one you're using tonight is not the one I think your content is on. Am I right? Okay, there uh, it is. In the chat, yeah. In the chat, I always use the, the channel that has the content for that very right. reason that if, because the other channels I have don't have any content. So There it I, is for you. If you guys click on that, True Story Live. I don't brother, think you can do that anymore. Um, maybe you could put a link, but in the chat, um, I can't go to user anymore. I can't click on someone's name mm. in the chat. I don't know about you guys. Oh, okay. You I'll can't do it. Yeah. Wait, 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 they took that away. It's... It was just a real evil thing they did to make sure people couldn't connect. 
they took the uh, go to user function away so you can't click on links anymore and uh, yeah. in the chat name. All right, I'll put the link okay. in there. Hold on. Yeah, uh, you can't. She's right. I just tried to click on it. And the person yeah, who evil. just just chimed in there and has called them evil is uh, Sister Angel. Sister Angel's on our panel tonight. Hey, Sister guys. Angel, why don't you give a shout out to everyone out oh, there? Sorry, the car is moving. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's just something that really, like, there's no ex explanation for that except just m malice, really, and uh, and uh, an attempt to uh, keep people, I think, it's almost impossible now to try to, you know, find somebody if you're going through the chat, try to click on their channel. It's like, you have to try to search it out, and most of the time, unless... I don't know. I, I don't even know how how you get lucky enough to type in someone's channel name and have the right one come up. But uh, but yeah. So it's just a, just to keep people apart, I think. But uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm sorry I wasn't uh, on the fellowship Friday last night. I had uh, while well, my car broke down with all of the kids in the car. It was a pretty big ordeal. So uh, I by the time I got home, I just I, I totally slipped my mind until it was like an hour in. But uh, yep, good to good to be here, and uh, uh, always always good to always good to be here on Saturday. And I guess I'll introduce myself. Um, it's <laughs> no. <good. laughs> well, I, I don't well, know what happened. I don't know what happened. But uh, yeah, you're next, well, guys. Just... I'm sorry about that. Oh, that no. was a. Um, that was a me malfunction. Okay. Uh, I put I went to push the mute button. Uh, where uh, we released it, I have it on my headset, and it didn't it didn't want to cooperate right then. So, uh, no, brother Ben, you won't have to introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Now we have our tech. I'm gonna call him a tech genius because he's the one that is doing all the production. He's the one that's handling all the um, the imagery. If we do go to any tonight. And uh, did you know? Made sure the introduction got played right and all of that. And that's Brother Ben, and he's going to be doing our Q corner tonight, telling us about all things Q. Brother Ben, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, uh, yeah, it's good to get, be here again with you guys. I'll, I'll always look forward to the casual conversation, um, and that's what I consider this as just a you know a friendly co conversation among b true believers. And um, and I always love where we go, uh, even though I don't necessarily know where where we're going to go. So looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I, I'd really be lost without the panel. I, I mean, I could have done like one-on-one -on -one stuff, uh, but the, the Lord gave me this idea a few weeks back. And uh, after <laughs> just prior to this, I hadn't even received this. I didn't tell you guys this. I'm going to share this with you on the air. Just prior to coming to uh, deciding to do this, I had a, a spiritual attack. And I won't go into detail about it. Uh, I did share it with one other sister. but uh, And I was like, well, look, what is that about? Well, now I know what it was about. Because the enemy, when you get ready to do something that's going to bring glory and honor to the, to the Lord, uh, he don't want that. He doesn't want that. And he certainly, certainly doesn't want believers coming together uh, in, in fellowship. And he'll try to prevent it, especially when we're going to be talking about Things that you couldn't go to most churches and talk about and have these types of discussions. And, you know, they'd be probably jumping up, calling us heretic and, you know, clenched true. fist and throwing us out by the scruff of our neck that or the seat of true. our past. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So this is the form. If you're just joining us tonight, first of all, welcome. And the, the, the whole idea that I got was to have a conversation, you know, you get together with family and you sit there and people are having their favorite beverage, whether it's coffee or tea or soda, and you're just catching up on the last time you were together and w what the Lord might have done that was wondrous in your life or things that he showed you that you had never seen before, either in his word or through the media and you see what's going on spiritually and you want to have a discussion about it. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do that and just let people listen in? And that's where the whole concept came from. And I really believe it was from the Lord. So uh, I always like to I try to remember to give a disclaimer that some of the things we're going to muse about tonight or discuss uh, that we're having a conversation about our insights and things that we just see I did bouncing off of one another based upon the scriptures, based upon what we see in the scriptures. The context is we are all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. him crucified, buried, resurrected on the third day, ascended 
and seated at the right hand of the Father, coming again in power mm. and great glory. Mm. So that's where we are. So let's understand that we're all family. If you're a believer, you're family too. And so you're just listening in on our conversation, and we do welcome your uh, comments in the chat. We're, we hope you'll keep it topic related. Uh, I, I don't want to see any any quabbling. That's not what we're here to do. So please, everybody, be respectful, and let's have a discussion this evening. And if I see questions, if you could put your questions in all caps, that would help me. So I could, uh, if it's topic related, so we can uh, bring it up. Uh, it just helps because the chat runs by so fa so fast sometimes. Uh, the one I'm doing this, it would be a great assistance to me, and I thank you guys for that in advance. Now. Um, I wanted to say one other thing. Uh, I don't like coming on here at any time and having to go into the chat and try to correct some of the trolls <laughs> or, or because it, it distracts me from the focus of what we're talking about and whether people are discussing. Mm -hmm. And I trust that my moderators who are there are going to do a good job this evening. No confusion, no name calling. I don't care. Just go ahead, block them. If they call names, block them. Now, I'm not talking to the base here. I'm not talking to the, I'm preaching to the choir on that. I'm talking about those trolls that come in and try to stir up trouble. So hopefully that won't be the problem uh, tonight. It won't happen this evening. So without any further delay, uh, Brother Cripps, I'm going to talk to you about your topic this evening, which is. Now, I just kind of paraphrase what, uh, what you yeah. had uh, texted me, which is people uh, clinging to their own righteousness and, and basically rejecting the righteousness of Christ when it comes to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did I frame that correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely, that's definitely part of it. And I can go into okay. more detail about what direction I want to go with that particular. That, that is the basis it's the only basis I can think of would be the reason why these people refuse to just believe the, the straight gospel, why they want to add things to it, is that they're counting on their own righteousness. They'll, they'll say they're not. They'll even throw Jesus' name in there and say, oh, yeah, it's all, it's, you, know, Christ, Christ, you know, Christ alone through faith alone, but, and then they add other stuff to it, which... Uh, leads me to the conclusion that they are counting on something else other than what Christ did, because it, it's as if it's not good enough what he did. We we gotta we gotta endure to the end. We gotta add to it. Uh, we have to be holy as he is as he is holy. Uh, and they think that that's actually possible, which means they have to be counting on their own righteousness in some way. But I definitely want feedback from mm. others on that. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I couldn't say that any better. Uh, that is something I've noticed. I told you I have someone who is in my family that teeters on the whole lordship. I, I, I want to say the lordship damnation thing, but it, it's almost too that they slide back and forth between the back, backloading works thing. Uh, and, and I noticed that a lot of people that are believers hold this um, double-mindedness, if you will, like James talks about, because yeah. they don't seem to understand that we started from the touchdown zone. You know what I mean? We started from the end zone. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not starting back on the one-yard line trying to make it to the end zone. Oh, that we is all... beautiful. What? Oh, oh my goodness. A, a football analogy from Sister Lisa that nailed it. Okay. All right. Keep okay. going. Don't let me Just to give you a little uh, footnote behind that, which my dad, when I was born, my dad loved football. He was a football freak. And, and when I was born, uh, I remember when I got old enough for him to handle me like that. One day, let's say I'm about yeah, maybe nine, 10 months old, 11 months old, somewhere in there. He grabs me like a football, puts me under his arm and was running. And my mother about <laughs> freaked. She about lost it. She said I was busting up laughing. I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. But he, he, she was like, don't you do my baby like that. But I was, was probably the only four-year-old four who knew who the fearsome foursome was. Mm. 
Wow. <laughs> Brother Cripps, do you remember that? Uh, the Fearsome f- Foursome. Was it, uh, was it Oakland? That was the Los Angeles Rams. Oh, okay. Los Angeles Rams. Yeah, they're not together anymore. Or didn't they didn't they just go back to LA? Is that right? Oh, you oh, see now so you just stumped me because I didn't say I continued to follow. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't I don't um I don't know what the status is on uh, the Rams at this point. They've okay. done so much where they went back and forth yeah, from St. Louis, Louis back and yeah. Right. I kind of lost touch after they went to St. Louis and came back. Right. Uh, let's see. But if right. I remember, no, I don't think I can do it. Okay, the Fearsome Foursome. I know one was Rosie Greer. Oh, that was The other old, one was Deacon was Jones. Yeah. Yes, that was the, I'm talking about old. That's old, yeah. Now, I wasn't old. I was a child, but like I said, I was the only four-year-old that knew, right. <laughs> that knew who the fearsome foursome was. But you guys can look it up. Yeah, that's I'll, West Coast. That's West Coast. I'll put a right link there. in the description yeah. since we did, we referenced it. But yeah. uh, that's how much he loved football. And he used to he when he became a believer, he would use a lot of different analogies, like the one that I just used to to get yeah. us to learn. And you know, he explained the whole game. I knew I knew all of it. I knew when they threw a flag, what they were throwing in the floor, that kind of stuff. Because I really was into it. I was really mm-hmm. watching it. But that's what people want to do. They, they they seem to think that the Lord did not start us in – I'm not even saying at the 99-yard line. He started us in the end zone. Touchdown. It's done. Mm-hmm. You know, but they don't. Get that. They want to start us all the way back as yeah. though we have to do something yes. to move forward in Christ. And I, I can't figure that out. But go ahead, brother. Brother Chris. No, no, I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, I wanted people to add add to the topic. And you, I haven't even really gotten into it yet. And already you're adding to it. We could just stop there. That's you know, well, we start out in the end zone because of what he already did. He already won the game. The Amen. game won. We're not playing any kind of game here. We're not. We're, oh my gosh! So <laughs> that, that's beautiful. That really is. Praise beautiful. the Lord. Praise, yeah, the praise Lord. the Lord indeed. Praise the Lord indeed. Um, yeah. So uh, for those of you that heard me talk about this, uh, so this all comes uh, for me out of uh, someone that had claimed to be uh, believe in Christ alone through faith alone, nothing added uh, before, and now he's completely changed and started uh, uh, preaching a. a gospel that uh we're not we're not saved like uh like lisa just said using an analogy saying we start off in the end zone we, to me which is being saved the victory's already been won we're not winning anything we're not striving for salvation but he uh has changed uh over now the truth is probably he never really believed it now, that, mm. that's the conclusion i have to come to because if you believe it if you really believe that we're starting off in the end zone and that we don't have to win anything, that Christ has won the victory, that's not up to what we do, of course we live a good life. Of course we do the best we can to follow in Christ's footsteps and we try to follow his two commandments, which wrap up all the law and prophets, which I'm sure we all know what those what those two commandments are. One is not an old, it, One is not a new one. It's been around forever. It's it's within the Ten Commandments, but love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're able to do that, uh, if, if you are a person that's able to do that without God's help, then yes, he would not have needed to send his son into the world. If you can perfectly love God with everything in you and perfectly love your neighbor, then you are a righteous son of a gun. And it, it, if if it was on us to do that, without the help of the Holy Spirit, if it was on us to do that, then we'd be talking about a different gospel. Mm-hmm. So, so this this gentleman, uh, his name is Shade, and he uh, has a, a YouTube page, and I he just posted uh, yesterday, I believe, he just posted a, uh, a new video with him street preaching. And mm-hmm. it took me back to when I was a kid. I remember the first uh, quote-unquote street preacher that I ever saw. I was probably five or six years old. And my dad, uh, uh, he has uh, been in a uh, Christian uh, gospel group uh, for as long as I can remember. He's still doing it today. He's 72 years old. He's about to be 73 here at the end of June. And he's still doing it. 
But because of that, I had the opportunity to travel all around the, uh, the East Coast to different um, music festivals and different kinds of churches, all different denominations, because they would sing. They would book uh, in certain churches, and they would get a chance to sing in different uh, congregations. So um, uh, there's a lot of stories that come out of that, and I'll save those for another night. But the first time I remember seeing a, a, a street preacher was at, uh, it was called the Sunshine Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be even people that remember that. It was a, it was a pretty big deal back in the uh, 70s. Um, it would be like the Christian Woodstock would be the, would mm -hmm. be the best way I know. It. All the Christian artists back then that were any, anybody would uh, be booked at these things. And um it was like a three-day festival. It was outdoors. They would have uh, tents and stuff, and they would have, um, you know, like food trolleys and things like that. And people would camp out. They would bring their tents and campers and all that, and they would just make make a three-day uh, event out of it. And while we were there, okay, so again, I'm a kid, and I'm listening to the music and stuff, and I'd find other friends to play with, and um, there were some, uh, uh, we were actually, uh, staying in my dad's, uh, uh coach. So they always had uh, some kind of bus. Uh, then my dad, uh, he's also a carpenter. So he built rooms in it, uh, four, usually four rooms. That was all that could fit in there, but they had bunk beds in it. So when I traveled, I would sleep on the, on the bunk and that's what we stayed in while I was there. So anyway, that's an, enough background probably on that. But um, there was a guy there that had this huge pole. It was a huge pole. Now, I don't remember what the sign said, but I do remember it had repent on it. Now, mm -hmm. my guess would be it said something like repent, the, the uh, judgment is coming or the Lord is to your your uh, redemption draweth nigh or, or something to that effect, which is is not untrue. Uh, I, I'm not arguing tonight that re our redemption isn't drawing nigh or that his judgment is coming. That's not the issue. Uh, but I remember this guy speaking, and uh, us kids, of course, were very interested. We went and talked to this guy. And my dad was angry, and he came over there, and he he took me by the shoulder. He wasn't angry with me. Just let me make that clear. He wasn't angry with me. Mm -hmm. But he had some choice words for this guy, and he took me away from, from this group of kids that were listening to this guy. Mm. At, at five years old, I didn't understand what the deal was, but I understand now. So mm -hmm. my question for the panel is, why is it that – now, I'm sure there are, um, there are examples that don't follow the rule that I've seen. But why is it that it seems like every street preacher that I've seen, now I'm not counting Brother Luke in this, because Brother Luke has said, and he's told stories about him having been a, been a street preacher, but even in his stories, he has shared that people he worked with mm -hmm. were like this as well. So why is it that when they're preaching the quote-unquote gospel, it's not the same gospel we believe, Christ alone through faith alone with nothing added, but it's a gospel of the anger and uh, mm. and judgment of God without the love of God. It, it's not about how much God loves us and how much he cares for us, and then he sent his son into the world. It's all about sin and judgment. That's my question. Mm. Yes. This, this uh, former brother, or maybe it's just that I thought he was a brother and I was wrong. That's a possibility. I can be wrong. But this, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, person, Shade, I, I watched, it was like 38 minutes long, something like that. I watched the whole thing just to make sure that I got it all in context. Mm -hmm. He did say to one passerby, and he seems really nice. It's not like he's just yelling at people and, mm -hmm. and all. He seems nice on the surface, seems really nice. Um, he did say to one person, God loves you. One time, I counted one time that he actually said uh, to someone, God loves you. But the rest of the time was all about, uh, he did preach Christ crucified. He did. Mm -hmm. But then it's all about judgment. Do you know you're mm -hmm. going to heaven? Uh, do you know you're going to heaven? And uh, are you ready? You know, are you ready? Are, are you ready to face the judgment of God? You're all going to be judged. We're all going to be judged. And how much sin there is in the world. No. Mm -hmm. and, and they're probably accusing them of how much they love their sin as well. Um, that's typical. I, I think the well, a couple of things, Chris. I think uh, I think the Bible is there's a number of examples in the Bible 
Uh, I know these are disputed, but I, I've studied these carefully, and I, I'm absolutely convinced that there's uh, Galatians, Hebrews, and Second Peter, uh, Jude are all really admonitions or warnings to believers not to fall away. Not their general, their believers are already born again. That's confirmed early in the chapters, but their warnings to continue mm -hmm. uh, and not to you know not to be deceived by false teachers or whatever, and not to basically uh, go astray uh, because it could have uh, temporal consequences. Um, so I think people can be deceived. I think Galatians makes that very clear. Uh, they start off in the spirit and then they um, they fall back into law. But mm -hmm. uh, what I find is that those tr street preachers and they can deny it. Uh, they might even be successful in denying denying it to themselves. But I think deep down uh, they're there because they think they're saving themselves or they think they're doing something righteous. They're not out there at, at, out of the care of as they claim of of you know, uh, saving people from perishing, they are out there earning their salvation, essentially. Thank mm -hmm. you. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why you see those Jehovah's oh, yeah. Witnesses. They'll sit out there for hours. Like I, I, I travel to Columbus periodically uh, for work. Oh, and I uh, and I see these uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses out there all the time, just standing there, like three or four of them uh, out, outside, standing out there for like 10, 12 hours a day and no one comes up to them. They don't say anything to anyone, but they think they'll oh, just be by big there, you know, that they're earning your salvation. They're making themselves available. Um, you know, they, they're hopefully going to be one of the 144,000. I, I know uh, uh, the hope of witness is extreme, but I, I think this other guy, any work based salvation, like Lisa says all the time, it's a spirit, spirit of violence. It's a, it's, the, they're, they're, they're under the law because they put themselves, mm -hmm. keep themselves under the law, and the law devours uh, like wolves. It, it devours you, and it it, it uh, devours yes. they devour each other with with the law. Keep on biting and uh, provoking each other. And it I mean, how they ask how you, how do you know if you're going to heaven? But if they have a false gospel, like that's one of these deceiving things. Like they don't know if they're going to heaven. Mm -hmm. If they think you're happy, mm -hmm. you can lose your salvation. So I always think it's weird when these lordshippers. Uh, say that because that that's the question they need to ask like how could they even think that they know if they think that they can lose their salvation based on whatever they fall into later on in life you know it's uh, interesting you bring that up yes. because uh, someone actually said that he he, uh, he asked him do you know you're going to heaven he said yes and he he said and this is a good question what makes you think that it's a great mm -hmm. question what makes you think that mm -hmm. and the guy said you know because i'm a good person and then he had him it's the it's the Ray Comfort copy right mm -hmm. there that you use the law to show people, you know, and he, he went through the whole thing. It, it, was, it was sickening to me because it, it, it's just Ray Comfort. That's a, it, it's the Ray Comfort pattern for street witnessing, which you mm -hmm. you say, well, have you lied? And I'll say, well, sure, I've lied. Well, have you had a, a bad thought about a woman or, or a man and whatever the case may be? Yeah, well, yeah, I've done that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then a lot of them will say, well, I've never murdered anybody. You know, they always have something that they want to throw in there that they didn't do. But the point is, you get them to say those things and it says, well, by the, by, you know, I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you. But by right. what, what you just said, you, you know, you, you uh, are, are ready for uh, God's judgment. <laughs> you're, by, your, by your own admission, you're a liar. You're a thief. You're a murderer. Yeah, that's, that's right. a, a for, very formulaic of uh, the yep. comfort yep. The gospel. Yeah. So that's what's happening. That, that's the next step. Um, and then also, I'll just add really quickly that he has uh, made an announcement that he's uh, being led by the Lord to kind of move away from his Facebook uh, ministry because mm -hmm. it's just full of uh, bad stuff and with everything going on in the world and, and all that. And he's referring people to his YouTube page. And, and my, this is probably a separate topic, but I wonder what the difference is in his mind. What the difference is between YouTube and Facebook? Uh, you um, know. It's easier. It's easier to hide from challenges from people like you if it's on YouTube. Mm. Oh yeah, rather than you. on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you. Angel. That's what it is. Yeah. Comment <laughs> Can I? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Go oh, okay. Ahead. I just want to make sure because uh, I want to. I want to say something that I want to ask a question here. Uh, I. Well, let me frame it this way. I, I don't have a problem with the whole Ray Comfort spiel uh, about bringing people into the knowledge that they are sure. sinners. Because a lot of people don't think they're bad enough for hell. That's obvious. Yeah. And it's really not even saying bad. Because I keep saying, first of all, 
the Lord is on a search and rescue mission, not a search and destroy mission. So all sin has been punished in Jesus. He incurred that wrath. He incurred the, the penalty for our sins. The, the thing is, though, you have to make people aware that they are not good enough for heaven because heaven requires perfection, sinless perfection. And by bringing them into the consciousness that you are a sinner, because most people know I they've tried to stop doing stuff and couldn't stop doing it. Yeah. So they go, well, OK, you bring them into the consciousness that they they are indeed a sinner because some people sure. think, oh, no, I'm not better. I never killed anybody. That right. That's not the standard. The standard is not whether or not you ever murdered anybody. Right. The fact is you all together born in sin and shaping in iniquity. So. I don't mind that they do that. It's just the problem is, is that they leave people there. Thank and then you. they tell them that you have to truly repent of all your sins, which most people don't even know what the heaven that means. Yeah. Because they're spinning the, the meaning of repent to be contrition, yeah. attrition, or godly sorrow. Yep. Yeah. And it's not. The repentance is from unbelief, which I know I'm preaching to the choir here, to faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's not the message that they present. Hey, now what I just showed you was just to to just to show you that you you are a sinner and that the Lord requires perfection without sin at all. Zero goose egg, none, not a zip, yep. zilch. So how do you get back? This is what I keep trying to tell people. How do you get back to zero? If you are and in sin, how do you get back to zero? Go ahead, sister. One of the things I always like to add when I say what God's standard is, because I think about somebody like myself, which, you know, had you said that to me, God's standard is perfection. My first thought would have been, well, what a jerk, what a taskmaster, you know, what a tyrant, like how that's not even fair. You know, we can't even be perfect. Why does he need it? Why does he require perfection? And so I always say, and it's just my supposition, but I always say, you know, you cannot grant like guaranteed irrevocable immortality to even the smallest sin, because if you give it a, an infinity to snowball, you know, I, I gave them the analogy of like, um, like a bullet, right? Like a sniper's bullet. Um, they, they have to take into account the wind direction and everything like that, because if they have a target very far away, um, even the smallest deviation from course uh, of their bullet um, um, over that long distance can uh, you know uh, accumulate into like being you know you know you know 50 feet off their target you know go kill somebody else or whatever um and and it's important i think to give them a rational reason like why it would be important not to grant uh, a sinful person immortality because i said you know i think that my my belief is that it would end up to be you know something very similar to satan himself you know, because he's not, you know, obviously he's not immortal. He's been guaranteed irrevocable immortality, but he has, you know, he's, he's immortal as far as we're concerned right now. Cause he, you know, he, he's not going to die until God deals with him. Um, and, um, and even then, you know, not necessarily going to die. He's going to continue in, you know, torment. But um, the point is, is that it, it, he, God can't allow you to be guaranteed immortality because once he gives it to you, he doesn't take it back if you have sin within you still because over an infinity you know what do you think even the smallest sin might might amount to and also um you know it's 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 like you know a quarantine effort right mm -hmm. so if he's mm -hmm. going to make a new heaven and a new earth earth he has to keep he has to keep you know the sin out of it he has you know he doesn't it's like almost be like an infection of, of you know of the new creation I, I i i sense now these aren't things that are you know thus says the lord but i i try to give these um things things for people to chew on because if they're like me the first like like i, I almost wince when people tell them god's standard is perfection because i know how i would have felt had somebody said that to me in the past i would have i would have not understood what well why why is the standard perfection? And, you know, one thing I like to ask people is, well, let me ask you something. Do you think you're, you're like, do you yourself or do you, does anyone you know that you can even think of, do any of them deserve to become an immortal? 
<laughs> do they deserve immortality? Which is essentially like, as far as we're concerned, compared to us, like it's like godhood. It might as well be godhood. Do any of them deserve that? Did you, you deserve that? Can you honestly say you deserve immortality? Um, because if you really put it into perspective, then they they might be able to see the reasoning behind it. And it's not that just God is just being a jerk. You know, he's not mm -hmm. just being a hard ass. <laughs> that he's actually, uh, you know, and, and here's the good news, too, is that he doesn't expect you to be perfect. So why does it, you know, like, don't even get your hackles up. You know what I mean? He doesn't actually expect you to be perfect. He, 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 he knows you can't do it. So that's why he made it so easy and foolproof for you to, 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 to put on his righteousness, to wear his righteousness, um, because he knows you can't do it. So why do you even, why are you even worried about what his standard is? You know, when he doesn't expect you to meet it, he just, he, it's a, it's a legal technicality. It's a technicality well, where you, you're standing, you know, um, you, you're legally, it's, it's almost like a, like a plea deal or something. Right. What were you going to mm -hmm. say, Ben? No, I was just saying well, your analogy is very apt because that's why, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, so they, it, because th they had the chance to eat out of the, tr the tree of life and live forever in their physical flesh, and God did, what, didn't want that to happen, and so He cast them out of the garden so they could eat it and be mm -hmm. imperfect forever, which is what you, you were just basically saying. Right, right, right. Well, right. Th there was some. There was a point that I was trying to make though about how God is on a search and rescue mission. Because Absolutely. he is not perfect angry at the sinner anymore. And this is what a lot of <clears throat> preachers don't understand. So, okay, just like that little child, if they got themselves into come some kind of pickle, you're, you're, you're not going to scold them until you get, get them out. And you may not even ever scold them. What you're going to do is you're going to race up. You're going to try to get them. If, if you imagine a child, a little small child got tangled up in some barbed wire. And they're crying and they're, at, they're screaming for help. Who but an idiot is going to run? I mean, you would have to be a devil to want to run to them and attack them for getting caught up in the barbed wire. Your first thing is going to get them out of it. And then you're going to tend to their wounds. And then you might have a conversation about what happened, but it's, ne it's not going to be to attack them for getting caught up in the barbed wire. The Lord is, is, is trying to reach people who are lost. He is not angry at them anymore. And when people come from the position, and again, I was talking about specifically people who deny that they're even sinners. There are some people who think I've never oh, sinned no, at all. Oh, no, I totally agree. I totally agree with you. I know what you're saying. I, I'm just saying even I think like you understood that you were a sinner as a small child. Like I was mm. so stubborn and prideful. I didn't even understand that as a child at all. And so I was trying to come with the right of like some people you're dealing with, they are so prideful and like just out of it, like just have no humility um, that they won't even, they'll, they'll buck up because you say God's standard is perfection and they'll, they'll find a way to make like, like to take issue with that where you can't even get past it. Like you're, they're going to stop hearing you at that point because they're, that's, they, that, that's, you know what I mean? I, I think I also too, I, I think that, that, uh, dysfunction is a good analogy, but also I think, uh, letting yes, them know. Entropy. Yeah. It, and, oh yes. And also it's a disease. Say you have a disease yep. you need to cure. You know, so the law helps you identify that you have the disease, but but like you said, um, Ray Comfort and them, they they uh, they, all they do is point out your blemishes uh, and expect you to heal you know uh, heal thyself. Um, whereas Christ is the healer; he's the great physician, and they, yeah. they don't um, they don't go into that at all. And that was the first thing that reached life. my brother. Yeah, that's the, the point. The Sorry, no, I just did the, the disease analogy that actually reached my little brother when nothing else mm. would. Was compared because mm -hmm. because people think it's a judgment call, especially once you once you talk about even like the smallest like white lie is uh is 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 you know make you qualify for help. They need to reframe it because they've heard some of these street preachers be like so judgmental and they're talking down to them, at, 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 and so they're, they they get this defensive wall up and then they start making excuses. Well, what what's even the big deal about that? Why should I go to hell for that? Why is God such a you know perfectionist? Blah blah blah. blah. And, and, and so I'm just, I, I, I was just even just trying to say, once you say that, depending on who you're dealing with and where they're at, it can be good to also ameliorate all those, those defenses by, by giving them a different way of looking at what sin is and also 
um, a way of understanding why God can't allow it, you know, why it has to be perfection and not just because God's a big meanie, <laughs> right? But also always reminding him it doesn't even, why, you know, this is just your pride talking because God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He, he knows you can't. Right. That's why he did it for you. But sorry, you go know, on, guys. Sorry. I just, whenever well, that now, I was going to say, like to bring that up. You, you are, you are right. And I, I did, there's only a specific group, people group that I would even use the perfection example. Uh, the, the more, I think, a accurate description would, would actually be uh, that God is thrice holy and sin is, cannot enter his presence. It's not that he's trying to do anything to anyone. It is the state we are in as the result the of the fall. Everyone is born into this condition. And they cannot enter the presence of a thrice holy God unless they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. But go ahead. Reconciliation. Now, that, that, that's, that's the word that describes what God's doing. You, uh, you correctly state, Lisa, that it's a rescue mission, a search and rescue. That's absolutely correct. And why, though? Why does, why do we need, why does he need to do a search and rescue? And you just stated it because we are born into sin. We're born sinful. We're born out of favor of God. We're born out of relationship with God. He wants to reconcile with us. And the way that Amen. he did that, he knew we couldn't reconcile, reconcile ourselves to him, right? Yep. If, we, if we could, Jesus would have not needed to come. If right. the blood of uh, goats and bulls and, and lambs and whatever, all the different things that were sacrificed uh, under the, the uh, sacrificial system, if that was enough, then, yeah, Jesus wouldn't have not needed to come. But that's mm -hmm. not the case. We are incapable. All the big yes. heavy hitters in the Bible were incapable of being righteous outside of, of Christ's redemption. Mm -hmm. they, they were. The, who, who would you say is the best person, just looking at the big heavy hitters in, in the Bible, Old or New Testament, other than Jesus, who would you say was the most uh, uh, righteous? Paul. Okay, Paul. Jo Joseph. Joseph, yeah. Um, it's interesting you said Joseph. Paul. Jo Joseph was, was yeah, he, he was a pretty good guy. But do you remember how he got into trouble in the first place? Was his, his <laughs> oh, was it a rooster? <laughs> oh, the yeah, rooster sorry, had guys, Yeah, I'm going to mute. Yeah, they're, they're, they're <laughs> fussing. Yeah, they hear me out here. I'm watering what, my uh, Sister plant. Paula, translate, translate for us. What did the rooster say? My, that's my little, my little, uh, my little jerk rooster, my little mini rooster. He, uh, he probably said, uh, uh, he's trying to pick a fight. Basically, he's trying to pick a fight with me. He's so, he's the size of a pigeon. It's so hilarious. But my big rooster, who's huge, he's the sweetest thing in the whole world. It's so funny to see the rehearsal. <laughs> my big rooster won't. He's just like the most loving thing ever. It's like that's another God thing, by the way. That's like impossible. Oh. No one, no one has a rooster like that with all these hens. But God bless me because that was the first thing that happened when I found out I had a rooster. Not a hen. I prayed. I just said, "Make it work, Lord." I got small kids. I'm not going to kill him. So he did. He okay. did. I, he did. <laughs> we don't. We don't want to forget Brother Cripps's point. He, Brother Cripps, you were yes. going to make a point about Joseph and how he got into trouble. Yeah, he got in trouble because yeah. he was bragging in front of his brother yep. about all his dreams. Now that wasn't right, right either, but doesn't make him. No, it wasn't right. Barely, but it wasn't right. But if I had to, it pick was almost somebody, like an innocence that, that, like that I that like I thought was like. like the closest you could get because it, it still ain't it's just like he said that's that's the whole point like with the rich young ruler when jesus talked about it it's it's always one it, it, it can just be one thing but that one thing cannot enter the presence of a thrice holy god but go ahead no no that you're you you made the point so david even david was called by god a man after his yeah. own heart but what did he do he had an affair and then had the man killed so <laughs> That's how you know it was about David's heart. Murder and that, 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 that was adultery. All about yeah. Murder and adultery. Murder and adultery. Now, yeah. when he was yes. confronted with it, he said, you, you, "When, um, well, help me out. What was the name of the prophet that uh, told the story about the the lamb?" Uh, yeah. Oh, Nathan. Darn it. Nathan. Nathan. Thank you. So Nathan tells him the story, and he uses a word picture story, you know, to to. And when he was done telling the story about the lamb that was taken taken away and blah, 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 
Uh, and then David was incensed. He was just angry because he had been yes. a shepherd. So he was mm-hmm. like, oh, this, this man needs to do have this happen. He needs to all that. And he says, you are the man. And then it struck him in yes. one moment what he was talking about. And he right. did, quote, unquote, repent. Repent. Repented yes. from his behavior. And he threw himself on the mercy of God. That's what he did. But my point is there was no one perfect. And then uh, Selene said Job. And that's a that's a pretty good mm-hmm. uh, example mm-hmm. of someone who's righteous. And then uh, Chris Ann pointed out that Job was wrapped in his own righteousness. Uh, so mm-hmm. there, the, the point is, even all the big heavy hitters in the Bible, every single one of them were not up to God's mm-hmm. standard of perfection. Mm-hmm. They could not. Uh, reconcile with God on their own account. They could not do it. There's none righteous. There's none righteous. So getting back to the kind of what I wanted to make a point that Lisa made, um, I agree with you, Lisa, that there's not a problem with the Ray Comfort with using that technique to get someone to realize. And Angel added a couple things to that too. Uh, Yeah, there's a lot of people out there. And even in this uh, street preaching thing, there were people that said, yeah, because I, you know, I try to do good. That's their answer. But you said, Lisa, and I agree, this is the point. They, they, they don't move away from that and tell them other than you need to repent. You need, and when they say repent, they mean you need to be good. You need to quit drinking. You need to quit smoking. You need to quit looking at porn. I'm not, I'm not saying, especially the porn, I'm not and saying, be sorry. Yeah. And be sorry. Yeah. You have to have, you have to have a contrite heart. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so they leave the, the person there uh, in that place. Um, and with street preachers, that's what I'm seeing. That's what I've always seen. Uh, I never remember uh, a street preacher preaching grace, love and grace. It's all mm-hmm. about hell, damnation, judgment's coming. You better. <laughs> that's and what that, it's all about. Yes. And that's very telling, too, because, again, they're out there trying to earn their own salvation or prove that they're righteous. Because you don't mm-hmm. you don't see uh, you know people who have the true gospel typically doing that. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly fine. But um, I think you know people with the true gospel are a little bit more um, – sly or um you know uh oh we're just more we're smarter about how we approach the gospel you know i don't think a lot of people need to be preached to directly and you know not not this day and age necessarily um Mm -hmm. other forms you know i I think it helps not to be you know in your face and and, and screaming at people in in large crowds it's hard to start a conversation that way like for me I, i think street preaching would be very hard because i try to be like a real targeted assassin when it comes to how i give the gospel to a, a particular person because I don't want to hit ha- like I want to know what what their hang up is a little bit by feeling them out first before I hit them with with something that could just send up defenses and make them stop listening so because I I think about how I was and how I just couldn't hear it and um mm-hmm. so for me street preaching would not be a good venue because um it's very hard like you know and I think a lot of the people that do do it um, they're, they have a lot of bluster and, you know, pride to even be out there. Like they're kind of arrogant. Imagine, yeah. you know, being the kind of person where you, you, you feel perfectly comfortable, uh, going out and yelling at people as if, as if somehow you're, you're better and kind of have to yell to, to get, yeah. to get their attention. And uh, not yeah. out the street. I can't even imagine Luke doing it. I'm sure that his technique was was very special and unique um but it's just it's yeah i think that's one reason it's the personality type that that is drawn to that might not be the personality type that's necessarily drawn to the true gospel if you get my grip yeah right. well in his own mind he is better otherwise he wouldn't be street pre- uh, street preaching mm-hmm. i believe and i haven't had a conversation he won't talk to me but i i believe that he thinks that that's helping him add uh to to God's righteousness, mm-hmm. that he that he has to endure to the end. He has to uh, be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, and that's one of the ways that he does that. Is He's making by, his calling mm-hmm. election sure, he thinks. Yes, you know? thank you, yes. Uh, Brother Ben. Absolutely. Right. He even uses that scripture, you know, uh, make your election sure, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, uh, with fear and trembling. That's mm-hmm. the one he uses. With fear and trembling, well, and 
Go ahead. Sister no, Lisa. go. No, no, no. Go ahead. Because I, my next uh, statement might actually take us in another direction. So please finish your thought. I was just going to say that he misunderstands what that scripture uh, means, in my mm -hmm. opinion. It, it, that doesn't mean that we have to bring our own works to the table because what Christ did wasn't good enough. That's not what mm -hmm. it means. Mm -hmm. Christ's work was good enough. We started in the end zone. The minute you accept his free gift, the minute you're saved, and your eyes are open, your ears are open, you understand the gospel, you understand that Christ uh, finished everything. There's no more work that needs to be done by you. You're not helping him at all to keep yourself saved. You're not being saved. You are saved. Now your soul is being sanctified. Sanctification, uh, there's three types in my opinion. There's You're sanctified the moment that you're you're saved. Your soul is sanctified completely. Uh, your soul, your, 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 sorry, your spirit, your spirit sins no longer. Your spirit doesn't that's right. sin. That's what Paul said. That's right. Now your soul, your that's the your your thoughts and your intents and all that. You're also referred to as your heart, I believe. Your soul and your heart are pretty much the same thing, in my opinion. People disagree on that, but uh, just for the sake of argument, your soul is being sanctified. That's true. You're in the process. Your soul is being oh, sanctified. Well, let me let me stop you right there, brother yeah. uh, Krebs. I believe you are correct because when you define the soul, the soul is the emotion, the will, and the intellect. Right. So. When, when, when someone says uh, believe in your heart, it is when your mind is convinced that this is the truth Amen. and that you receive Amen. that. You simply believe it. Mm -hmm. Like I always say about a little child when you when you say, hey, uh, you know, if uh, if you just hang with me and be patient today, uh, mommy and daddy's going to buy you some ice cream. Now, if they know what ice cream is. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to say nothing else. Yeah. And you're even putting an encumbrance on them that Christ doesn't even do, which is that they just be patient and Hang with you. The, it, it, Jesus is just like you want the ice cream. Yeah. You know, and, and this this is it straight, straight up. Yeah. But if a, a little child can understand what that means, uh, the, why do they put – this was what the question I was going to ask you, brother. The, on top of the doctrine that this person is espousing, then they just want to turn it around on us <laughs> who have a profession of faith that we believe. It's yeah. like how much – more do we need to say because what they want they don't want what your profession mm -hmm. the bible says let the redeemed which means it's past tense mm -hmm. the redeemed of the lord say so we say so and they go no nah, don't believe it you don't know how it works mm -hmm. amen but go ahead go ahead bro. <laughs> yeah so one of the things so first of all i want to say angel uh that uh sister lisa you you nailed it and then angel also uh was uh the analogy about the uh Help me out, Angel. You, something about uh, the person. Uh, what I thought of uh, when you were talking was the person's acquitted, and it's like they're saying a plea deal. Yeah, plea deal. It's a so it's a yeah. plea deal, and or after, an Alfred plea uh, specifically, which is where you are. You 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 agree that you're guilty, but you don't have to suffer the sentence. Yeah, yeah. Because That's what Jesus, the Memphis, the West Memphis Three got. <laughs> so you're acquitted. You're at that point. The gavel goes down. You're acquitted. So then people right. want to come and say to you, well, yeah, you're acquitted. You know, yeah, Jesus uh, stood in for you, but, you know, you still have to go out there and not commit crimes. You're still under probation as it comes to salvation. You're under probation. You're not saved. You're being saved. Yeah, he did a good thing for you. But, you know, if you uh, step out of line at all, then you're right back in the same position you were as if Christ never did what he did for you. So that was a I good example. You. We're acquitted. We're acquitted. It means that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's exactly no, one right. more thing. One more thing. There's no double jeopardy. You, you right. Can't, you can't be taken back in. That's a big one. For the, and same tried for the same thing. Tried. Again. Sorry, Ben. Go that's ahead. right. Yes. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, I think that's the thing that one of the key things that's missing in uh, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of teaching nowadays is the, 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 the legal framework of the bible it's absolutely god is absolutely just um you know they doesn't he's not he doesn't grant clemency or leniency mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's absolutely uh, every sentence to be accounted for and um they tend to think that oh okay well yeah christ died for your sins so he made it possible mm -hmm. for you to be saved but now you gotta you gotta show your loyalty to, to him right and they don't and they don't understand that god's just and the only way you reason he has to condemn people to hell is because uh, he's perfectly just, and um, so it's not like um, I lost my thought. <laughs> um, 
Well, it's because of unbelief, though. Well, but Brother what ben. you guys are talking about is something that I have said numerous times that what you're using as your example of being acqu uh, acquitted or found not guilty not because guilty. of Christ, right. pronounced not guilty, then they want to come back and say, okay, now we've, it's, we've seen this in every movie they ever did where somebody is found not guilty. They walk out of the courthouse, they're free, they go live their life. Mm -hmm. But they want to stop you at the door and say, you were found not guilty, but we're going to put you on probation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, as I was going to say, is that they don't understand that what condemns them to hell is sin, and the, the strength of sin is the law. And so the, Christ died to the—you died to the law in Christ, so there's no legal grounds. You know, who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? Because he, it's he himself who justifies and uh, and condemns, you know? And if you're in him, he's already taking care of your sin. It's like, like you said, no double jeopardy. Christ can't put—God doesn't put your sin on Christ and then also on you, Um he took your place. He, he took your place in, in the fallen Adam race. Your your your, your relationship in the in with God's eyes with the the family tree of Adam has been terminated. It died. It's you're totally separated from me. It went to hell, and now you're born again in heaven. I mean, Amen. that's the they don't, yes. so two things. I think that is missed. I think personally, in my estimation, two critical teachings are missing for a lot of for a lot of, a lot of teachings are out there. The legal framework of the Bible that God's perfectly just and and how just just was satisfied. Mm -hmm. Um, and also the identification's true identification truth. You're either in Adam or in Christ. And here's the funny thing is that both of my brothers are, uh, lawyers. One, one is a Harvard law trained lawyer, uh, you know, living the big, you know, <laughs> living it up and he's, he's, he's a millionaire. And my other brother is a, is a lawyer as well. But, and one, one is an atheist or uh, agnostic and one is a believer, but, well, I take that back. He's a non-believer technically, but he's a Catholic. But he can't see. He can't see, even though he's a lawyer. He can't see that legal framework in the Bible. And uh, even though I explain it to him over and over again, he can't see it or doesn't mm -hmm. understand it. I should say. I mean, right. it, it's it's really a hard issue. It's not intellectual at all. It's 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 hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I have a quick story. Now this is from my life. This is a true story. True story live. <laughs> um. So I went to college back in uh, 2000, uh, 2003, four, five, six, uh, no, 2004, 2007. I went to college, went and got a degree. I got a degree in uh, social science, which I, um, uh, uh, the, the main course of study was psychology and sociology. I wanted to uh, possibly be a counselor, go on to get my master's and also uh, theater performance, which was the fun part. I love. So I have a degree in that. So the first part of it, I went to community college because it was cheaper and I could get it done. And I also knew some of the people that went there. It was a lot of fun. So I went and uh, uh, took that route first. And I worked two jobs uh, to, to take care of the first part. And then uh, at the instruction of my mom, she, she said, why don't you get a couple uh, school loans so that you can get through it faster and just get it done. And then you can uh, start going on for your master's. So that was the plan. So mm -hmm. I got two loans. I got a private loan for about $25,000 to help pay for my education. And I got a government loan for about the same amount. So a total of $50,000. Now, this is a beautiful story. It really is. So just bear with me. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated was at the end of 2007 and the recession hit. So none of the jobs that had been available when I was trying to decide what, uh, because my plan was while I'm getting my master's, I probably was going to get it online or take night classes. And then I was going to teach theater or teach psychology in, uh, in a school. Well, they weren't hiring for anything. In fact, people were being laid off left and right. I'm sure a lot of you went through that. You remember what that was like, the recession. Uh, and I couldn't find a job in my field anywhere at the time. I barely found any job uh, as it is. And that's a whole other story. But I, uh, I paid my school loans. You know, once you're uh, six months after you're done with school, you have to start paying your school loans. And I uh, had some money left over and I was paying on the, the both uh, debts for the school loans for a period of time. But then I got to the point where I couldn't pay it anymore. Okay. So I'm in debt. I owe money for these loans that were given to me. 
uh, it's it, 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 things didn't work out the way I had planned, uh, you know, I, out of no control of my own. But here's the story. So not the government loan. I still owe for that. Uh, now, fortunately, they're pretty gracious because they're, they're going to get their money somehow over time. I, uh, so I, I, I still am under the gun for that. But after some years went by, I got a letter in the mail from uh, one of the uh, big banks out there that had, had received my uh, debt for the personal loan that I received. Okay, And the letter read to me that my debt is being forgiven. $25,000 of debt that was forgiven by PNC Bank was the bank that uh, decided to do that. Now, I don't know the background of why they did it. I don't know what kind of things led up to the decision to go ahead and do that. But I did, when I received the letter, I wanted to make sure there wasn't some kind of scam because I had been scanned before with bill collectors and they you know, do all kinds of stuff to get you to call. Then once you call, then they have you on the hook and blah, blah, blah. But I called and inquired and to verify, and actually my sister had someone that was that knew something about this sort of thing. So they checked out the letter and said that it was legitimate. So that means that my debt was forgiven. I was acquitted of that debt. So what they would want me to do, even though I, I have been forgiven that debt, I do not owe them a dime. What they want you to do is they want you to continue to pay on the debt to keep sending checks in to pay for something that's already been taken care of. The debt has been wiped. I don't owe the money anymore. Whether you agree that that's right or wrong or not, that's what happened. I owed the debt and the debt was forgiven. Same thing with, with what Jesus did. We mm -hmm. owed, we are debtors. We owed because of our sin. We, yes. we were sanctified. We were forgiven. That debt was set aside and forgotten. It, we mm -hmm. no longer owe that debt. And what some of these people want to do, they want you to continue to pay on the debt that's already been forgiven. Yes. Yes. That's it. Boom. You nailed it. That's right. Praise and, God. Uh, well, what you said is right. What they're trying to do ain't right. No. And I know there can understand that example because if somebody – whomever it doesn't even matter your family member you yourself pay something off you ain't gonna let nobody come to a door to the door and talk about you owed it you'll be you'll be ready to fight you uh, no i don't mm -hmm. and why do you think that's why paul says we're to earnestly contend for the faith mm -hmm. we are fighting so that they don't put people first of all back into a demonic binding mindset that they got to be like a hamster on a habit trail, running, 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 running around this wheel, trying to earn salvation, which is what this comes out to be. And yep. it is absolute blasphemy from the Lord because yep. he said, I paid it. And if he paid it, it's, he said, you can't get any more clear than to tell us die, which means paid in full. It didn't say paid in part, but they keep coming back going, no, it's in part. You got to do your part. Yep. They lying. Yep. Right. Because they don't understand that law and versus grace legal framework. The grace is available because the, the justice was served. Uh, the law was served. Christ fed that that monster, <laughs> you know, essentially. Um, and because they don't understand that every verse they see, they think it applies to all believers. So they'll read Matthew, you know, and all some of those verses about, you know, uh, you know, if uh, you deny me, I'll deny you. And they just see they everything they see. They think every verse applies to them, and they don't realize. Oh, every verse is kind of be contextualized. You're either applying it to grace or you apply it to law, depending on what what program you're under. If you're under uh, under law, yeah, it's a it's a constant exchange. You do this, I you do this, I'll bless you. If you don't do this, I'll curse you, uh, etc. And whereas grace is just it's a one way exchange. God gives you, God gives, God gives. Whereas law is an exchange, and that, that's Satan's realm. And basically, yeah. the law. I see. I see the law is God, basically mm -hmm. protected God. God is the you know God's free. He's above the law. He's because he because he, he's righteous. He doesn't you know you don't, you don't put a righteous thing under the law. Can you imagine your best friend or a person you you love who's not you know not, doesn't pales in comparison to God's righteousness? But can you imagine someone you love and trust putting them under a law? It, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You wouldn't. The law is for enemies. It's more someone you don't trust. Um, and so, yeah, that law. And I basically see God, the, the fruit of the spirit, everything. God is, 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 is uh, 
it's basically the center of everything. And then outside of it, this protective layer, if you will, is a law. And so nothing can penetrate that. Uh, and then it, it's all self-condemning too. So that um, you, you, anything you try to do to earn your salvation just comes back in boomerangs and shows you that you're a hypocrite. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, again, again, I think those people don't understand that. And they try to make every verse apply to all believers for whether you're under law or grace. Uh, they don't understand that relationship. Yeah. Mm. Yep. That's, that's why I've always pay. said that unconditional love is like the most when you when you in my family that that was one of the greatest things they ever did was show me that unconditional love to where I you know I I I, I knew that God be at the very least as 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 um unconditional as my family's and, and you know my family some people might call them codependent but really you know. Like they would never, they would never turn me away or throw me out or, or cut me off uh, because of something I did. I mean, even, uh, you know, perhaps even to the extent where they, they might have should have been a little harsher on me at certain times. But the point is, is like it, it, it actually made me like it made me wince when I would see people like friends of mine, like their families that were, they weren't like that. They were colder. They were didn't have that love. Um, and so I could have I could never have imagined like once I did believe in God that, that his love would be. Um, like law based, like to where you could, like he could actually turn a, turn his child away. He could actually cut you off because you didn't behave properly. Because I mean, what about the love? What about that that bond that you're supposed to have if you're someone's child? I mean, if you're, you're their family, that that doesn't apply. That you know, like these these uh, legal frameworks don't apply to people like that. I mean, you love them no matter what. There's no getting a, go away from that. It would hurt you to turn them away. You know, you couldn't do it. Um, and so I think that's one of the most important things you can do as a parent is show that to your children. Absolutely. Man. Well, Amen. you guys you guys have really helped me make make the point that I was trying to make. Each one of you, you understand exactly what the gospel is and how we're saved and that we're no longer doing anything to add to it. Now, having said that, of course, we're supposed to live like Jesus. So he's an example for us of how we're supposed to live. Um, but we're not doing it alone. We have the Holy Spirit in us who's helping us to do every good work that was predestined, that was planned before the foundation of the world, that we should walk in them. But you can't walk like Jesus if you don't, if, like, like like Angel said, if you, if you don't feel loved by God or you feel like you're going to be condemned by anything you do, you can't live like Jesus because you're going to be selfish and say, oh, uh, I better... The door. Uh, it was open. Oh, okay. The, Sorry, the, guys. Uh, Sorry. The, the, uh, the, um, I forgot what I was saying now. Uh, oh, yeah, for example, like, uh, oh, well, you know, for example, a lot of people say, oh, you teach a, a if you teach a false gospel, you're going to hell, you know, and, and it's every, every bit frankly. So if I, if I believe that, then I would never tr preach the gospel so I could avoid the risk. And not putting myself at risk of teaching a false gospel. So you end up doing nothing because you're just so paralyzed by uh, fear about screwing up um, that you, you're not able to serve anyone or God because you're just serving yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what the law does. Amen. It's self serving. It's like a dog chasing his tail. Yep. You ain't going nowhere. I want to make a quick comment too. You have a wonderful uh, group of people in the chat that have been paying attention this whole time and making great points and putting up scripture. Yes, it mm -hmm. is incredible. I, I love e e each and every one of them with the with the godly love, with the uh, phileo, right? Uh, Amen. It's a wonderful thing. I told you I have some of the best sub subscribers on YouTube. I yeah, really do. You do. Uh, they they get it. They really do. It's awesome, and I, I am so. I feel so blessed. Uh, some of these people I've, I do talk to um, off air. I've spoken with personally, and they're amazing people. They get it, and some of them I'm trying to twist their arm to come on the broadcast. They know so much scripture, and they they get it. And I'm like, hey, you be great. No, that's okay. That's not me. But thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so, I, but I that's would, all right. They do get it. I would pay. I would pay good money to have Hendricks be on one broadcast. I really would. Right. I yeah. don't yeah, know if we can Victoria. handle the jokes uh, that Hendrix would be putting out. <laughs> 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 yes, Hendrix, we see you out there. We get. We see your jokes. We got you. But 
Yeah, I've I have uh, actually invited uh, Sister Victoria, and okay. she didn't say no. She didn't say no. Mm -hmm. She said not yet. So she's considering it. So good, okay. good, good. That would be that would be a benefit for anybody listening. I'm sure. Well, you do have a great panel here. I'm I'm glad you're letting me be a part of this. But you, you guys have a wonderful broadcast, and it, it's my delight to uh, be able to to be on here with you guys. Each one of you has a different personality, and and you have different things that you're all knowledgeable about. But you have the same gospel. Praise God! You have the same gospel. Right. We're not arguing about the gospel. We may not agree on everything, but I I think we agree on most things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think we agree on yeah. most things, but we definitely and, agree on the gospel. We definitely. There, and we're curious. Yeah. So it's like there's never an end to the conversation. Because yeah, and I'm not dogmatic except about the gospel. That's one thing I've right, right. changed my mind about. Other things, right. like, you know, I, I look into them and study and, and read the word from a different perspective. Absolutely. If I'm not willing to do that, then where are you at? Where are you at if you, mm -hmm. if you are so rigid in your thinking other than the gospel? Sister yeah. Angel, I, sweetie, I I'm, hate to I'm, point I'm, it out to you, but every sorry, every time you back up, I'm, we know yeah, it. No, no, I don't know how this car works yet, so I I, I have all these things. Okay, I think that was it was it was snitching on me because I didn't have my seatbelt on. Snitching car. Okay. I always say that they're going to start alerting the police. And the next, the newest cars I've got, they have a big like a like like you know neon sign in the back that goes off to let the cops know that they're they're not buckled because the car doesn't think it's your 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 uh your decision anymore uh any anything after like 2000 i guess but, but yeah um crips i uh, you know I, I think god brought uh the panel together you know because they're you know it's it's uh you know i find that there's so many people in my comment section that like just like with your your viewers here uh lisa which i'm sure we share some in common that it's like a shame they don't make videos. There's so many more insightful people in the comments on YouTube on YouTube channels, you know, under under their videos than there are people that actually create content. I've, have you guys noticed that? I've noticed that like so much. Or like like a lot of times I'll be looking at comments more than I actually watch the video, just because there's so much thoughtful uh, conversation and uh, thoughtful people uh, leaving comments and stuff and in the chat room. Um, but yet you never see them on like especially some of the larger YouTube channels. You know, you don't, but they, they always like, they, they're very, um, it's like incestuous. Like they always just cross promote and like their guests are always like the same pool of people. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a bit controlled that way in my opinion, but that's one of the great things about uh, shows like this where, um, you know, you're, you're pulling from, you know, that's how, I mean, that's how Luke even, uh, you know, came across me was just through comments. And I think that's, you know, a, a really good thing to do um, when you have a channel is actually try to get people on that you that subscribe to you that maybe you haven't made videos before, but you see how thoughtful they are. And try to draw them out of their shells, you know, and like Ben here, that was the same situation with Ben. That's how <laughs> Ben started being on the panels and stuff too, was, uh, was Luke knew what a, you know, thoughtful um, uh, per, uh, person he was that God showed so many things to, and uh, he encouraged him to be on. And I think that those of us who have channels or that, you know, we actually make content. I think that we really should do that more because a lot of people don't really know. Well, how do it's like you think it's like a club or something like some special club where you have to be in with the cool kids to get on a broadcast and like, you know, they, you're not going to offer yourself. You're not going to ask to come on. Somebody has to ask you, you know, so I think that's great that you're doing that, Lisa. Oh, yeah. No, I'm paying attention. I pay attention to the comments and I'm noticing the people who are patient and kind and loving and they never go over the top. They don't get into uh, feuds and I, and Victoria, shout out to Victoria. She's one of them. I've been watching her comments, not just here, on other channels. She's consistent. Yep. And that's one of the reasons. And, and, and when she puts up scriptures, it's right on point. It's right on topic. Yep. She shows her knowledge of the scripture. She's to be she's commended. She's precise. Yes. She's precise. She is like a surgeon uh, with with her with her scriptures and also with like her her arguments. Like if she yes. and she never gets into drama. And I don't care how passionate she is about a certain subject or doctrine. Like she will, in a very mature way, with no drama whatsoever, state her right. point, support it, and that's it. And, exactly. not, and, the, and you never see that even the slightest hint of like some immature pettiness, not with Victoria, so I love about her. And that's tough to do sometimes in chat because yeah. I, that's one of the 
because there's something that gets lost in the sauce when you're trying to talk to somebody and it can come across as harsh when you weren't meaning to be. Um, it's, With that it's, character limit it's, too. It's, right. Yes. It, it, and, and, I, and that's why I, I don't particularly care for it. It's just not my cup of tea. This, this way of speaking to people so they can hear you and they can feel you when you're speaking is, yep. is one of my favorite ways to communicate. So uh, that's why I'm doing it this way. This is why I started when I started on my, my channel. Um, it, and it wasn't about trying to get a brand or any of that Ooh. stuff. Yeah, a brand, a brand uh, is a mark. I keep, you know, and they don't need... Oh, those um, people. I just want to have a successful <laughs> YouTube channel. I just want to, oh, really? Like, it's like, and you can tell, too. You can tell when that's their thing, and it's just, it's so, oh. I mean, I think that's cool if, I, like, I think, let's say if you I, were I like a fitness instructor or something, you know, you let people know, hey, look, I'm yes. a believer. That's fine. Be, be all about promotion of your channel. No, I get that. That's fine. Yes, uh, that's fine. If you're, like, you're just if like it's a, a gospel. Warrior, that's your thing. Right. That's yeah. a, that's not that's not what we're about. That's not the agenda is having a brand and, you know, trying to develop a following and all that old. No, <laughs> you'll, you'll never hear that coming from me. That's just not that's not the thing. I I'm leaving the Lord Jesus Christ is like all the rest of you. And I come on and I share what I believe the Lord has shared with me. If you're able to receive it, praise the Lord. And if not, praise the Lord. <laughs> so uh, anyway. I want it, Sister Angel. I'm about to come at you. So, are you ready? <laughs> um, um, okay. Uh, well, okay. I thought we were doing a movie corner with Jason first. Um, I'm, I'm just running. I was gonna, we're yeah, I was gonna, oh, do we're that. not doing Shawshank. Okay, yeah, we are. Okay, not, yeah, we yeah. are. But I was gonna, oh, okay, uh, okay. uh, yeah, to you. yeah if sorry, you're ready, if not, gas. we can put more praise really quickly. And then I will. Yeah, no, I, I, I have, I, I have, I'm, I'm ready mentally, but I have. You're to, multitasking. I'm running to get gas. Yes, 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 yes. I, 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 I was gone all day, so I'm, I'm running here to get gas. Do you need a, a few more minutes, sister? If you need yeah, a few yeah, more minutes. Yeah, because, yeah, because okay. I just pulled into the gas station. That's I have fine. Milk. Man, we used to nope. milk drinkers <laughs> there. So, so, um, yeah, and I was just thinking I'll, I'll have to stay out here, uh, and drive around if I did not okay. right now. So yeah, just give me two seconds and I'll, I'll be out at the gas station now. So, okay, but, you're yeah, good. oh, I did want to say too, um, just so people know, like the, the thousand followers I have, guess what? Fi like most of those came because I made a video about knowing Isaac Cappy, not because I was sharing the true gospel. Like, you know, it takes forever to get followers if you're actually sharing, you know, the true gospel and no, um, and no, uh, and, and nothing else. That's just not what people are interested in. So if you're out there and you have a channel and you're just like, you only have like 20 subs or whatever, you know understand like god's gonna bring all the people that that he wants you know it, 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 people if you're just if you're a gospel channel i mean it's gonna be a slow build if that's all if you don't ever make some video that catches on but it, those people are so precious and so don't get discouraged don't just keep making videos because it's 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 it, god it can overpower any algorithm i don't care you know i don't care how that's what, you know, right that's think. right <laughs> that is right uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't look for that in the beginning. I remember my brothers were laughing at me years ago because I was so excited when I had like, I don't know, 50 followers or just, you know, listening to me and see, I wasn't in, I never was in the thing and I'm still not, I, I, I'm aware of Instagram, never done it. I'm aware of Snapchat, never done it. I'm not into none of that stuff. So, uh, my brothers were laughing. One of them was laughing at me because I told him, oh, man, I'm so excited. Praise the Lord. I got 50, 50 people that's listening to me on YouTube. He's like, started laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, these people, they got hundreds of thousands of people. I said, I don't care, brother. 50 people that want to hear something I have to say about the Lord is exciting to me. I don't care. And uh, so I never, I never really uh, got into, I never, if you notice, I'll never say in a video, Please like, share, subscribe. I don't do that because I know intelligent people, when they come across something, when I find someone who's really got something to say, especially if I'm like have my cell phone, I'm like, oh, I don't want to lose this channel. I'm like, 
I'm going to try to find the subscribe button. I don't want to hit the wrong thing because I don't want to lose the person. And right. So I don't have to say subscribe. It tells you people going to be like, she got something to say. I want to hear what she got to say. Boom, yeah. subscribe. So, you know, that's that whole part of the matrix thing. And I just don't participate it. And then there's times I just check out. I just check out. Because it's time for me to get before the Lord. It's time for me to spend some time praying. It's time for me to seek the Lord and be quiet. And I would have people contact me and go, sister, you okay? You haven't done anything in a long time. We miss you. I'm like, I'm fine. I'm just hanging out with the Lord right now. I'll be back. Don't worry about it. Because, you know, you're supposed to take some time to just be quiet, to just be still, to study your word, to pray, to fast or whatever it is. Uh, how am I going to have something to say if I don't ever seek the Lord about uh, what to say? It ain't all just about what Lisa want to say. If it's, if we're being led by the Holy Spirit, then we should be guided by him, not by, again, agendas or our goals or ambition, which I have come to believe maybe, well, maybe maybe that might be my, my topic a little bit later, but that ambition is actually not of the Lord, that it, it is something that can turn into something very evil. If a person isn't very isn't careful and doesn't submit themselves to the Lord, because you don't see where the Bible tells us to be ambitious ever. And when we see people who are in the Bible that were, they didn't end up in a good place. They usually ended up destroying themselves. Uh, and, and I would uh, think that even uh, when, you, when people are always talking about Jezebel, that's what I see it as a part of everything that she was doing was this ambition for power and control and, the manipulation and <laughs> there were a whole lot of dyna dynamics going on, but ambition was one of them. Did I lose you guys? No, no, no. I'm still here. Yeah. No, this oh. is the thing too. Is <laughs> you that, guys uh, are so quiet. I did thought let I lost you. Go. It. Letting you go because I, oh, okay. I, I, I talked a lot there, and you you let me uh, you let Catch me your breath. <laughs> present my topic. Um, I'm gonna uh, dra uh, grab a refill of drink, so just don't call me for about three minutes, two minutes. You're good. You're All good. Right, I'll be right back. I'm getting back in the car here now, so I will. Uh, I'll be ready in a second as soon as I get all the VPN. Okay, that's out. awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead, brother Ben, with your thoughts, sweetie. Oh no, I was just saying that uh, you know, yeah, ambition, um, selfish ambition, selfish ambition definitely is a a sin. Um, uh, being uh, zealous and ambitious for the Lord uh, to 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 uh, walk in His works and uh, to you know be uh, re available to Him. Uh, to yield yourself to walk in his uh, in the works that he would have you do. That's that's not uh, that's not sinful, obviously. But um, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. You know, it uh, they're trying to make a name for themselves, just like the, they did at the Babel, and just like the mm. the Jews try to make a name for themselves. Um, we don't make a name for ourselves. That's why we believe into his name. Um, we you know we're not we're about making a name for him, not. I'm sorry. We're about make, being ambassadors for his name, not making a name for himself, but uh, for him. But uh, the a lot of people, yeah, they're they're all about making a name for themselves. That's all they're. That's all it's about. Yeah, and they want, and they you, want end, you keeping. You end up... Go ahead, brother. They, Go. They, I was going to say they just they want you to keep on coming back to them, and I, I see that with a mm -hmm. lot of uh, people, even good Bible teachers. They make put out a new video every day. It's like you know, I, I don't, and there a lot of times they're just rambling, and um, it's like. I would say, you know, take some time, collect your thoughts and, and, and put something out there concise that people can watch over and over right. again. Um, right. Uh, it, it feels like they're under pressure to produce content. Yes. yes. And that's no. But that's if you have a ministry, then you are ministering to God's people. Mm -hmm. And that should only be after you have spent time in prayer. Oh, uh, contemplation. Oh, my God. Uh, re reflection. Dare I say repentance? All kinds of stuff, you know, uh, that should be going on. I told you, well, the first time I put a video out, y'all, I'm telling you, I stressed because I knew I was coming against big names like MacArthur and Piper and Washer. And I was like, Lord, <laughs> I'm coming out here. I feel like a voice crying in the wilderness. You are. Well, it, all of us are who are preaching the true gospel because it is astonishing how yeah. many so-called Christian churches, organizations, ministers, even, even if they're not uh, lordship damnation, they're, right. they're backloading works. 
Back and it's loading, you're, side loading, you have front to, loading. Yeah. yeah, you have to walk a tightrope uh, yeah. to, to stay they safe. They don't even that. think to tell you exactly where the works come in and tell you, yeah, like the one nearest me, I really right. wanted to join because they have a, a really great, like they really take care of each other. I'm at this church, right? It's in Westport, which is like, I live out in the country. So it's like this really amazing, idyllic country town. And, um, you know, and I got in a car accident with a guy uh, that uh, uh, he like hit my door i was i pulled over to because i thought i hit something and i was i i was in my i was in my lane i was he, he like swerved as my lane and hit my door and um the cops came but i was talking to him like for an hour while we were waiting for the cops and i you know he was telling me all this great stuff about his church and everything and um you know and about how they take care of each other and i thought well that's really great that's how our church is supposed to be but then you know um i had to really pin him down on the gospel and you know he believed you could lose your salvation but um i i didn't i looked at the church statement and it didn't really say clearly and you know and then you i talked to the pastor for like an hour on the phone and you know and it was it was weird it was like almost like they don't even think that that's something pertinent and like you have to actually ask them whether or not you know uh you, you can lose your salvation based on your works and that's like the that's like the I think that's the majority of churches probably. Mm -hmm. It's like they don't even have a clear position until you pin them down and you find out you know that the pastor doesn't believe in eternal security, right? But you know when you were saying earlier we'd be thrown out as heretics for you know some of the stuff we talk about. I was thinking, well, yeah, just the gospel <laughs> itself. Most churches would throw us out as heretics because oh, they don't yeah. have the right one. <laughs> yes, that's such a great point, sister. The gospel itself, they want to pick you up, throw you out. That's a sad, so sad state of affairs, you know, but it just shows who they are. There's there's a demarcation. Yes. The, the line is the gospel itself. Look, we're not separating based on pre-trib rapture. No. Or, well, uh, <laughs> well let's see. Pick, pick some other than non-essentials, Brother uh, Cripps, because uh, my mind just went blank. Sons of God. What was that, Brother Ben? I said sons of God being uh, angelic. Oh, or, yeah, Genesis hosts, 6. Uh, baptism. Or flat earth. Yeah. yeah. Or eternal ba torment. Baptism, baptism right. yeah, and, and eternal torment. Yeah, those are, those are, those are, well, I was going to say. They're not baptism, issues. Baptism. Yeah. Yes. There are people that, that say that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. That's, that's, the, that's the point. Yeah, you and, you do uh, you do, but that baptism is into Christ. Right, exactly. Born well, of the I Spirit. Think we but I know what that. you're saying. We, you're saying water baptism, and I keep but trying we to would tell divide people over that. That is something we would. we would divide over. Yeah, right. I mean, if somebody believed, if one of us here believed that you had to be baptized or to be saved, I, well, at least I thought Luke always considered that to be something that that. That was not if they say that that's required work. to be saved, yes, yes it's a work. Sure. Yes, right. That's what I'm saying. They're yeah, adding yeah, okay. one thing to the gospel of grace. Yes, we all agree on that, though. Yeah, maybe that's yeah. not an example. Maybe yeah, so I was saying, like, yeah, not essentials. Yeah. But yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 to deal oh, with water speaking baptism. In speaking in tongues is another one. Yes. Right. Uh, dealing with water baptism, real quick, that is an outward sign of an inward change that a person is making a statement to the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus is my savior mm -hmm. and I am identifying with his death, burial and resurrection is a, proclam a proclamation mm -hmm. of your faith. It is it has it, it has nothing to do with salvation itself. And it's hard now to get baptized. I haven't been baptized yet because um, these churches that mostly have a false gospel, you know, uh, they don't want to baptize you unless, you know, not that I'd want to be baptized at one of those churches, but even the ones that appear to have the correct gospel, you know, you know, largely they, they don't want to baptize you unless you've been under their supervision, for, like mm -hmm. being going to a church, you know, going to them for a long time. And, um, and to me that right off the bat eliminates them as a church I want to go to because that's not biblical. Um, it's not biblical to, to, cause they want to watch your behavior. To see if right. you're really saved, rather right. than actually talk to you about your understanding of the gospel. So that's all that that's, that's all that should happen is that right. you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. They just question you to make sure that you do understand the gospel. You are supposed to be sister when you want to get baptized. But they want to oh, you've got to be a member of the church. Show me that in the scripture. Yep. 
exactly exactly and that just right there just discourages me to well like, i don't even want i don't even want them to baptize me then because they don't even understand and not, you know i don't want to go to a church where you know so, i mean what the pastor is just like that's so loosey-goosey with you know doctrine is you know, and the gospel that you know they're not even clear on these things like what are you doing being a pastor Phil you know the, like Philip and the mm-hmm. eunuch is a good, good example. They, yeah, exactly. They preached to him. They said, I, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't see any reason why we can't do it right now, right here. Boom. Baptized. Done. Lo, here is water. What hindereth us? Yeah, what hindereth us? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He said, if you believe with all your heart, he said, you understand what you're reading? Mm-hmm. And he said, I believe Jesus is the son of God. <laughs> then let's go get baptized. <laughs> so, yeah. And then he was translated. This is what trips me out. He didn't establish and say, okay, now you got to go to church and you got to go to this. He, he, he's translated somewhere else. Leaves him. And it says that the, the eunuch went away leaping and praising God. Well, how come Sister Angel can't pick up a phone and call a church and say, I'm going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I believe. And they go, okay, sister, according to scripture, you say it when you want to get baptized. That's yeah, the way it too. should go. Also, too, I don't know if you guys remember, I think it's the Gospel of John where there was a crippled person. Uh, and there was a stirring of the water. They believed that the angel would heal, heal them. And Christ said, do you want to be healed? And he said, well, there's no one uh, to take me to the water. And right. someone else gets to the water first and gets healed. And Christ mm-hmm. said, when he left, he said, go and sin no more or something to that effect. And basically, that, that's a rebuke right there with water baptism. He first, he said, first guy, the guy was uh, had a, a problem. And he, he said, there's no one to lift me up. So he, he, he was depending on another man to do something for him. Bring, to bring yeah. him to the water, and he also his other sin was that he was depending on an angel to heal them. When the Old Testament is clear that uh, God Himself will heal you, mm-hmm. um, and then also Christ, when Christ said um, when He came to John the Baptist, why He should who, who's our perfect substitute, He took our place mm-hmm. in this world. Um, he said John the uh, he, John the Baptist said I, sh- I shouldn't be baptizing you. Um, he said. Yeah. Uh, yes, I want to be baptized so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. So if mm-hmm. somebody say water baptism was a work to be done, well, Christ already fulfilled it for us. So if Christ himself mm-hmm. was baptized. And, it, you know, there's no reason for it really for him to be baptized. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you know, it's like he doesn't need to. Uh, he didn't know, need ha- saving. Yeah, he didn't need clear as <laughs> conscience towards God. Um, so, I mean, those are two uh, powerful depictions, I believe, that are in the Bible. Because God knows that... He, the false teaching that that's going to happen that, that I think he gave us two accounts basically to help us refute yeah. that false doctrine. Right. John, John declared when Jesus came to, him, he said, I have need to be baptized of thee and comest thou to me, <laughs> you know? And, uh, Jesus said, you know, the, the, it suffered this to be so for now for it. It, it um, paraphrasing, uh, we're, we, it's need basically is needed to be fulfilled to fulfill all righteousness. And, right. All righteousness, Christ right. fulfilled, fulfilled all righteousness. Right, you know, and he, it, but I don't know what it is about our flesh that makes this just so easy for people to fall in. If if you do arcs, honey, they got a th- ten thousand and one different things that'll be a trapping in the so-called Christian church to to mess you up and jack you up and hinder you in your faith and cause you to stumble and block you from proceeding. Not that you're not saved. Persons say they say, but it'll mess you up in your doctrine and it can leave people shipwrecked for a long time till they get back into the word and see what the Bible is really talking about and seek the Lord and press in because that stuff will end up being a stumbling block to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Lord's not going to allow you to come into his presence, glorying in your flesh. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. Well, uh, Sister Angel, did you say now that we have yeah, uh, yeah. waxed on about this? I think, Brother Chris, are you satisfied that we talked about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm good. I'm okay. good. Yeah. All right. just, just, uh, we're filling, filling time a little bit, but we did it in such a way that it was, uh, to me, it was worth it to to make sure that it's clear that some of these non-essentials are, are not what's an important, that the gospel is uh, the essential that is absolutely essential, that we all agree on that. And these non-essential things, uh, you know, the, 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 the different controversies that people argue about a little bit, 
And some people do take it too far. They do. They take the non-essentials too far, and they do cause division over that. But you shouldn't be doing that. That was that was the point, I think. And uh, one of the yeah. things, yeah, I think that, that was a great. Uh, we talk about that kind of thing more, but like like I said, the identification truths I think are generally neglected. And knowing that Christ took your place, that answers all false doctrine. Like, oh, do you have to be baptized? Well, Christ was baptized. Um, yeah. did, you know, Revelation mm. twenty two. Don't take from the word or add to the word. Well, Christ even said in John three and John that he, his words are not his own. He only speaks what the Father tells him to speak. So he he never mm -hmm. he never uh, added or took away from God's word. I mean, every charge that people could bring against you. Christ fulfilled it, and that's why Romans says he's he's the just and the justifier of those who believe in him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so <laughs> I just love love how I love scripture <laughs> how how yeah. God mm -hmm. authored it. Yeah, yeah, it's all in there. Yep, it's it really is. There. Yeah. Well, we go to Sister uh, Angel and her topic that she's going to announce and surprise us with. Brother Cripps, I want to put out a little a little teaser. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are going to do a segment tonight, guys, called a Movie Corner with Brother Chris. And we're going to discuss another movie. And I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, coming from a biblical perspective, the parallels, Brother Cripps, that you see yeah. in that movie, would yeah. you like to give a little teaser to the crowd as to, to the audience as to what movie we're going to be discussing? Oh, sure. The Shawshank Redemption is the Ooh. one I chose for this week. Yes. I know I've seen it. I hope most of the people out in the chat have seen it so you can engage with maybe some of the parallels or insights you see yeah, in and, that movie. And let me just say, uh, that movie's been out for a very long time, so I'm not going to apologize for spoilers in that. You've had time to watch right. it. If you haven't seen it, then I would definitely suggest that you do. And I'll also explain what I want to do with this movie corner. And uh, not that I'm telling people that you need to to go out and watch certain movies, but I'm suggesting that even though these movies are not uh, uh, produced generally, they're not pr produced, I believe, by all Bible-believing Christians. However, my point is that God has not abandoned us in this world, and God does get his message across in all kinds of ways, even when the people producing movies and music and any other thing aren't doing it for that reason. Mm -hmm. God has yeah. not abandoned us. He, his message is everywhere. It's in the stars. It's in creation. It's in us. And it is also uh, can be found in secular productions. Brother Chris, Absolutely. I got to tell you this. I got to say this. And Sister Angel, then we're going right to you, sweetie. Uh, because uh, when you said that a few weeks ago, when you talked about this, when we first did the movie segment and you talked about um, what movie is that, Brother Chris? We talk. Oh, uh, The Matrix. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we saw the different parallels and everything. Uh, I, and you said that you believed that. I think it was you that said this. That we can see these parallels, like you just said just now, in creation, in movies, in music, and you. And listen, even the most demonic stuff. Yeah. Is a witness that the Bible is true. Amen. <laughs> and Amen. it's dawned on me when after you said I said, Oh, that's that's right. Because see, Satan is a imitator. He is not a creator. So the only thing he can do is operate within the parameters of God of God's will, run around perverting stuff and turn everything upside down and changing it and twisting it and manipulating it. But it's all under the Lord. Yep. And what he said. So mm -hmm. that's how the stories keep getting told. And that's how the witness keeps being spoken. Amen. Because it can't be hidden. That's why yeah. you can watch a, a, a quote unquote secular movie and be moved by it. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some things out there that you're moved to, uh, that someone that's not a believer might still be moved by the same thing. But I believe that if you are a believer, you'll be moved. The Holy Spirit will work through anything to show you a message he wants you to hear, regardless of what the happens. It point. happens to me all the time, but like, I don't care what it is. And this uh, came out. happens to me all the time. Oh, sorry, Angel. This, this no, came, I just say it happens all the time to me. Yeah, happens all the time. Because th this, this message that I'm trying to get across came out for me because of, there's a lot of people, a lot of legalists out there that say all of that is garbage. And they're not wrong. There's a lot of it that is garbage. 
Uh, but they act like, oh, we should just watch uh, Christian movies and listen to Christian music. Well, guess what? They've infiltrated that uh, those groupings. Yeah. Of and mm -hmm. oh yes. Yeah, a lot of the Christian yes. movies are are preaching the wrong gospel in the first place. Yes. So what's better? What's better for you to watch? I I mean, I guess you could just decide not to watch anything and just uh, keep yourself uh, isolated, you know, and and just choose to do that. But when they criticize these these uh, everyone else that like me that decides uh, to watch certain things. Now I do have lines. I, I, oh there yes. Are certain, there are certain things I will not watch, no matter what. Absolutely. Even if there is a message from God in it, I don't right. believe that some stuff should be viewed. I don't. Right. Uh, but there are other things I can put up with a little language. I'll be honest. I can put up with a, a certain limit of violence because it's it's not real. It's fake. I I, I get that. Uh, but I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I, I I have been well over the age of 17 for a long time. So what I'm saying is I'm not making some blanket statement that there's nothing worth watching out there. Because the point is God is still trying to witness to uh, the, the saved and the unsaved. And he uses their own mechanisms. As you said yes. accurately, Lisa, yes. all Satan can do is twist what God has already done. Yes. So his messages are still out there. <laughs> He's still trying to reach us through everything. Everything in this world, he's still trying to reach us from. So, but brother Cripps, and then and then we're going right to Sister Angel. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I just had the experience. What's today? Saturday. Okay, this must have been Wednesday night. I was flipping the TV, and I don't often watch a lot of television. And I don't say that because I think yeah. anything's necessarily wrong with it. My right. dad taught us when we were when we were children. <laughs> we used to watch TV with my father, and my father was a stomped down righteous believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, he was a pastor, yeah. and he he would we'd be sitting there watching stuff, and he loved movies too. What? Oh, that's not of the Lord. Oh, the Bible says. That. <laughs> yeah. And we would look at him and go, "Pop, we get it." He said, "I'm gonna make sure you get it." He said, "That's what it's parental guidance is." Yes. That's a good way to teach your kids, actually. Like. I do that with my kids, you know, as those they are, uh, some of their cartoons stuff they watch, um, even if there's something like, you know, so they teach some magical premise, like fairies or whatever, like it gives me an opportunity to teach them about the Bible by telling them that's not true, like, like, like you know, there's no such thing as a good monster or whatever, like the right. that's all over the place now with kids where we're like the monster's like a good guy or whatever, and I, I, I you know, I, I can use it, but there's also... Just like my, my, you know, Lucy, she, she has, uh, she loves this show Troll Hunters and mm -hmm. it, so much of it actually does, uh, it, you know, come from a, it proves the Bible to be true. I mean, it, it, cause it's in this context where there's so much stuff that's biblical, like the, the Guillermo del Toro actually made this kid's cartoon and it's all, um, based on stuff that you know it's in genesis 6 and stuff there's like this it, it's alluding mm -hmm. to it the whole time and i can mm -hmm. use it as a as a way to to reach her and make her interested in it but what right. you don't want to do is let them get carried away where, yes. where you, you know if you you want to see what they're doing where their mind's going you don't want to get them to where they get real infatuated with something mm -hmm. that's that's like totally like like say space or whatever um because then they're going to have um, a charge against the Bible where they don't want to believe it's true because they're, they've gotten attached right. to this fantasy world that the Bible says, no, that's, that's bogus. That's not real. And, you know, and then, My dad, then you're going to have to tiptoe around it. When, when, cause see, there was a time you couldn't pause live TV and you couldn't stop it. Okay. So there would be times we would see, we'd get frustrated because dad, you're messing up the movie, you know, but what, mm. oh, he loved it. When the pause, when you could pause the VCR, <laughs> Uh, he paused the VCR and be like, tell me why that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Tell that's me what awesome. the Bible says about that. Oh, man, I'll tell you, like, Pop, we know. Well, that's yeah, a good learning right. lesson, though, right? For you, it because really like, you hadn't is. had that. It yeah, was. because that was We kind of hated it and loved it <laughs> at the same time. You know what I mean? Uh, but, well, but what I wanted to say real quick was I was turning the channel, and I saw Tommy Boy was, was playing, and I hadn't watched it in a number of years. And I'm not kidding. The Lord said, go ahead and watch that. I'm going to show you something. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. and Tommy boy? Mm -hmm. So I went on and watched. I saw the gospel message in Tommy boy. Yeah. I guess <laughs> I was, I... The, the whole thing, brother Ben, we talked about how, how fraud 
uh, when we were doing uh, the, the, the broadcast about women in ministry in the fall and how fraud voids any contract, that's yep. in the story. When the, her, uh, the wife of the father who had passed away was married already, they were committing fraud and it voided them being able to inherit the stocks and all. <laughs> I was looking at it and I was like, oh my goodness. But I, I, I was amazed because it's just like I was saying within the perimeter of what the Lord has set in order. The devil only has so many moves. It's like it's like it's like chess. But the, the master of the game is the Lord. At the end of the day, all the pieces go back in the box. And this, this is it doesn't matter, uh, beloved. When we look at life and we look at these different things and we see the things that we don't have versus some other people and the things they have, I'm telling you, I, I can say it's the God's honest truth. I wouldn't trade what I know and my relationship with the Lord for any person that didn't know the Lord that had all the money in the world. Amen. And I, and here's the beauty of it. None of us here are trying to take that away from you. But there, uh, as we discussed earlier, there are people out there that do want to take it from you. So you have to ask yourself the question, yes. what's wrong with the person that wants to take away your joy? Because they're yes. not acting in the best interest of the Holy Spirit. They're acting in the best interest of the evil one. Right. And they Our have, treasure is Christ. Exactly. They have a tell. And when it comes out, you, you don't need to uh, worry about them. You don't need to be concerned with them. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit knows which uh, children are his. And if they're his children in some way or they will be. Uh, you know that God's going to work. I'm not saying don't talk to them. I'm just saying you don't have to mm -hmm. worry about them and what they say. You right. stick to you stick to the truth that you know, and don't let anyone ever take away that joy from you. Amen. Praise because, the Lord. And I, yeah, go ahead, brother. Uh, one more thing. I was going to say that because it's not even your joy to begin with. It's Christ's joy. John said, "It's mm -hmm. you have the joy of Christ in you. You have His joy. He gives you His joy. He gives Amen. us His joy." It's That's not right. even ours. He gives us the kind of joy that we cannot find in this world. It can only be given to us by him. Amen. No one Amen. can take that away. No one can take that joy away. No. No, and even when they do try to rob believers, and they might for a time, mm -hmm. the fact that you are, you are anchored. There's a scripture. I just had seen it. I gotta go find that again. Where you are anchored in Christ. You you they can't move you. You might just like a, a little boat gets moved by the water and the waves. But our anchor is the living God. We ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. He brings you back. And that's the beautiful thing about it. And, and, he, and he, he sets you right. He, he straightens you out. He gets that mess out of your thinking. Somebody comes along to bring the word of the Lord to set his people free from the bondage. These devils try to run around putting people back in. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Trying to put them back in. That's absolutely correct. But Sister Angel, I see her is nice and quiet on your end. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so I think I think Sister Angel was ready for us and to drop on us what her be this evening. Before she gets well, going, I just want to say one thing really quick, Angel. Sorry to interrupt. I loved, I think it was the week before last that you were outside. And I could hear those crickets going. That yeah, was, oh, you can hear the crickets? Man, yeah, this it's, thing is sensitive. For some reason, for me, the sound of crickets is so relaxing. Sometimes I even play it on uh, uh, YouTube when I go to sleep. Uh, background of crickets and cicadas and, That's and a good uh, idea. all that. It's beautiful. That. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah that. That's it. we got plenty of crickets out here. Um, I uh, 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 just uh, I'm never afraid when I'm out, when I'm on the. Sometimes there's stuff I need to get done at night, and when I'm talking to uh, talking to you guys, it's like I'll take that opportunity because. Um, uh, like if I have to do stuff outside, like I was trying to water my garden because I, 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 I did get a little spooked if I go out too far away from the house at night, um, you know, with, uh, in the, in the pitch black out there in the country. And I never get scared though. If I'm, if I'm listening to one of these broadcasts or if I'm talking to you guys, I'm always like, oh man, no, no, nothing's coming near me right now. I got all these, uh, you know, spirit filled believers we're talking to. Like I, I feel totally protected. I don't worry that some, you know, little, uh, 
uh, you know, devil's going to try to spook me, which is about all they can do anyway, um, because they got about, you know, five seconds before they get rebuked. It's going to be, you know, what I mean? but I don't want to be spooked. I don't like getting startled. That's my thing. That's when, that's one thing they can still do to me if they want to. They can startle me with some creepy thing, you know, and, and that, I don't like that. I don't want to be startled. But, um, but yeah, um, you know, crickets are a good thing too, because I hear that uh, nothing creepies around as long as the crickets are going. But if the crickets stop, that's when you got to worry, right? Um, mm. Or the birds too. I, my little girl Lucy, she gets real scared um, about noises outside when we're outside, even in broad daylight. And I, it's in the blood. I, I it has to be because I was a real scaredy cat like that when I was a kid too. And she has no reason to be. I didn't let her watch horror movies like my dad did with mm. me. And um, and she, uh, I told her, you know, if the birds are singing, there's no monsters around, <laughs> right? Because I'm not going to lie to her and tell her that there's no such thing as monsters. You know, uh, that, that's a lie. There are monsters. Monsters are real. They're just demons, you know. So I, mm -hmm. I tell her the truth. Um, but I tell her what she, that she has nothing to fear, you know. And that all she has to do right now, I tell her, is just tell them Jesus said, go away. If you ever see him. <laughs> but, you know, I think that that actually is better for kids. I think, because you know what? We all know in our gut that there's monsters. All of us. Mm -hmm. I told that to somebody on the on a, uh, in a YouTube comment the other day. They were telling me we have no proof demons are real, and I was like, "You don't know your gut. In your gut, you know demons are real. We all do. We all do." But as kids, I think that's one of the reasons kids get so scared is because most grownups just lie to them, tell them there's no monsters. Monsters don't exist, and they know they do, and and, and they can't reconcile it in their head. Is this this feeling, this gut instinct that we have that there's such a thing as what we call monsters, um, and. Um, I think it's better to tell them the truth, tell them what they are and tell them what you can do about them because they're, there's, you know, I, I tell them they're, they're, they're more afraid of Jesus than you are of them. You know, that's mm. what I tell Lucy. But um, yeah, you know, one of the things I'm talking about today, was just kind of like, um, you know, going off of what I was saying earlier um, uh, when I was talking about, uh, you know, God's standard of perfection and like how um, I think uh, like when you're talking to certain people, it's kind of like ministering to like atheists. It's kind of what I want to talk about. Some things that I feel like maybe um, the Lord showed me about uh, ways to get around people's mental blocks um, that uh, maybe a lot of people, especially if you grew up in the church or if you grew up, you know, you were always a believer. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not, uh, I, I think that a lot of people like that, they don't, think about certain angles because they they never came from a place like where I came from, where there would be certain things that were not foregone conclusions that I didn't understand because I, I, I think Ben is going to be very useful in this conversation because he was, he, he came from like the same place as me um, as like just you know, like an atheist. He wasn't, uh, although he wasn't raised with a Christian family, um, but you know, I was, and I still was like that. Like I was very adamant and um, uh I want to just try to talk a little bit about like some observations I've made about things that um, I think a lot of believers might take for granted that um, that it, like an unbeliever, like like especially like an atheist type or like one of these millennials, like, you know, like me, like that, that we don't actually understand where you got to start off. Even if we it's not even so much that we don't understand. It's that we have these mental blocks about certain things that have been really programmed into us in the culture that, you know, might not have been so prevalent um, either if you had a proper, you know, upbringing with, you know, like where you were always a believer, you're always in church, or if, you know, you came from a time where the media wasn't quite as wicked. Um, and so, like I said earlier, I talked about, um, one of the things being the issue of, of sin and God's standard of perfection and, you know, trying to, trying to, uh, get past the mental block that, that just totally, you know, shoots up the minute that you, uh, start talking about sin. Because I think some people might, uh, and, and it's, it's crazy to me that um, that this would even be an issue, that this was an issue for me, but I, I've noticed it like with other people that I, almost every other person that I've ministered to or tried to try to evangelize that, you know, comes from a similar place where they they never were a believer and they were always adamantly against religion and Christianity. The, the idea of sin being a judgment call versus um, something deeper than that, something more like dysfunction. That's the word I always used in the past was explaining sin as mm -hmm. dysfunction. Um, but a, a, another thing I wanted to talk about too is that that I think I, I've noticed I've had breakthroughs with with people is when we talk about you know why God's standard is perfection. Well, I think people take for granted somehow that like 
even in even in heaven, right? Like like somehow like they think that that imperfection is is natural. So they think that why does God have to have such an exact exacting standard? Why would you need to have? Um, why would he? Why would he demand absolute perfection? Um, and they don't understand that like perfection is perfection is the natural state. That is actually like God's intended state. And and in, without perfection, there will always be suffering. So this is one of the most important things that God showed me when I was a, a new believer was um, explaining to me. Um, you know, just, it was like in a download almost, you know, just uh, showing me things um, really in a, some an incredible way, because like I said, like I, I didn't know scripture. So um, he would show me something, that make me understand something. He would just click into place because I was chewing it over in my mind. I mean, now I understand I was, you know, really, you know, kind of uh, conversing with the Holy Spirit in my mind because he would show me something. And then I would go to scripture and verify that, that was, that was correct. That was biblical. I had no way of knowing that. Um, but you know, this idea of, of perfection, I think that in the world, we almost attach a negative connotation to that word perfection. And, um, for me, um, having, you know, when I lost, you know, my family, when, you know, certain people in my family died all of a sudden, I went through this tremendous amount of suffering. One of the most fundamental questions that I was confronted with was, you know, I, I couldn't, I was trying to figure out a way where existence could exist without 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 the threat of of suffering and you know like why would why would that be inherent to you know to existence is there any way out of it you know whether you're talking about like a political system or anything else and i i kept coming to this brick wall where there was no way like for humanity to, to somehow work its way out of just you know profound suffering um you know and of course death because death was always at the end so i don't care you know what kind of utopia you you, you could come up with, you would never be able to, to get around that problem. And then even if you did, you know, um, you know, the, the idea of, of, of somehow, kind of, you know, getting your own immortality somewhere where people didn't have to die, you know, there was all this suffering that happens in life anyway, just naturally, um, that, that wouldn't really, it didn't really seem like a solution. It didn't seem like, a, like it would be a really good thing because you would just have an eternity to suffer. And so this was how, um, you know, God began showing me why only he could fix things and why his standard would be perfection because um that's how he eliminates all suffering in eternity is that there will be because the opposite of perfection is sin right and so i think if people understand that um that sin is dysfunction and that all of all the problems all of the all of the pain that they go through in life somehow stems from it, dysfunction whether they want to look at it as, um, you know, the word sin because of so many, you know, hellfire, you know, damnation, fire and brimstone preachers. Um, we have this, it, as soon as we hear that word, we feel j like judged and we are judged. I mean, you know, that that's a reality. You know, God is the judge, but it, it because we're so used to people judging. And, how, and we and it almost always comes with a feeling of like them being a hypocrite and them being unfair. We don't under, really understand the perfection of God's judgment and even the context of it or, or what that really means. So I like to try to separate it from that by just sort of hmm. um, kind of coming at it from an entirely different angle. So that's why, like Ben said, I, I, I love to use the analogy of an infection and of 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 uh you know of disease and infectious disease so that people because that is that's that's accurate as well sin is like that also so i think that um um i have noticed that has been very very effective like with my little brother that's when i was kind of mentioning earlier he uh i you know when i when i first got saved one of the one of the longest conversations i had you know trying to evangelize in the beginning was my was my little brother and he was never as uh, against the gospel or christianity as i was but he just wasn't really fully sold on it either but after we spoke and after i you know fr put it to him that way where sin was more like an an infection that god was going to quarantine and he was going to you know uh uh cure the, the problem, you know, and quarantine it off forever and eternity that I remember my brother saying that that was like, like the, one of the biggest breakthroughs he'd ever had. Like I, that I explained that in a way where it finally made sense to him. Mm. And, um, um, 
No, I'm trying to think with the, you know, when you're coming from, you're, you're talking to, you know, an atheist or somebody that, uh, especially somebody who's always been hostile towards Christianity. One of the other things that I, I really want to point out to people that, you know, a question to ask them is, um, you know, why would you be so adversarial to the, the only um, faith which says that, uh, that God loved you enough where he, he came you know, and, and he died for you. And then he also doesn't ask anything of you whatsoever, except that you believe he did it. Um, because I think people, um, people totally gl gl just gloss over that. They go they, 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 they don't, cause they don't really understand why Jesus had to die. They don't understand all of that. Like, I know I didn't understand that, like why it had to happen that way. So, um, and I felt sort of like somebody was trying to impose guilt on me. By saying mm -hmm. Christ died for you. Well, I didn't ask him to die for me. And why did he have to that? That's it's dumb. God was the God makes everything and sets everything into motion anyway, according to you. So he set up this little weird psychodrama where he decides he's gonna have to, to he's gonna make us and then he's gonna, you know, uh make us sinful and then we then he's gonna have to come and die for us, you know, and then we're supposed to be thankful when he did he did it all. It was all his call. I mean, mm -hmm. this is like this some I have no say in the matter. Um, and um, they never stop to actually think about what that means because there's no other deity that I know of. Um, I know that there's some, you know, like I think in ancient Egypt, there's like a lot of gods, of, you know, dying. But but the idea in the Bible where Christ came, you know, all, in all these other uh, stories, it's like they're a king of some sort. Like there's some sort of like royal figure and then they end up dying and it's not necessarily to save mankind. It's just like uh, something that happens and then they transcend or they become some other type of, like even, you know, I'm thinking of Horus and things like that. Um, we're just like weird stories where it involves like some king, uh, you know, uh, God king dying. Um, but in, in, in the Bible, um, Jesus came as the most humble, uh, you know, uh, uh, God imaginable, right? Where he was, a, he was a peasant and born to teenagers who basically, like everybody at least thought he was born out of wedlock. Like he was, you know, that, that, that because she was pregnant be before the, uh, they actually got married. Um, and, um, you know, he was, you know, probably considered pretty lowly, like, a, you know, maybe a bastard, you know, by a lot of people, but also just, um, you know, it, he was born in a manger, right? And he wasn't, uh, he didn't come in, in any type of like stately position um, where uh, it shows God's humility. And I think that that is, you know, one of the most important things to reach people like like my former self um, with is understanding God's humility because they, people who don't have any interest in God, they don't, you know, they, they, they're they hostile toward the whole thing, specifically Christianity. They feel like it's something that you're kind of like mm -hmm. trying to attack them with almost. Um, right. They really need to understand the humility that, that God reveals, you know, even though it's crazy to think God would be humble because he doesn't have to be, you know, he's God. Um, it's important just just to try to get them to see him from an, in a new light and when you really try to if you really put it in perspective like what christ did and what that says about god that that god he was a representative of god's character and that god chose to come in this way where he you know he, he subjugated himself to the to the very people he was coming to save you know he 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 allowed them to, to, to spit on him and torment him. Um, and he, and he didn't even ever, he ne never once did he, did he do anything where it was like, like, like you would imagine, like some, like the God of all creation, if he came to incarnate in this world, like, you, you know, all the things he could have done calling the shots been a, you know, could have been like some big, you know, like Muhammad, he, you know, he's just supposed to be a prophet, but that he, he's exactly what you would expect of some, you know, God King coming, you know, coming to earth. Cause he, he, you know, he amassed all this following and he was like a big warlord and he was, you know, all about his own glory. And Jesus was never like that. Never once. He was the opposite. And if you actually look in the scriptures, everything he says, he gives you a, he wants you to reason with it. He doesn't just decree something and say, because I said so. He explains it. He, he, he tries to give in parables. He tries to explain everything so that you understand that he's reasonable and that what he's saying is reasonable. And that's how God is. God is reasonable and he's, he's, he's humble um, in a way where, where even though he did, you know, he, you know, obviously expects, you know, worship and he, that you understand that he's holy. That is, 
like I've said before, I, I think in a way it's, it's sort of the way that we demand that our children respect us, not so much out of our own arrogance or vainglory, but because they, what it would say about them if they didn't, it, you know, it's right to respect your, you know, your parents, you know, and if you don't, it's, it's most likely because you, you're, you're too big for your britches and you're not humble and you don't have, you know, your characters, your character's really, really bad. And I think that's one of the main reasons God expects these things of us is because it's for our own sake. It's for our own character that we would under that, that we would understand that he's holy and that we worship him. But he also reveals himself to be humble to where he's not the egomaniac that people like me always accused him of being um, as an unbeliever. Um, like, I mean, what is it Dawkins said that he was like God, that God, the God of the Old Testament, some bloodthirsty egomaniac who, uh, uh, you know, that, that's how that's what you know one of the people's favorite charges against against god against the oh, true god close enough angel <laughs> right yeah something like that right and so but ben i wanted to ask you what was like one of the when you were first coming not not when you were even coming to understand the true gospel so much but when you were first coming to understand that the bible was true what was like do you remember like a big thing that you like a big like revelation or big something that clicked into place where you finally well, understood it, yeah, like the, I mean, that it was real and reasoned with God, like that that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I'm I'm probably a little unique. Um, I've always been I, I always welcomed truth my whole life. I wasn't exposed to it very much, but I, when I saw it, I always welcomed it. And I think that's one of the main diff one of the big differences that uh, distinguishes a believer between an unbeliever is they suppress the truth because they don't want it to be true. And I, I always welcomed it. And so I always believed the Bible, but Bible, but I didn't really know what it was teaching necessarily and what, you know, salvation was. I just figured I, I was just ignorant. I was ignorant, but always welcomed it. And, and for me, even as a child, I look back now, you know, um, a lot of the things that the world tells you that aren't legitimate things to, that you should care about. Like you shouldn't be what you should, you're being nosy if you want to know everything about somebody or you're, 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 um, you're old fashioned. If you, if you, uh, believe in, uh, uh, you, you don't believe in divorce and you believe in marriage and you know, all that stuff. Uh, and so I was always, I, I was, I was, uh, knew that the qualities that God puts innately in me, that there was a God for those reasons alone for like, for example, uh, I, even as a, a small kid, I already had, I always had a sense of who God was and I had felt like I had fellowship with him. And I always felt like, uh, you know, they, I already, I always knew what he would want me to be in, in, in his eyes, but I, I wasn't, but I was, I, I uh, prized these characteristics like courage, optimism, generosity, and, and like charity. Um, and so, again, those are all things I feel like I was working the early on. Um, and you were raised by believers, so okay. So I got it backwards. So I, because I thought your family were. So is it your family uh, that's that they're atheists? No. Well, or? okay. So, so I grew up with. I mean, I was. I was had. I got. Uh, godparents and my, my grandparents were Catholic and my godparents were very Catholic and they were very devout and they would try to push that on us a lot. And my, my parents didn't like it actually. And so they kind of, my parents pushed them away. Um, and we would, we would go Catholic mass on Easter and, and, and uh, Christmas. That, that was the extent of it. But, but oh, also too, I went to, I think they, what they call it in Catholicism is called catechism and where I would after school between grades, like, second and fifth grade, I would go to this catechism and uh, learn about the Catholic faith. And I learned, you know, it, I, obviously it was mostly about works and things like that. Uh, All the but stuff I, that's I, not in the Bible that they had well, to add. With yeah, the in fact, <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think it's, I think that all that cat, uh, Catholicism stuff, I mean, I don't think there's going to be any disagreement here, but I think a lot of ways it works on you to, to make you disbelieve. So they'll put up like ridiculous depictions of Noah's Ark, you know, they'll put up uh, just ridiculous art about Adam and Eve in the garden. So when you become an adult, you look back and say, oh yeah, that was just a fairy tale, you know, it, it, yep. it's ridiculous. And that's what the guy had to fight. So when I, so again, I was always, I always welcome truth and then. Uh, I like you, Angel. I think Passion of the Christ was a big wake up call for me. Um, and I just kind of, it kind of woke me up. And I, I just wept bitterly, like uh, for the first Thank time you. in my life, I think. First time in my life, mm. I really wept bitterly and it really hit me like a oh. ton of bits. Yeah. And so that that film really kind of start kick started me to to realize, okay, hey, I want to know God. Uh, you know, I, I don't need to be beating up myself and hating myself anymore. He took all that hate. You know, I can't do any better than he did. You know, he, he already took care of all, all that. Uh, self-pity uh and uh you know so I, I don't need to 
wallow in it like I was. And so it would just kind of put me on a path to start understanding him a little bit better. Um, uh, but the first thing that happened was, okay, so I, again, I was totally ignorant. Um, uh, and I didn't know that I, I didn't know there was even a difference between Calvinism versus Catholicism versus I didn't know any of that stuff. I had to learn all that stuff. In fact, for like two years or actually about a year, I, I pretty much went to got questions and had so many questions. I would, every mm-hmm. question, it was like Google for, you know, theology. And so I, I was just constantly going to got questions and they had some problematic stuff in there, too. Uh, they have like uh, Calvinistic leanings. But I, I just learned some basic stuff. Um, but the, the two things for me that were really stumped. Was that uh, especially when I started to realize? Okay, it's true, but I, don't, I I just couldn't. Again, I had a, a genesis in my mind of all that false, ridiculous art and, and false mm-hmm. depictions. And yep. the two things that bothered me was okay. First of all, what about ape men? And then number two, what about dinosaurs? And I, I know mm-hmm. Satan uh, knows that, and I know I know exactly what that. I, I totally understand what those are now. And I and so I felt like God was kind of telling me, hey, take what you know about me and take what you know about Satan and see if you can match it up to your reality. And I had a real hard problem. Mm. I had a real hard time doing that. But then again, God kept on working with me, kept on working with me. I, I kept on pursuing it. I wasn't going anywhere. I was wrestling with him and I wouldn't let go until he blessed me. Um, and uh, eventually I realized, okay, yeah, these things that, that bothered me before, now they're absolute strengths. Like there's tons of uh, evidence for Noah's flood. There's tons of evidence that dinosaurs uh, I recently lived. There's tons of evidence that um, uh, these eight men, so to speak, and again, that eight men thing uh, was it, that. I think that keeps a lot of people fooled. I think I think that's one of the most potent deception yeah. that most, a lot oh, of people yeah. go to. Um, but I've studied that uh, ad nauseum, and I'm I'm pretty much an expert in that um, from every angle. Um, but all those things down, all those things that were weaknesses, got turned into strengths. So uh, that was my journey again. I, but it, mm. I think the key is. It's the heart, you know. I had a heart for God, yeah. always did, um, but I, I was just ignorant. And I, I welcome truth when I received it, and a lot of people don't want to. But I do know. I, so coming from that viewpoint, I have a lot of sympathy and empathy for these people that have those struggles, and I want to do more to help them, you know, um, mm. and serve them. In which I think a lot of people are underserved because a lot, a lot of Christians will look down on them and and say, you know, well, you know, uh, or you just speak in a language that is like doesn't doesn't connect it doesn't connect right exactly yes that. and they just say well you just gotta have faith you know well no biblical faith is not blind faith it's reasonable it, it's based on evidence um it uh, to me i'm certain because i i think the evidence is overwhelming now you know so um sorry i probably took i don't mean to take over that conversation but no <laughs> no you guys are that's, doing great that's... I um I I mean yeah because I guess I, I I misunderstood I I because I because you told me that your your family wasn't religious and I thought that you came so you, you see that's interesting to me because you had a heart for God now I feel like I didn't I did have a heart for truth though um and I always thought that I knew the truth I I was will I was never willing to this is like a big thing I think. I was never willing to consciously deny the truth once I knew it to be true. No matter what it meant about how wrong I would be if it, if something were true, I was willing, like if I was convinced uh, by the evidence, by what I, that something was true, no matter how unpalatable it was, I was willing to, I, I wasn't willing to lie to myself. You know, right. I wasn't willing to just, okay, well, I don't want to believe that that's inconvenient. So I'm not going to believe it. I never was like that, but that's how the, how, how, sh- you know, the, um, even a person like me who was who really was um, oriented toward the truth like that and not willing to um, to lie to myself consciously, um, the world makes it so easy for even someone like that to just be deceived um, because well, yeah. that you know. Well, for me, um, I don't, and I think you might have some common here. Um, for me, I kind of grew up in a, in a house that that kind of thought they were kind of intellectually elite. Um, uh, like for example, I, I was uh, even though I go to mass periodically, I think it was just again like, uh, hey, let's try this out. You know, let's expose you to it because just in case it's true. Basically, Catholicism is the perfect thing for that. People have no idea yes. what faith is. It's all that exactly. ritual it fills in for mm-hmm. faith. Yep, uh, and it makes it ridiculous. Make it, again, I just makes it ridiculous. The whole confession thing. It, make, it turns people off. It's it, I believe it's designed to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for anyone that's looking into truth, it's a it's a it's a huge. Um, 
honeypot almost essentially to get, you know to distract you um but again my, my when i grew up i grew up from cradle to grave but my my parents were my, my dad especially was big into human evolution we would watch nova and national geographic all the time that was a family event we'd watch like uh, the nature with david attenborough and all those that was a family event uh, and my dad was big into Cosmos and uh, Carl Sagan. And so it was, it was just a lot of intellectual elitism that yeah. I, I ultimately, ultimately it, it affected me, but I knew I rejected it at the same time. I did. I knew it was, uh, I, again, I, I didn't doubt that these things were true. I thought that, you know, oh yeah, they're not lying, but I didn't know how they fit with the Bible. And I would read the Bible and say, okay, this is, I would read it, but not even really think, like almost like a kid, like not even thinking like, okay, well, hey, how does this, how does this jive or clash with what your, the world tells you? You know, I didn't even consider that. They're like two different worlds. But then when I started getting very serious about, hey, this, I, I don't want, I don't want to have this. I want to have a very vibrant fellowship with God every day, and and I, I don't want to have these these weird, uh, this this uh, cognitive dissonance. That's what it was. This cognitive dissonance. I wanted mm -hmm. to. It, it really troubled me because I felt like it was doubt, but it really wasn't doubt. It was just more cognitive dissonance. And I asked God to take that away, and He did in a big way. And I, I think I have a lot to offer with people that, like, again, struggle with uh, things like dinosaurs and or uh, Noah's Ark or uh, really anything that the world tells you, and exposing those things for what they really are. Wow. <laughs> Brother Ben, that, and that's that what? is that a big stumbling block that intellectualism. Something Brother you said ben. there. I, oh, sorry. Go oh ahead, yeah, please. go ahead. But you might be about to jump on. Well, there's two things. One thing you were talking about, Nova and the family event and watching all that stuff. I was just going to say uh, that uh, I went through the same thing. My grandparents were believers, but they watched all that stuff because they couldn't reconcile the difference between right. uh, what was science falsely so-called and that all these things were a lie, uh, uh, you know, and, and other planets and, and all, all the stuff mm -hmm. that Nova put out there. Um, but I grew up that too, for that very reason. Um, they even liked Carl Sagan, even though they didn't agree with evolution, because you know they he told told us more, gave us more info, uh, you know about uh, about the universe and things like that. So they both went on uh, to glory before they ever um, knew the full truth. But I guarantee you they know the full the full truth now. So uh, and then you said you called. Uh, the other point I want to make really quick, you said, uh, rather than it being doubt, this is a great point, and I'm not sure, Ben, if you realize how great a point I think it is, and it was straight from the Holy Spirit in my mind, um, saying that it was, rather than thinking it was doubt, it was cognitive dissonance. Yes, and I That's put it by cute. fear. Well, my fear was, uh, my fear was, I go, is this doubt? I, I, I don't, I, it's cognitive dissonance, I knew that. But Satan would throw that at me and make me think, oh, well, yeah. you, you don't really believe because you have this foggy yes. area here. And yeah. you would I'd be tormented by it. I would be tormented yes, by it. Yes, tormented by it. So there are people out there that say, oh, well, you're not saved then because you have that quote unquote doubt. But you're saying you're not calling it. It may uh, it may appear as doubt, but as it a may, believer, yeah. Yeah. understanding it as cognitive dissonance and attacks from Satan, Satan throwing darts at you, which is described in scripture, mm -hmm. right? not always doubt. It, it, right. It's not always like you're not you're doubting that you're really saved. It's it, it it is a disguise, I believe, from Satan. And I think that cognitive dissonance is the best example I've heard about double mindedness. Well, yeah. Well, it's, uh, yes, it is kind of well, it's, for me. I, I feared it was doubt. You know, I feared yeah, it was yeah. doubt, and even though it wasn't, I know what it wasn't now, um, and yeah. I know I'm much more wiser about it. But it, it was uh, hell for a while, uh, and. Um, and also, yeah, also too, I mean, I didn't understand the difference between grace and law, or I understood it, but I didn't understand. Like, I, I struck with a lot of people, like, well, sure. what is this first teaching? And so, I again, between, I mean, for me, I can tell you absolutely God will work with you. I The, the eight-man thing really bothered me for a long time. I knew it wasn't true, but I, I, I couldn't expose it. I mean, I, I'm saying right now, I think I probably could expose that whole eight-man fraud probably better than any, any living person alive right now. Um, yeah. Except for the people themselves deceiving that are actually behind the deception. But I know I could blow that wide open in a huge way. And I, it was absolutely God uh, miraculously uh, showing me that because he knew it bothered me. And he answered that prayer. It was a major giant that I thought I would never tear down. And uh, it went down It went down with a loud thud. Um, the number also, too, is that... Um, Oh, oh, doctrine too. So I, that, that was a big thing. The cognitive distance bothered me for a long time. Struggled with that for like 10 years. Um, and then also the 
difficult passages. So a lot of people, even I think a lot of free grace people will, will see difficult passages and say, okay, well, we know what it's not saying, but they don't know what it is saying. And for me, that was a really problematic too. I want to know what got, exactly what, what is it is saying. You know, what, what, I want to know exactly, hey, what's the point when someone is overcome? What's the exact point or what's the exact point um, when, uh, well, I, I, again, I just want to know the height, depth, width. I want to, I, I'm, I'm good at putting abstract concepts into um, a, a, or, or reverse engineering. Uh, that, that's what I do at my job. That's why I'm good at my job. I, I create, I reverse engineer things that I cannot see and I don't have a lot of documentation for, but I have hints and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, rough ideas of what, what, how I think it operates. But, and I all construct a 3D model in my mind. And that's what I'm really good at. And I had to do the, I, I believe God, gave me that uh, ability early on so that because it's extremely helpful for me to understand doctrine as well um mm -hmm. so uh, again, well, guys, uh, okay go ahead sorry I, I, i'm sorry i wanted to interject a couple of quick things before we get too too far down the road here some things that you guys mentioned uh getting back to brother let's see who said that mentioned they mentioned um Oh, I knew I wrote it down here. <laughs> oh, uh, you guys started talking about the, the the like the priests and going in, and somebody said mentioned honey pot. It was yeah. been there. Okay, um, it's funny that you should mention that because I had just posted in my community post a sermon by Pastor Stephen Darby on unnatural worship, the unnatural worshiping uh, of ISIS. And um, he talked about in there that part of the wor unnatural worship was when people don't understand the history of the, what do they call I, I was Catholic. I don't remember. It's been so long. Um, when they go into the confessional, that's what it's called, with the priest, that that whole, <laughs> I'm going to tell the truth, but that whole where you going through and facing him, they have a thing that's called uh, glory holes. It's totally sexual. Oh, yeah. And he bro, covers bro. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He covers this in this sermon. This this preacher don't play. That's why <laughs> that's why I like him. He's straight, he's straight up with the truth. There's some things I don't agree with him on, but <laughs> on this in this sermon, he nailed it. And I'll I'll put a link in the description for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about this whole ISIS worship and the Babylonian uh the ancient mystery Babylon religions. That's all tied in with the all of that stuff. All of those rituals mean something. We don't know what they mean. We think we know what they mean, but they know what they mean. And uh, <laughs> anyway, that was one thing. And then the other was the, the cognitive cognitive dissonance. Uh, the death of that, because some people might not know uh, exactly, it, in the field of psychology, cognitive dissonance occurs when a person holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values, or participates in an, uh, an action that goes against one of those three and experiences psychological stress because of that. And this is what I have been saying about um, getting into agreement with Christ. Because if you get into his word and you see what his word says, and some preacher contradicts that, you won't end up with cognitive dissonance because you're going to agree with Christ. You're going to agree with his word and what the Holy Spirit is bear witness to you. So, but this is one of the things that happens to people, which is what James warned about when he spoke about double mindedness, because it makes you unstable. And, and when you're in that condition, you can't receive anything from the Lord. You can't receive peace. You can't receive understanding. You, you don't uh, meditate on his grace. So you, you, you end up being really placed in a storm in your mind. But go, go ahead. I, said, I just wanted to mention that. Well, I'll say one last thing about this. Um, the, again, I'm, I've been in the computer field my whole life, so I think I see a lot of analogies here. But basically what it was was, I, you know, basically the Bible is an upgrade. It's, it's, not, it's like code that you, you, you feed your soul, and, you, and as you receive more code and understand it and be able to put the pieces together, the more stable you become as a believer. Well, I had a bunch of bits and pieces of the Bible, but I didn't really see how it all fed in. And so I, it was a struggle while I was kind of building that 
program or allowing the, the program be for Christ to be fully formed in me by, by the word, uh, you know, I, I, and I would, you know, partake of the world a little bit and I partake of, of the Bible. And I, I had a hard problem putting the two and two together because I was yeah. too trust. I trusted the world still. I still trust the world. I didn't realize, and this is, this is another thing I think unbelievers don't realize either that like Angel said, there's a lot of things that they don't understand about, you know, about sin and things like that. One of the things they don't understand is the absolute, the, the, the circumstances that we're in, the grave circumstances we're in, that there is a devil and he is more powerful than people give him credit for. And his power is to, is to deceive. And everything in this life is pointed against you to deceive you. And the only, only, only truth out, the only dot of light we have uh, is that Bible. And uh, again, as, as you partake of more of God's word, that light gets bigger and bigger. And uh, you can, you can see it, it exposes the darkness, but um, you know, the, it, it, when you're early, when you're early, uh, a babe in Christ, you still it requires you to you build that program. And, you know, just like any pr computer program in its early stages, it tends to crash a lot. If it's not, uh, you know, if you don't have the complete, all the code, uh, and, and, uh, be able to assemble it into, uh, a program essentially that you're able to operate yourself with, uh, you're going to crash periodically and that's normal. And then false teaching is kind of like a, a virus, a computer virus, you know, it gets in there and destroys, uh, your health essentially. So, um, that for me was the biggest thing I knew even early on is that when I was having struggles, it's like, okay, get back in the word, get back in the word. And I would always be comforted. Um, and I was determined to find that grace. And I knew even as a kid, uh, like I said, I knew, I knew who, I think everyone is given a knowledge of who God is that he's gracious, he's good. And I was not willing to, I, I was, I was, I refused to believe that God was anything other than that. And so when I heard these false teaching, even though I found it hard to disagree with, um, and it, even that was cognitive dissonance too. It's like, I know this can't be true. And, and so I kept on pushing and pushing and pushing. And I, I found grace in the eyes of the Lord, just like Noah did, just like Jacob did, just like all the, the patriarchs did. Um, so uh, Angel, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hijack your topic. Oh no no no! I mean it's, that's great. I mean I because I, I I I think that uh, it's just important for me. The most frustrating thing, like even when once I was kind of trying to like say see my aunt's point, right when she would um, evangelize me so much, I I couldn't. She was just speaking a language I couldn't understand. You know, talking about the Holy Spirit and talking about you know um, you know being washed of your sin, born new, and I didn't even. Like you can't, it doesn't appeal to somebody if they don't understand just like the, 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 uh, the fundamental, I think for me, well, the biggest thing was understanding Genesis. I think that's really important. I think we touched on it's really important too about like the Catholic paintings and, and even, even so much of just the art that you see, like, you know, in Protestant churches, like, you know, that, right. that I went to when I was a kid, um, it takes it totally out of reality. Right. And you, exactly. you it, and it, you don't feel like you're in the, the frame, the same framework as whatever the Bible, it, you know, is talking about. You feel like you're in just like a, it's like a movie, right? right? So it's like watching like some crazy fantasy movie, and then, but at least with a movie, you get drawn in because there's like, you know, you get you get you know drawn into this story or whatever. But with the Bible, because you know you're, it's not presented in that way, but it, it's still just as unreal but you don't actually get, you know, drawn in if you're just an unbeliever and a kid and they're showing you all these pictures of heaven and it's like Jesus and lambs and togas or whatever. And you're just like, I don't even want to go there. Like, I don't even appeal. To <laughs> you know, like that's how I remember I was just terrified. Like, Oh, that's the best I could look forward to. Like it totally freaked me out. Um, if, if it, if the Bible was real, like I, it didn't even appeal to me because it, you know, the, and then the, people will speak to you with this assumption that the idea of being washed of your sin, born again, um, and that you have eternal life in Christ, like that, that's even appealing. Like they're even taught, like saying something that, oh yeah, you know what? Uh, well, I do want that. How do I get that? You, like you can't, you've got to find out where the person's coming from. You've got to find out, especially if they're, if they're really coming from a place where they're just total unbeliever, like an atheist. You know, somebody totally caught up in the modern, postmodern world. You've got to figure out like where their pain is, and and and, and really understand. I, I feel to reach them because I have reached people like this that I've that I've known in my life, where you know I can't say for sure 
whether they're saved or not. But I like for one, like one of my really close friends, Ben, different Ben, he's a, you know, he was a complete atheist. Um, and uh, I got to the point where after two weeks of just going back and forth and text messages where every um, argument he could come up with about why the Bible wasn't true, you know, I just, you know, patiently uh, uh, refuted and he loves truth enough to not, you know, just deny it. So I at least have a, a reasonable person to, that I'm talking to where he couldn't deny that the Bible was true, but it, it took me uh, and he, and, you know, and he, and he also be- totally uh, believes that the gospel is faith alone. And he understands why works can't be involved. And his reaction was to get angry once he realized the Bible was true <laughs> because he was, uh, he was so depressed at the time. He just, he said that he wanted to, kill himself once his parents died so that because he was running the business and he didn't want to do it. Uh, he didn't want to kill himself while they're still alive. He felt bad. He wanted to kill himself once they died. And then he just wanted to cease to exist. And he was mad because he realized now I've thrown a wrench into that whole thing that he wasn't going to get, it wasn't going to get his way. Right. But he was honest, but that came from just me figuring out like where his mental blocks were. Right. And um, so this is somebody who didn't even want to believe it was true, you know, <laughs> but he, he couldn't deny it anymore because but you have to speak to them in a language they understand, right? And so for me, the way God himself spoke to me was to explain that, um, you know, in Genesis, that, that Genesis made perfect sense. That it was the only thing that explained the human condition. Because I, I wondered why, you know, why death was so unbearable to us. Why, if we've always died, you know, why would, why would it be just so, um, you could never heal from it never heal from the fear of death, never heal from the loss of loved ones and why it seemed to just sort of annihilate anything meaningful about life. Because you could say that life is all about, you know, having children and a family, but all that really means is that, you know, having these people that you love so much and you raise and you, you, you just, you you spend so much time nurturing these relationships and they all come to naught and you don't even know why you don't even know if there was a point to any of it. And so death just invalidates everything you could possibly say was meaningful about life unless there's, unless, you know, there's some greater guarantee and there's some truth and there's some absolutes and promises, right? And, and I realized that Genesis explained that we weren't always meant to know death, that we weren't originally created to know death. And that's why it is so unbearable for us. And that, um, and that suffering happens because we chose to... Uh, to, to basically to go our own way, to try to learn from our own mistakes as opposed to trusting God. Like we all as parents, we know this. We want our children to just take our word for it and not decide that they have to make all these mistakes in order to, um, to, to trust our judgment, right? And I kind of see that in the, in the Garden of Eden. I see that sort of a similar thing. They wanted to know good and evil for themselves, not just trust God when he said no, like, you know, leave that to me. Trust me when I tell you what's good and what's not good and what you should and shouldn't do. Don't try to learn from your own mistakes. Don't try to go, you know, establish these things for yourself. Um, but once we did that, you know, once we chose to, to you know, to, to go our own way and to try to try to learn these things for ourselves, well, that's what we have. We, even the New Agers will say life, you know, oh, we're spirits and we're, or we're like all, we're divine, we're a divine being and we're in this, we're in this uh, avatar because we're we're trying to have experiences, you know, autonomous from our own divine self and all this crap. But like they think it's like a learning process or a boot camp. But, you know, and there's a kernel of truth in there because we because we chose to uh, not to trust God. Now we have to go through this, you know, where we, we basically get our butts kicked until we realize that we just have to trust God <laughs> and just and, 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 and go back to him and trust him as our father rather than trying to establish our own godhood, essentially, is what we're all trying to do. Well, yeah, uh, I think that's a big thing, is that most people reject God uh, based on what they think the Bible teaches, but who he really isn't. Yeah. They, they reject that, thinking he this, this is who he is. He allows these things. He allows evil in the world. You yes. Know? Um, they don't understand that, again, that's the, the framework. If they know the truth, I think both people are, would be 100% agreement. Yeah, that's God. That's God's awesome. Um, and, exactly. yeah, I understand completely. And so that's the biggest thing. It's just uh, un undoing false teaching you know and also te- explaining this was the last thing i wanted to touch on um i never under i never even f- 
for one second considered how ridiculous it was for me to assume that the nature of God and like who God was, if there, because I kind of like, I call myself an atheist, not that I was an atheist, but I kind of always believed that there was a God, but I was afraid to believe it because I thought I was getting my hopes up. So I was kind of like in this weird gray area, but I would still pray to God if something bad happened. I would like, if there's a God out there, I would, you know, like I kind of knew. But um, I also decided that God would ha- would certainly be like, you know, whatever God I thought, you know, I would make a God in my own image. I would decide, well, God, if there's a God, he'd be like X, Y, Z. All these things would be very convenient for me, for God to be like. <laughs> and God wouldn't care about this and he wouldn't care about what I believe. He would, he would just be like, it's all good. And once you die, you'll figure, you know, I'll tell you wh- where you went wrong, but I'm not going to get all caught up in all these silly human matters. You know, I, like all these things that put no pressure on me to actually, you know, find the truth about him. Right. Just because he was imp- a Kabbalistic God, the, the unknowable God, which is like a Kabbalistic concept. I, I've come to find out that um, that God is like impersonal and unknowable. And, and that's a really good way of of invalidating scripture because that's the opposite of the God we find in the Bible. And that was one of the, that's another thing that's so hard for people like my former self to understand is that God would be, you know, personable and have these human traits. But the one, well, that brings me to another thing, an important thing for people to understand is no, God doesn't have human traits. We're created in his image. So we take after him. It's not that it's not that this, this God in the Bible is ridiculous and anthropomorphized because because uh, because it's a, it's a story where, you know, some people in the desert wrote it and it's a way that we can understand things. No, we have things in common with God because he made us in his image. And so all the, you know, it, it, it's not that God shouldn't be some unknowable alien thing, right? That he should, he, we would have things in common with him. We would, you know, we would think in, in a basic way that is consistent with the God of the Bible because it, it, if the Bible is true, but that's the important thing that people never do, people like myself. They don't ever suspend their disbelief when they approach scripture and actually, you know, consider it as though it were true first. Right. You don't you, right. you don't go into the Bible assuming it's not true. You go into the Bible just to suspend your disbelief and assume it is true so that you can actually reason with God. And actually, okay, so if God were real and if this is, you know, if the Bible is true, then a lot of things make sense. That wouldn't make sense if you were just assuming that it's not true. If you're if you're trying to confirm your bias that way. But the, the biggest thing that I think that I see people do all the time is they they attribute they don't ever stop to consider that the degree to which they uh, like or agree with the character of God in the Bible. What ha- if he were really God? If it were really true? their opinion or their preference would have literally nothing to do <laughs> right, with right. the degree to which, you know, it, the, the, that that was true, that that, that was how God was like, like, like God would exist whether or not, and, and he would be the way he is, whether or not they like it. it, it like right. they, but people literally assume that no, certainly the God of all creation would have to somehow, uh, you know, uh, be congruent with my preferences. Right. Like the, the the fact that they that they don't want God to say I don't know uh, let's say you know, b- believe that marriage is between a man and a woman like somehow that mm-hmm. means like like if God's real and if he's you know if he's the God of the Bible your opinion has nothing to do with how with with, with how he is like but people are so entitled and spoiled now that they can't imagine that they actually ha- they uh, they can't they cannot imagine that God would disagree with them. That and, and that, that, that that like that there could be a god that doesn't agree with them, <laughs> and that it mm-hmm. doesn't base his his own character traits around what they what they think, and and their beliefs and opinions, and that's that's something that I, I want people to understand when they're approaching people like that is that they've a lot likely never considered that. Mm-hmm. That's they're so spoiled that that's that's just unthinkable to them, and you have to put it that way to them. You have to you have to to to, to remind them that if the Bible is true. And if all that is true, you know, then why would they ever think that their opinions and, and their whims and their, you know, uh, you know, their likes and dislikes would factor in whatsoever to what the character of God is and what mm-hmm. he says, what he wants from them, you know, um, mm-hmm. and that, uh, you know, and I, 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 I it's, it boggles my mind because when I get these new age type people commenting on my channel, 
they've just made up a god that doesn't it's not even doesn't even conform to any type of god in any other you know false you know religion it's just literally what i call it it's like a buffet god they just pick a little bit mm. of, of, of from here and there and they just they like it's a salad bar or something and mm-hmm. like okay and that's god so you really think it's more likely that the god of all creation would be some random amalgamation of your own whims and musings rather <laughs> than the god of the bible that like the entire like the entirety of society is founded on essentially in one form or another like but they uh. don't they've never stopped to ask themselves that i promise you because i never did i never mm-hmm. stopped to ask myself why why it would be more likely that god would be like just some random thing that i dreamed up and it's not even consistent from one year to the next than the god of the bible the other thing you too know, is that, that um, huh uh, the other thing too is that you know i thought uh, uh, too what helped me was you know if if an alien race came down in, in, from you know outer space so to speak you know you would expect them to not be able to speak our language and that they would have to they would have to introduce you to their language and their conventions in a way of, of, of their way of thinking. Well, that's exactly what the Bible is. It's got its own language, its own conventions. That's why you need the Bible to interpret the Bible mm-hmm. so that you, you can't say, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, I'm trying to think of anything. Um, a thorn. What does what does a thorn sim- symbolize? symbolize? Mm-hmm. Well, you get all that kind of thing through the Bible's own language. And, and mm-hmm. it makes perfect sense that he would give it to a certain people to protect and their whole culture would be how you would uh, know who God is and, and what he values. And again, the language and the conventions. And so for me, it was like, oh, yeah. And the way the Bible's written, too, it's like um, anyone who knows uh, uh, computers knows that there's certain things that are written in the code so that if, a, if, so, if some data is lost, it could be recovered in another area from another area. So it's called parity, where, um, again, if, if a, a one a one if a piece of a data transmission is lost, it could be reconstructed from the data that, that remains. And that's how the Bible is, too. That's why it goes over doctrine over and over again and gives you different angles and perspective of looking at it so that even if there was a, 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 a misprint or a, a someone tried to alter it in some way you could see oh no that we're rejecting that because it's not consistent with the majority of the message you know or the overall theme of the message i thought that was kind of powerful for me yes well sorry i, could get I, I didn't no, want no, to perfect. interrupt you guys can you hear me yeah okay i'm sorry i didn't want to interrupt you guys because you were really on a roll and you made some excellent points but we have actually exceeded our time to go to where I normally like to take a break. And I want to give uh, everybody a chance to stretch their legs, uh, get themselves uh, another beverage and refresh because we're going to come back after the break. Uh, and we're going to go to uh, Sister Angel, if you need to finish up anything, if I didn't allow you to finish any of your thoughts. And then we're going to go to Brother uh, Cripps on Movie Corner, where we're going to be talking about parallels that he can see in the movie the Shawshank Redemption mm. and for those of you who have seen it this ought to be a, a, a very, very lightning because uh, if you heard all of the information that brother Cripps brought out of the movie Matrix I'm I'm waiting with this with for the, for this breakdown with great anticipation oh. and then also we're gonna go last uh, for the evening tonight it will be um, brother Ben uh, with uh, Q's Corner, and we'll pick up next week with some of my thoughts on the image of the beast. That's what I wanted to, to cover tonight, but I didn't feel I had my enough, enough of my uh, arguments for that put together as well as I would like. So we'll we'll start the show, the broadcast off next week with the image of the beast. So right now uh, we're going to go to break. For just about five minutes, people, and then we'll be back right here on Late Night with Lisa and Friends.
Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God. Thank you so much for coming back and sticking with us. I told you guys are troopers. All of you right now, I'm giving you badges. <laughs> you get badges, you are officially, uh, I don't even want to say night owls because it probably has some occultic meaning and then somebody going to think I'm telegraphing something. But uh, I was going to say, you are all officially people who can hang into the late night and the wee hours of the morning, because I think, let's see, 11, I'm terrible with this, 12, 1, it is 1 a.m. on the East Coast, you guys are something else, uh, but, 2 a.m., you know, 2 a.m., here, is it 2, oh, yeah. wait a minute, 11, 12, 1, see, I told you I'm terrible at it, I, yeah. I own it, <laughs> <laughs> when I said I need to leave a little bit early, I just meant that I can't go till 4, 4, 30, or, or yeah, that's, that's yeah. why we're starting, we, we, yeah. we took our break, to so come back and get started with you, Brother Cripps, so you can give us this enlightening and inspiring and knowledgeable interpretation according to what you see sure. in the movie the shaw shank redemption and for those of you who don't know we try to spotlight when we can a movie uh, i decided to fill out he did such a wonderful job with the matrix and we had such a wonderful discussion about that and and the chat loved it too oh. uh on movies uh I decided let's go ahead and do it. Look, let's go ahead and do it. Just make it a regular thing. Whenever Brother Cripps fills up to it, I don't want to wear him out trying to <laughs> keep up with these movie interpretations or what he sees. But tonight we're going to be discussing the Shawshank Redemption. And I don't know how many of you uh, out there in the chat has seen that movie. It is a relatively old movie, Brother Cripps. What would you say about now? About 20 years? Yeah, it seems like it. I, uh, I I don't remember the exact year it came out, but I think it was at the end of the 90s, wasn't it? Okay, let me look at it real yeah. quick. I think so. Is it? I, I don't know. know how I know this stuff because I'm not that old. But <laughs> It's 94. 94. <laughs> Thank you, Brother God, Ben. That's older than I thought 94. Jeez. Wow. Yeah, so that's older. <laughs> See, Brother, Co here. Brother Cripps, you're older than we thought. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I am. I am. I'm, I'm older. I don't look as old as I am, people tell me. So that's at least they got that going for me. Okay. Yeah. So, Brother Cripps, without any further delay, uh, please tell us what, well, what, let me ask you one question before you get started. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. made you pick this week the Shawshank Redemption? You could pick. 10 million movies. Why, why did you pick that one? Well, first of all, this is probably my favorite movie uh, in the world, oh. Shawshank Redemption. It is number one on my list, and I have a pretty huge list, and I have different categories for different kinds of movies. Uh, but in, in this category, uh, you know, kind of like suspense, uh, in the suspense area, I, I think I would categorize it as that. Uh, it is my favorite movie. And I actually am looking in my office. I have a, a an official uh, movie poster uh, uh, of the Shawshank Redemption. It's uh, right here on my left-hand side. And it says, fear can hold you prisoner. Hope can set you free. That's the quote at the top of the poster. And it's official, one of the official Shawshank Redemption posters that went up in movie theaters when it was actually on. Wow. Well. Wow. Wow. I'll, I'll do that quote again, because there is a part of the segment. I'm going to read you a couple quotes from the movie and explain uh, why I think they're so powerful. Fear can hold you prisoner. Hope can set you free. Mm. It is a great quote. movie. It is yeah. a great mm -hmm. movie. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's number one on the 250 top movies on IDMB, which is the Internet uh, Movie Database. Um you know, you can look up movies on there and it tells you who the cast is and who directed and all that stuff. I'm sure you guys have used it or at least uh, are aware of it. So it's uh, number one in that. It's uh, uh, liked. Um, uh, it has been liked. It. Uh, I haven't talked to anyone personally that didn't love that movie. In fact, most people I talk to say that they watch it whenever it's on. I do that too. Now I, I mm -hmm. cannot suffer commercials. So for me, uh, if it's on regular TV and they, they cut everything out, I, I can't watch it like that. Um, it's funny. I don't own it. That just occurred to me. I do not own it, but that, that would be one that I would buy. So I would have it. Mm -hmm. I did have a DVR, which I recorded off HBO or something where I had it on there for a long time, but that was a cable box and I'm no longer with that particular cable company. Anyway, um, I can't really say how many times I've seen it. 
but it never gets mm -hmm. old. It's one of those movies that each time I see it, I notice something, some small detail that I didn't notice before. Because when you watch a movie one time, uh, you're 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 kind of looking at it from a distance, and you're trying to pay attention to the dialogue, trying to pay attention to the storyline. But within uh, uh, movies like this that are really well done, there's more things going on in the background. There's more things going on in the dialogue. There's more connections uh, uh, made in it that you might not see the first time you watch it. Mm -hmm. So before I really get going, I want to do a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, as I mentioned before, when we were doing kind of the teaser, I realize that there are a lot of people out there that for whatever reason, they choose not to watch uh, R-rated movies or secular movies. I am not trying to change your mind about that. That is not my job. Uh, in fact, the way that Paul in scripture talked about eating uh, uh, foods uh, formerly sacrificed to, to idols, you know, there was a big controversy mm -hmm. about that. He made it very right. clear that we're under freedom of Christ. Um, but if it's a problem for you, in other words, if watching uh, secular movies is an issue for you, then let it be an issue for you. Uh, I'm not trying to change that. If, if you have an issue with it, you have a problem with it, then God be with you. And I, I'm, mm -hmm. that's totally fine. Um, I don't have an issue with it. Um, I do exercise my freedom. Doesn't mean I go watch every, anything I want. Uh, but, you know, I, I talk to God about, you know, whether something uh, is good for me to watch. And then while I'm watching it, I have more than one purpose. Um, I love movies. I wanted to be an actor when I was a kid. I wanted to be involved in movies, and I love plays. And I, I mentioned earlier that I have a theater performance degree. Been in a lot of plays, written a lot of plays, uh, directed uh, plays and stuff like that. I love performing. Uh, just something, mm -hmm. something I've always wanted done. Uh, do. And I wanted to be in movies, but that was um, before I discovered how wicked Hollywood is. Uh, when I discovered that and and kind of saw the idea uh, of what a lot of the, the big time actors are kind of forced to do, and that's just my opinion, um, I didn't want to uh, be put in that situation. But having said that, there are still, it's not everyone involved with that, uh, there are still a lot of Christian people that work in uh, in the business, and that is referenced by some of the stuff that comes out has a has a, a Christian kind of theme to it that's hidden. You have to look for it mm -hmm. in most things. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, the show The Simpsons. I know for a fact. I I, I know a person that she didn't work on The Simpsons, but she uh, Simpsons, but she worked in Hollywood. She um, wrote and produced a movie called The Ultimate Gift. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if I can see that, but she, that was her baby. Um, so I got a lot of information from her that she has run into believers in that industry. I, I, I've not been in, in the industry and I, I trust her and I, I believe what she's saying that she knew, um, some writers, they had many writers on the Simpsons and a couple of the writers out there were, were believers. Mm -hmm. So what they try to do is slip little messages in there when they can in the script. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They do the best they can. Right. Now, I'm not saying that every actor that professes to be a Christian or references God right. is a, an actual believer because they can reference God and they're worshiping the God of this world. So you have to be very mm -hmm. careful. Uh, oh yeah. What you trust from anyone that that claims to to believe in God. Um, that having been said, I don't know the writers and directors of this movie and what their beliefs are. I don't. So when I watch a movie, I'm watching it from the aspect of a believer. And I'm always, if I'm going to spend two hours, two and a half hours watching a movie, I want to make the best of my time. So when I watch a movie, I'm looking for uh, uh, any messages from God. I'm looking for anything in the script, anything in the beauty of the movie. How does it move my heart and why? Why did it move my heart? What is the reason why I felt that, felt something move? Um, and then determine, is it from God? Is, is Satan trying to play with my emotions? Because that can happen too. Um, so this particular movie is one that I saw many things that I felt were um, God speaking uh, to us through a secular movie about his message or messages. 
Now, um, I could start at a lot of different places, but I'll just start in the first one that I said, which is fear can hold you prisoner, hope can set you free. Um, that's true for believers. Hope can set you free. The truth of Jesus Christ can set you free. Uh, there was a message of hope in this. The, uh, the storyline of uh, Dufresne, Andy Dufresne, who was accused of a crime he didn't commit and thrown into prison. He's in prison, I believe, for over 40 years. And he even, uh, during the storyline, he even had someone come in that uh, admitted to the murders that he was accused of doing. But because the warden at the time uh, felt like he was valuable, Andy Dufresne, he had the guy killed. And so he was wrongly convicted and kept in prison, uh, even when yes. uh, truth of his innocence came out. Mm -hmm. So the biggest glaring message for me in it is uh, Andy Dufresne, the character of Andy Dufresne, could be reckoned to Christ. I'm not saying that he was perfect. I'm not saying mm -hmm. um, that that was intentional, but he was. He did. An innocent man, right. A man that served served his time. He he. Um, took on the punishment for another character who was wicked and evil and actually committed the crime. And um, uh, in in the scene where, okay, so he eventually escapes. And when he escapes, this is from spending many years of persistence, persistence, scratching on this uh, wall with uh, a rock hammer. And if you've seen the movie, you see what you know what a rock hammer looks like. It's just a little small, tiny thing. Someone even made the comment to him because they were they were saying, that, you know, if you get caught with this, you don't know me. That was Red, his buddy, um, in the movie, and he was saying, you know, if you get caught with this, uh, uh, you know, you don't know me. We'll never do business again. And then he laughs because he tells him before he sees it. He says, when you see it, you'll know. Uh, I'm not using it to break out. Um, and when you see it, it's just a little small thing. I said it would take a hundred years to to use that thing to get through a wall. Uh, but he found a little spot, you know, uh, pressure and time works on uh, everything and it makes it brittle and it breaks it down. And because of that, he, uh, Andy Dufresne was able to escape. Uh, when he finally built the hole in the wall, uh, he waited for a night that there was a thunderstorm and he crawled crawled down and got into the sewer pipe and he went through uh, uh i think it was two and a half football fields worth of, of space he had to crawl through the worst muck and mire uh to get out to the other side and when he got out he plopped it was raining and thundering and stuff which uh, covered up some of the noise and he gets out into this uh you know where the pipe ends in like a little river or something and he, he brought his clean clothes with him and stuff, and he stands up while there's lightning, a very dramatic uh, moment. He stands up and holds his arms out to the side and standing in the rain because he actually was free. Uh, I, in that moment, I could almost cry because that's the way I feel because of what God has done for me. I, I, on the other hand, uh, Andy Dufresne wasn't guilty of the crime he was accused of. Doesn't mean he's not guilty of other crimes. Doesn't mean he's a perfect person. But I feel and I can relate to how he must have felt uh, getting out of this, of this horrible prison that he's in. We're all in a prison, whether you recognize it or not. We're in a prison. We're in captivity. There are lots of messages in the Old Testament mm -hmm. about what we should do in captivity because the Hebrew people, guess what? They got themselves into captivity all the time. And I believe that's a reference for us of how we're supposed to live in this world. This world is not our home. Hebrews were not in their home. They were in other countries when they were taken over uh, by other groups of people. And while they were there, Jesus didn't, or God didn't tell them, uh, just sit on your butt and do nothing and and just, uh, you know, uh, put up with what they tell you to do and 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 don't worship me and don't get involved in the culture. Um, don't plant vineyards and don't plant um, gardens and, and all that. that. That's not what he said. Um, I don't know exactly where the reference is, but there, there are uh, things he told them to do while they're in captivity. Have children. Um you know, build, build your, build your gardens, uh, 
keep keep your house. You know, don't don't segregate yourself. Uh, don't follow the other other laws. We have examples of that. Uh, not following the culture from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and also from Daniel, how they uh, clung to their faith even in captivity, which I believe is a shadow of how we're supposed to live. We are in captivity, but we're supposed to live for God nevertheless. And a lot of us are doing that. That's what we're supposed to do. So anyway, the, the, the moment where he slides out into that little river and he stands up, and holds his arms out to the side, I can relate to that of how I feel, knowing that Christ has delivered me. I am a guilty man. I'm not innocent. I'm a guilty man, but yet Christ has set me free. And that is one of the one of the best moments for me in, in the movie. There's that one in the in the ending. Um so there's the idea of uh the character of Andy Dufresne uh reminding us of who Christ is, uh, accused of a crime he didn't commit, but uh, did it anyway, and uh, uh, set himself free, and just like Jesus raised himself up from the dead, mm-hmm. uh, that was something he, that he did. Um, that's that's the major point, uh, and there are several other smaller points. One of the things was it presents the um, presents uh, the insidiousness of a false gospel. So the warden himself represented himself as a virtuous, godly man, but he was taking kickbacks. Uh, yeah. he wasn't he wasn't righteous at all but yet he threw scripture around in fact there's mm-hmm. one very satisfying scene when uh Andy Dufresne keeps the rock hammer in a bible now yeah. he, shouldn't, he shouldn't have defaced the word of god obviously okay so i'm not i'm not saying we should do that uh but he cut out a portion of of the scripture so he could hide the rock hammer and they came to toss his cell and they found some uh some chess pieces that he'd been working on, uh, you know, from rocks because they would went and got mm-hmm. them from rocks. And uh, the warden uh, or the guard, actually, one of the worst guards in, in the whole uh, harder screw in Shawshank, they call them. He yeah. hands, hands the Bible to the warden and he's talking and he, they're going on and on. And then they close the, the cell door. And they said, oh, oh, I almost forgot. And he handed Dufresne back the Bible that had the rock hammer in the whole time. It's interesting to me the warden didn't even open the Bible up. He he mm-hmm. had an opportunity to open up the word, and he would have mm-hmm. found the rock hammer, but he had no interest in opening up the word. My guess is the way he acted, he thought he knew everything about the Bible, and he he wouldn't uh, wouldn't bother to to uh, open up the word for himself. Right. Uh, interesting to me. Hands the Bible mm-hmm. back, and he said, "Oh, I can't uh, can't forget to give this back to you. Freedom lies within." Hmm. He said. And yeah. it, and Andy Frayne, of course, agreed because he knew that the rock hammer was in there as well. Right. So right, the, if I recall, brother Ben, uh, excuse me, brother Cripps, he smiled pretty like a uh, Cheshire yeah. cat when he said that. But go oh, ahead. he sure did. <laughs> he sure did, and rightly so. So that was one thing, and then another uh, thing in the warden's office, uh, and I'm going to probably misquote this, but it says um, the. It was from the verse, you never know when the master of the house comes, and that's what that's what Andy Dufresne quotes back to him. And he had that crocheted, the warden had that crocheted by his wife, that, mm-hmm. that scripture. <clears throat> um, judgment comes quickly, uh, and uh, judgment did come to the warden. So this warden is representing himself as a believer, and he has, uh, he represents to me a false gospel. He represents mm-hmm. people that consider themselves righteous, but they take kickbacks and they do all this stuff on the outside. You know, he's a, he's a warden, so you look at him and you think, oh, maybe he's maybe he's doing right. But they showed several instances. Mm-hmm. The worst thing they did that he showed was the guy that uh, said that he uh, had served time with the actual murderer for which Andy Dufresne was was yes. incarcerated for. Yes, was gonna was willing to. Uh, go to court and admit yes. that he'd heard this. So the mm-hmm. warden had uh, the hardest uh, guard in the in Shawshank shoot him, took him out for a cigarette at night in 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 darkness, and asked him some questions, and then had him shot and killed. So yep. there was Andy Dufresne's chance of getting out, and uh, the warden prevented it from happening. Cold blooded um, murder. 
Cold-blooded murder, absolutely. So he was not a good man, and there were many, many things that prove that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's a mirror of uh, mirrors of the teaching of, of Jesus in this. Um, uh, uh, the message is not overt for some, but if you're a believer, it's not hard to see. If you're a believer watching anything, if there's a message in it, I believe the Holy Spirit will show you that message because everything is beneficial for us as believers, if depending on what we're looking at it for. Uh, and this movie was definitely one in that way. Um, it, it, there's little seeds in there, little seeds, little uh, moments, um, conversations between people that have a good message. And um, I'm going to pull that up right now. There's some quotes. Well, Brother Cripps, if, if I could. Yeah, please. You left, you left out a couple of key things, uh, too, <laughs> in that movie. I know there's so much, but well, there is, concerning yeah. Andy, uh, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder when I say no, please, this. No, I want you to. I want you to work with me on it. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> when, when Andy does remember now, he does a whole setup on top of it yes. with creating a bank account. Yes. <laughs> and he actually gets a hold of the the wealth that the warden has yep. laid up for himself. <laughs> yep. Set up a fake name and all the kickbacks and all the extra money. So that the so that the uh, government didn't get it that was supposed to be for the warden he he made up a, a false name for himself right. and when he got out he used that suit took a suit from the warden and polished up his shoes nobody even noticed because he was wearing the shoes when he left the office that night nobody even bared right. to bother to look at the man's shoes they were shined like you wouldn't believe. And he put all that stuff in a bag. And when he got cleaned up and got out, he had some soap with him, got all cleaned up and everything. He put that suit on and strolled right into several banks the next day and got all the money that he put in separate accounts under his name. And it matched the name. The name he chose matched. And he was able to get all that money and then and get away scot-free. To so paradise. What was, yep. What was the point you were going to make? Though? Yeah. Because, well, that. But well, check this out. All right. Um, <laughs> remember the old commit suicide? Yes. Because he's hopeless. When he gets out, he spent all of his life in prison. Yep. And he, he has nothing. You know, they, they just turn people loose with a couple of dollars. He had nothing. He had to go work at a, a grocery store as a, as a box boy. And he just, he had nothing. Mm -hmm. And he, all his friends were in prison. He didn't know anyone. He had nothing. He felt so out of place, and he ends up hanging himself. Mm -hmm. Yep. Remember right. his friend, Andy's friend in prison, is who's the character that played Morgan Freeman? Uh, played Red, you mean? It is Morgan Freeman. Red. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm saying Morgan Freeman played Red. Yep. Yes, I had I it. I know what you meant. Uh, <clears throat> that per that character, he gives hope to. Yeah. Because he tells he tells him when you get out. Yep. You know, you come look me up and he tells him where he can find him. So he, not only did he leave and he had a plan and he gets out and he takes all the money and he goes to what is the equivalent of paradise. Mm -hmm. But he left him hope because you think yeah. when because he when he gets out. Uh, Red, when he gets out, he does the same thing. He starts working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's old. He yep. don't know anybody. All his friends is in prison. And you think he's going to commit suicide because he ends up in the same room where the man committed suicide and hung Brooks. himself. Yep. Brooks was here. It, he, right. He carved that into the the ceiling uh, uh, beam where he hung himself, for sure. Right. An epitaph, right? Yeah. So then he gets up there and you think he's going to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. But he carves out something. Yeah. Red was, too, I think is what he said. Right. And said Brooks was here. He, Red was too. And then he goes mm -hmm. and shows up where Andy is. And they're having a nice cool drink on the beach, smiling and laughing. Which personally, I believe, <laughs> is that hope that we have in Christ. There's a reward. Yeah. You know, you when you get to the end. Yes. Yeah. You did me a favor, and let me let me let me fill mm -hmm. in some sure. of the details that you just brought up because I was gonna, I was actually gonna go to that anyway, but you you saved me the the setup. So the first thing is you mentioned that uh, Dufresne gave uh, Red hope. 
So the quote is, and this is from Andy Dufresne, he said to Red, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. That's the quote. Right. So right. he gave Red hope. In fact, he left some money for him in uh, uh, under some rocks, the volcanic rocks that had no business being in a main field. So it was in a field in Maine with a big rock wall. And he told Red if he ever got out to go there, he left something for him. So not mm -hmm. only did he give him hope while he was there, and it gave him hope that he, that he escaped, but he left a gift for him that all he had to do was dig a little bit for it, and there mm -hmm. it was. So to mm -hmm. me, that's a message of, uh, of the gospel, you know, the, the field that we dig in, uh, which is getting to know who Christ is. And when we dig, there's always a reward for us. And, and, and you stated it uh, very clearly. So that reward, at the end of hope, there's a reward that is left for us. At the end of hope, there is that, that beach of freedom, that place that we're going we're gonna to be, be at where we can sit around and, and uh, you know, uh, fix up a boat and it's beautiful weather and all that stuff. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a shadow because heaven, I believe, is going to be way better than that place, however oh, yeah. that place is. But it's still a reward that waits for us. We don't deserve the reward, but hope gives us the opportunity uh, through Christ to receive that reward. And all, all we have to do, the only part we play is we have to look for it. That, that's mm -hmm. the only part we play in salvation. Uh, we have to we have to seek his face. He tells us, he promises us that when we seek him, we he will be found by us. Mm -hmm. Amen. So that's any person, any person that has the desire to seek him, you're being called by him. If you have any part of you that has any desire to, to find out more about who Christ is, then you have to know the Holy Spirit is calling to you. Amen. And he is not going to hide himself from anyone that diligently seeks him. There's more than one place in his word where he makes that clear. See, here's the thing. Red could have decided to, to stay in the grocery store where he has to, he thinks that he has to ask permission to go to the bathroom and he's living in that kind of a halfway house hotel and all that. He could have decided, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to take the extra step to go to that field and, and dig up what's there for me. He could mm -hmm. have, he could have decided uh, to to not uh, take advantage of the hope that was left for him. He could have, and many people do. Even mm -hmm. though they know that there's something good for them somewhere, that they all they have to do is is trust in it. They have to they have to dig a little bit. And the reward will be great. Some people they they just stick with their own their their mundane life and they and they just they stay with that. And Red could have done that, but he didn't. He decided after, I mean, he didn't start out. Here's the other thing. He didn't go right to the main field. He he tried to integrate into regular life again. Right. But the message he received was that he started to feel like Brooks felt. Like, you know, the world got itself in such a darn hurry and, you know, kind of left him behind. Mm -hmm. uh, because another quote I was going to read, and this is, this is um, you referenced Brooks, and they were talking about it after they found out that he had, he had, uh, taken his own life. Uh, Red says, uh, these walls are funny. First you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough mm -hmm. time passes, you get you get so you depend on them. Uh, that's institutional, institutionalized. So mm -hmm. they're talking about Brooks there. So there's a lot in that quote, and that's a lot of what life is like. These walls are funny. This prison that we're in is funny. First you hate some of the things, and then you get used to them. You get used to them over time. And that's what they want us to do with a lot of the, the ways that the world tries to, to keep the sheep pacified is they make it so that we don't want to fight anymore. We don't want to fight for our rights. We don't want to go up against their lies. Uh, the last situation that we're in, a lot of people, I think part of that was a test. I'm not trying to go off on a tangent here, mm -hmm. uh, but I do believe that they were, uh, they were trying to get a gauge of how many people would fall for it, how many people would do exactly what they want them to do. They do that from time to time. Mm -hmm. But the point is a lot of people are institutionalized in this prison that we're in. They believe the government. They believe the leaders. They believe the world. And we're different than that. We, mm -hmm. We're supposed to believe only what the Bible says, and we're supposed to keep our eyes on Christ. And that's what protects us from being institutionalized. 
Right. We're not supposed to be part of this world. We're separate from this world. Andy Dufresne, he yes. escapes. He escapes from the world and gets set free where other people don't. Mm -hmm. And he had to call. You pointed that out. Did you say what he called it? Or we can't. We're not going to use the word. But it was a river of poop. Remember? Yes. Yeah. It was. He had to crawl through a river of poop. Yep. He did. He did. And sometimes that's what we have to crawl. This this captivity that we're in is not always fun. Yes. It's not always fun. We do have to go through things. Now, Christ finished the work, but that doesn't mean that we're, we're not going to go through tribulation. It does not mean that we're not going to have persecution. Those are some of the things that we face because simply because that we're in captivity. Right. But Jesus came to set us free. He came, he came to reconcile us back to God, and one of the byproducts of that is setting us free. And it's Amen. such a beautiful thing. So probably my my favorite quote is the one I uh, hope is a good thing, maybe the best things, and no good thing ever dies. And the hope of Christ never dies. The words of Christ never die. Mm. These things are there Only for God is good. Yeah, God is that God is good. Now another one that's not as much uh, spiritual, but it's a good spiritual principle. One of the quotes from Andy Dufresne was, "Get busy living or get busy dying." It's just a short quote, right? But that's the way I feel about uh, living in the gospel, living in the truth. Get busy living in the, the truth that God has given us. Uh, we have no business getting busy dying. We have no business doing that. Um, we should, knowing what he's given us, the freedom that he's given us in Christ, we should be living in that, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't, as we've said, it doesn't have anything to do with salvation, um, right. but it is what we, we should all do. We should all get busy living. We also should, uh, be, you know, God refers to us as a light that's set on a hill. Yes. And, and we shouldn't put our faith under a bushel. We shouldn't put the light that God's given us through him. We shouldn't hide it. That's right. And I've done that. I am yeah. guilty of doing that in the past. I, I've been a believer for a long time. I went through my period of rebellion where uh, I, I knowingly, even though I knew the truth, and I was the worst prodigal. Uh, I mentioned that in the chat earlier because I did know the truth. Now, if anyone ever asked me, I would tell them the truth. They knew right. what I uh, yes. But that's not enough. Frankly, that's not enough. And then when, mm -hmm. I, got out of, uh, when I got out of that and God brought me back uh, to him, I never left him, but I did rebel against the church. I rebelled mm -hmm. against the the uh, upbringing that uh, my parents put me under and going to Christian schools and all that. And uh, that's a longer story, but um, I saw a lot of hypocrisy and I saw in the world that people were, uh, I, I felt better about someone from the world stabbing me in the front instead of being stabbed in the back by other so-called believers. Now I understand now that they weren't real believers. They're false converts. They're, they're representing themselves much like the warden was in Shawshank. Mm-hmm. You know, they say all the right things and they say they go to church and, you know, uh, they might know some scripture, but they're underhanded. Their deeds are wicked before the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they'll stab someone in the back, just like the warden did in a heartbeat if it helps them in some way. And that's that's a lot of what I experienced. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I got out of that, out of my rebellion, it took some time for God to build me back up. And he's still doing that. He's still mm -hmm. building all of us up. No matter how long it's been since you believe, some people, you know, have only believed for a short time. Well, guess what? While you're in this world, while this flesh breathes, uh, he's still going to be working on you always. He never stops working on you. You should be producing his fruit uh, for as long as we're here. Um, I, I started to get to the point we should be a light to the world, a city that's set on the hill. We are salt and light for this broken, fallen world. Um, mm hmm and they can see the light in us. That's the way we're supposed to live. We're, so they can see the light in us and glorify the Father, which is in heaven. Right. That's what we want to do. Now, I can go on and on, but um, I think that gives a few uh, a few of the things in the movie. Um, if you haven't seen it, I strongly suggest it. Well, there's another, mm -hmm. one more thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Andy Dufresne uh, writes the writes to uh, a group to get some books and he sets up this huge library and things like that. And they, 
uh, because of his persistence, you know, first they turned him down, they turned him down a bunch of times and he keeps, he keeps sending them letters. And finally they just sent him a check, I believe just to shut him up. And when right. they, do, they also send him some music, some albums, and he hijacks the PA system for the hospital, for the hospital, mm -hmm. hijacks the, the PA system for the prison. And he plays this opera, uh, music. Mm -hmm. And it goes out through the whole the whole prison. Now he paid for that. He had to go on the go on the hole for a while for that incident. But while he's playing this beautiful music, all these prisoners that are in there that that, that don't get a chance to hear things like that. Right. It was transcendent. That scene was transcendent. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube if you want to see it. It's the Shawshank Redemption opera scene. That's all you have to put in the search engine, and it'll, it'll come up for you. Mm hmm. But the quote from that is, and Red says, I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a gray place dares to dream. Mm -hmm. I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a gray place dares to dream. In captivity, it's hard to recognize the good things. But when a good thing comes, you definitely recognize it, just like these prisoners did when that music. Many of them probably weren't opera fans. Mm -hmm. But just to hear something so beautiful and moving, and God, in this captivity, God leaves many things for us that we can delight in, that we can uh, take as solace for our soul. We can mm -hmm. celebrate that God has put things in his creation and in this broken, fallen world. They're, they're forgive the uh, uh, example, but Easter eggs, they're, that's what they call them in movies where, you, you know, they've got little things in there that reference other movies or they're, they're little, little secrets that people find. Mm. Um, he's put them in this world for us. And yeah. for the lost, I believe. I believe also, like, the ones he knows will never be saved. I think he puts up a lot of things in there that, um, it, out of compassion for them, he, make, he makes life enjoyable since it's only heaven they're going to know. You know oh, yeah, that's a good point. Mm. Yeah, I've always asked the question, why do the wicked live so long? It seems like there's a lot of people that are, that are non believers that are wicked and they seem to, um, David asked the same question. Why does it, why do the wicked flourish? Why do they do so well? Why do they, uh, put us under their, uh, um, control? You know, David was mm -hmm. asking the question. Um, I think that what Angel just said, I think is very true. Uh, God knows that a lot of these people, it's because of his grace that they live so long, why they're blessed so much, because they're going to have yeah. nothing in their next life. Mm. And that hurts oh, him, yeah. you know, that hurts him. And, and it, it's, I can only, because I mean, you get a lot, a great deal of the loss, you know, mm -hmm. are, are fallen and sinful. Yes. But, you know, we're, they're, we're not talking like violent, murdering, you know, rapists. They're just, they're lost. And I know it right. has to pain him so much. And he does give them these little, it's, it's he's so gracious. And I, I think a great deal of it is more for them than for us personally. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, a great deal of the things he puts in the world, because I, and that's one thing I love about watching films and stuff like that is that, you know, I see God in all of those things. And I see God even in the music of, of the ungodly. Um, uh, and I try to see them through his eyes, you know, mm -hmm. and I see um, and I try to I try to see like the good things he's put in those people, the, the, the you know, even the people that I really am not fond of. I try to see a little like like how he would have intended for them or what he wanted for them and the the, the, the personality the character the or the talents he gave them even you know and, and um, i just think that yeah i mean that's why i love looking for things just I, it's so weird that you do this jason because i've done the, i mean i've had so many moments like this about movies i know exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about is it's and you wonder who's doing it is it the writers because you know stephen king didn't he write the shawshank redemption uh, he wrote the book. It was actually called uh, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. It was the name of it. it I wonder how much it differs. Um, well, some of the characters are a little bit different. Like, for instance, Red was a white Irish guy. But but they did a good job of making a joke about this. So why do you call you Red? They said this to Morgan Freeman's character. Why do you call you Red? He says, I guess because I'm Irish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so that was a, that I know was a, Stephen King is the is you know if if, if whoever put that it, it, these things you noticed you know I don't believe it was King's doing because he was in the cult that with my best friend's family like in that specific cult like he's like a he's a he's a Luciferian um, 
And um, so it's, but you know, sometimes I wonder too, if maybe they don't, because I know a lot of them really do understand what they're rejecting. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. I, I do believe that. And sure. so they wouldn't even be capable of almost taunting alone. But I, I think what you're talking about, you're right. It could be like a writer, writers that, that put these move moments in the movies, the movie doesn't, they don't have, it didn't have to come from the book. Is my understanding. Like it's, yeah. it's specific things. It's, you know, the river of poop. I always yeah. thought that that was the poop from the prison. Right. And so if you look at it, kind mm -hmm. of, it's like he was wearing their, Sin, their yeah. excrement kind of like mm. right to get through yeah wow that was great yeah. angel yeah that was great thank you for adding that so um do we do we want to move on? Is that enough uh, for this particular movie? That, yeah, that I, I think that's good. It is get it is getting late. Um yeah no I think you did you gave us a lot to think about. I know whenever I'm the same way, whenever I see it, I, I, I'm always tempted to watch it again. I, probably the only times if I have to go out or something, but uh, I've always stopped and watched it wherever I catch it because it is such an excellent film. And I think it does cause you to do a certain level of reflection, even if people aren't even cognizant that's what <laughs> that's what they're doing it's like what does this stuff mean it does it yeah. does it have a deeper meaning or even yeah. oh i've experienced that or i've been that i know what it feels like to have to crawl through a bunch of mess i don't want to yeah. deal with so you see those um, parallel or uh analogies or mm -hmm. um examples in your own life so yeah. i think that movie does cause people to examine themselves in a great way, or even see their hypocrisy, for example, like with the warden and stuff he was doing. Yeah. Um, it, is, it really is a deep film. I think that was a good prick for the Crips. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Brother Ben, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if you uh, if you were to watch it again, just look at it from, I, I actually say, I, I forget to do it sometimes, but before mm -hmm. movies, uh, I, I try to say, God, if there's anything in this movie for me, um, please reveal it to me. When I say that about music, I say that about anything, really. I do that too, Jason. I do that too. Yeah. Um, so before you watch again, even though you've seen it before, um, mm -hmm. say that prayer and just see if he does show you anything new that you didn't recognize before. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I mean, uh, his, ha his handiwork, as, as I expressed earlier, it really is, you know, the message of God all around us if we just pay attention. Like Sister Angel pointed out on one of the other broadcasts on, I believe it was Brother Luke's channel about the flowers. You know, just it was amazing. I had never thought about that before. So uh, if we look, we can see God. I'm not saying God is in everything. Right. I'm saying we can see the evidence that yeah. he is real yes. because this is his creation. Absolutely. And even the people who are evil <laughs> or wicked that may intend stuff for evil. Yeah. The Lord can still turn it around for our good and his glory. Amen. So for next week, my homework for anyone that wants to is to watch, if you haven't seen it yet, or, or if you want to watch it again in preparation for next week, The Count of Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo. And there's a lot in that one. If you haven't seen it yet, it's a, it's a well-done movie. Um, it's also a, a very uh, popular book. Uh, now, did they do two on that, or is there just the one? Uh, yeah, there's there's two. I liked the uh, second one, not the really old one. I'm going to look that up real quick. Uh, oh, sure. I, I know I saw the original because I was and have always been uh, an old movies buff. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. I used to... I think it's just because of the time I was born and the way television was. Oh, when they too. played reruns, that's <laughs> that's all you had. They didn't have any of this newer stuff. So you just you sat there and watched it. And yeah. it was one of my favorite movies. I'm trying to remember. I make sure I'm not mixing it up or I didn't rename it myself. The Count of Monte Cristo. Is yeah, it looks like it, the new one, it's, it's got uh, the guy who played uh, Jesus and Passion of the Christ, correct? That's the one? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes. From 2002. Yeah. Yes, 2002. 2002. Um, 
Now I'm I'm interested if there you, you say that there was another one, 1934. So right, yeah, I think that's what I was saying. I have not seen the old one, so now that's going to have to be a <laughs> homework for me to see the old one. Oh, it's available on Prime, which I have. Well, I think I I'm, hear the excitement in your voice, brother Chris. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because the message in this is fantastic. The message in the Count of Monte Cristo, there's lots of, there's more than one. There's lots of messages about revenge, uh, about uh, love and things being taken away. Um, uh, especially, uh, again, it's a situation where he was accused of something he didn't commit. Um, he was uh, put away in prison for a very right. long time. So there's there's plenty of things in there. As well as the book, but we're not talking books. We're yes. talking movies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I had to I had to refresh my memory on that one because for the past couple of days, with all this mask wearing, <laughs> the yeah. people are. I've been thinking about the man in the iron mask. Oh, okay. No. Because when I thought about how this stuff causes trauma and what it what it does to people, what it was created for, and it brought back that movie to mind because that was a punishment that they exacted on him to put him in that iron mask. Yeah. It was a part of his torment. <laughs> so I was thinking about that because when I was doing more research behind ritual masks, that movie came to mind. And it was, it was funny because a good friend of mine, I can't, I couldn't pay her a million dollars to watch one of these old black and white films but the original was excellent and when they did the remake she had a big crush on of the young gentleman that was in there i can't think of his name right now oh leonardo dicaprio mm -hmm. and so she wanted to see it she was like oh i can't so oh, when she yeah, saw it she, <laughs> when she saw it she was like oh i love this movie i said you think this is good. The original was even better, but <laughs> I can't pay her to watch stuff like that. But right. that movie where, where he, there's a whole, <laughs> there's a, I could probably preach a sermon on that movie because of, of what he goes from, from being the king yeah. into bondage Boom. and then back to the throne <laughs> there right there. Okay. There so go. if if you guys oh, haven't seen it, and then no. they made him so like, <laughs> Kind of like Christ-like in a way, like we're like, not really, but like innocent, Noble. Very innocent, like no, yeah, yeah, like Dufresne in a way too. Like oh. Dufresne had that irreverence, but like he was very, like he was very noble person, but like he, he was irreverent. Kind right. of reminded me of how Christ was in the face of the Pharisees. Yeah, you know. One of the quick thing I wanted to point it out in, in that movie that I loved was now I'm think I hope I'm not mixing up movies. I think I have the right one because it's been years since I've seen it. But um, if I recall, the character who helps him get back the throne, I think in the original movie it was Errol Flynn, but I'm not a hundred. I gotta go back and I gotta go back and look. But that was one of my dad's favorite actors back in the day. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, he wanted to sit down in the presence of the king, and that was against protocol. You could not do it. You right. could die. OK, so every time he every time he wants to sit down, the 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 guard that was protecting the king that had remained faithful to him, even when he was in what they call exile type thing, yeah. he he kept he, Earl from would go to sit down and he go <clears throat> and he'd stand up. Mm -hmm. So when they when when the like the night before his throne is restored to him, he asked for help him. He says, what is it that you want? Because when I take my throne, I'm a granite. And I'm, I'm going by memory now. I hope I'm butchering this because it's been a while. And everybody states what they want. And he's like, I'm going to give you that. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Now, when he gets to, to, to the character that Earl Flynn, who helped liberate him and restore him back to the throne, he says, uh, what do you want? He said, all I want is to be able to sit in your presence. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and so he says, that's all you want. He's like, that's all I want. He said, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Now, when he gets restored and everybody's in all their beautiful attire and he's seated back on the throne and the men who have done evil to him have been judged, mm -hmm. put in the iron mask themselves and received the same fate, then um, he, uh, Errol Flynn is standing over in the corner and, he, and he's like, 
he, he can't stand still. It's like he's doing that thing where you shift your weight from one foot to the other. And yeah. he walks up and sits down right at the feet of the king. And this big, huge, if I remember, it was a big black dude who was muscular with a sword. He sword out, boy, he about to strike him. And the king raises his hand and says, it is his right. <laughs> oh, oh. And, the, and the guy puts his sword down and bows away and backs away. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and wow. I just see all of that parallel when it comes to Christ, how he said we can come boldly to yeah. the throne of grace wow. and obtain help in time of need. I love it. <laughs> I love it. See, you're you're getting it. <laughs> you're getting it. You, you had it before and didn't even like put it into the the same terms, maybe. Oh, uh, Brother Chris, what you're doing, my dad used to do all the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not. That's the one why he that. would sit there and he. No, but 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 you, you know what? I thank you because you kind of reminded me. I kind of had forgotten that. And, and you brought it back up. And, oh, you know, my dad used to do that because when he would tell, oh, that ain't of the Lord. Oh, that, <laughs> and we're looking and we would be, he would be setting our mind according to the framework or the mind of Christ. Beautiful. Even when we were watching films and we all still do it to this day, <laughs> to this day. Well, I can't wait to meet your dad. Uh, that's wonderful. I'm glad that he did that with you. Well, my mom always tells this joke. She said, I if I have it right, he's sitting on the lap of Jesus, asking him all kinds of questions, just like a little child. Because <laughs> my dad, he he lo he loved the Lord. He studied the Bible. I, I I wouldn't have recognized him if his head wasn't in the Bible or a book related to the Bible trying to expound mm -hmm. on the things of God. Oh, wonderful. God gave him a real heart for his word. That's great. He really did. So let's add what? something before we move on. Let's add one thing yes. to this. So if you guys have movies that you would like me to watch and see mm. if I if I find anything in them, then I'm I'm open to suggestions. Now it's likely that I've seen a lot, That's but cool. with you, Sister Lisa, what? you're challenging me because I like old <laughs> movies too. But I hadn't <laughs> seen the the original version of this. But I, I found it and I'm gonna watch it. Okay. Uh, and to help me prepare, because then I'll have two to go from to see which one was better, see which one uh, stayed more uh, true to the message that I found in the novel. I think when I look at the remake, for example, of The Man in Iron Mask, I think they did an excellent job. It yeah. was very well done. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any complaints, and I had seen the original. I was, I was rather pleased with it. Okay, good. Good, good, but good. I, I don't know. I don't recall about the count of money of crystal because it's been so long. Yeah. But I, I think I'm gonna have to go back and watch them both too and do the same thing. But mm -hmm. that being said, brother Chris, if you said everything, we are yeah. coming to our last segment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, that's what I wanted to add before we move on to uh, brother Ben, so he can take a deep breath and collect his uh materials to get ready to hit us with the Q factor. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask if how you would like people to contact you to make a movie suggestion to you. Oh, great. Okay. So my uh, email is true story live dot crips at gmail.com. Pretty easy. True story live dot crips. That's my last name at gmail.com. And I'll put is it crips in. with two P's. Yes, it is. Okay. Awesome. So everyone out there in listening land, if you have a movie that you would like Brother Cripps to take a look at and review, send him a email with the title and maybe even a link to the trailer or something. And I hope nobody needs to say, don't send him anything crazy and wicked and demonic and over the top please we're, we're we're trying to keep this all about the glory to the lord so um we are we're certainly willing to consider f even some movies that may be a little friends as long as it doesn't go over the top and it wouldn't be something we could discuss right know? right exactly yeah within reason within reason right yeah okay, okay brother ben thank you, thank you so much did you fall asleep on us brother ben Almost. <laughs> no, I'm, teasing. I'm teasing. Actually, Crips, that was, a, I'm not kidding. I'm not just uh, flattering, uh, trying to flatter you. That was probably the best movie review I've ever uh, listened, heard. Really? Um, yeah, you're a regu regular Siskel and Ebert. Um, <laughs> no, no, seriously, you, have, you obviously have a good uh, talent for it. Um, and I was going to ask you, okay, well, what's the next suggestion? Because I wanted to 
uh, watch it ahead of time myself. But it's interesting is that I recently watched Shawshank Redemption. Um, I watch a lot of older movies lately because for so many years, I was so wrapped up in my job thinking that was what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, and I just kind of lost, just it wasn't living really. Um, and so I'm kind of go back now and just trying to take in some of the stuff that, uh, you know, uh, things I, I watched before forgotten about and seeing with new eyes. And that was when I, I recently saw that was really moving. Um, and I was going to ask you, Hey, what's the next one you're going to do? So I'm looking forward to that count of Monte Cristo too. Um, so, and also too, you know, you said that, uh, some of these, uh, you know, some of these, you know, some of these might not be necessarily biblically based movies, but you know, the Paul says to the pure, all things are pure. So, you know, we can watch these things and yeah. not be defiled by them uh, right. because our minds are, are pure with the gospel. So, um, so yeah. Okay. So again, Amen. Uh, that's a good point, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah. Uh, so with the Q stuff, I don't want to leave anyone, uh, uh leave the, please don't leave the impression. I don't want to leave you with the impression that I'm a, I'm a fan or, uh, you know, I think this is, uh, it just, it's just, it's another source of information. It really, what it is. And, and I think it, a lot of it is really good, accurate information. And one of the things that Q kind of focused on this week was um, the George Floyd thing and basically calling it a hoax and exposing it. And so I was going to show you some of that and uh, some other interesting things I, I've seen about that. You guys may have already, a lot of it you may have already know about, but maybe not. I uh, will see. Um, so let me just flip over here. Uh, actually, so Angel can see it. I'll share my screen too. So, um, Thanks. one second. Okay. Now you said that he said that, uh, the George Floyd thing. Did, did he use the word hoax or did he use the word like, well, no. like psyop? Well, uh, well, I'll show you. So basically, again, he, there's a many things that Q covered, and I, I could go in a lot of detail. And it's a kind of a, a lot of it's like a never-ending story. Hey, Angel, can you mute my chair? Yes. Okay. Um, Am I unmuted? What? See, I that is. I'm sorry. See, I just muted. Okay. It's all right. I'm doing something yeah. wrong. Double clicking, but um, yeah, but you say okay, yeah, because I haven't heard what Q's take on this is, but I have some, I have a tidbit to add when you're done about something I uh, saw today in Cincinnati. Okay, cool. Um, so again, Q, Q talks about many different subjects, uh, and I, I'm not going to cover all of it. I'm just going to kind of cover the main pieces here. Um, but the so one of the first things he did was he showed a picture from Obama, uh, uh, Obama's uh, website. That he Obama had a, a, a the Obama Foundation rather had a um had a post of uh well let me see if I can find it real quick let's see here okay why are you doing that chauvin like chauvinism come on it's like one of those fake names you told me about you pointed out to me oh yeah well, oh I got a I got a whopper for you if you've ever heard it already I'll tell you this is good if you've ever heard this is unbelievable um so anyways basically what q is saying basically hey the obama bit uh um the obama actually i had some photos here let me see if i can open those photos um so uh let's see sorry i kind of lost my place here let's take your time bro uh this is why you're looking i'll just put it a little bit in there yeah so I'm interested in seeing what you have to say or what, what uh, you think about what Q had to say, because it's certainly I'm, I'm aware, as you said, you know, a lot of us are, are probably aware that, 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 um, that it is regardless of what or who did it. Uh, I, I believe that there are definitely, I think we, we touched briefly on a couple of things, even the amount of time uh, that he was uh, uh, under police, um, uh, from the time they they uh, put him in handcuffs to the time he supposedly uh, passed on. Uh, it was a number of minutes. It was a, a, actually the same amount of time. It was the time that the uh, Twin Towers went down. Right. Yeah, I'm not going to cut. Yeah, there's a lot of peculiar, peculiarities with that. I'm not going to cover all those, but just a couple that I'm going to cover here. So uh, multiple times uh, Q was uh, listed or shown James Comey's tweets are basically a signal to the his deep state, uh, you know, <laughs> cohorts uh, to, to basically unleash hell. 
Um, and that's, that I think it's been proven time and time again. And the recent one was his rose here. And then one of the things about the um, Q phenomenon or the uh, Black Lives Matter phenomenon is a bunch of um, uh, rose related things. So uh, let me. Uh, my, Okay, so one is that Black Life Matter uh, logo here. You guys see that? It's a it's a rose. So that's a it, that's a common uh, that rose is a common thing with the uh, Socialist Party. Uh, this is a, a Socialist and Democrat. The occult. Yeah, and the occult. Um, uh, let me a couple other things here. Um, let's see. Oh, by the way, the kneeling thing is a Masonic ritual a, 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 by a grave. And they, I, I'm they glad you that. pointed that out. I thought yeah. so. I thought yeah. so. Yeah. That's, that's a good curiosity. I mean, so that's one thing. Um, there's a lot of kneeling. Uh, oh, I, I just got a couple things that were on my last century. But Greta Thornburg, we know that is, um, uh, she's obviously in on oh, it. Yeah. Uh, okay. But uh, what, what the reason I brought that up is I meant to find another link, but there was a, a link that CNN had that said, uh, where do we go next or something like that? It's about uh, where, where do black people go next? They had three uh, prominent black figures of, you know, social justice and then it it was on cnn they had three pictures of, of different black people and then they had one of one of the panelists was greta thornburg i mean <laughs> give me a break like she has some uh, uh, uh she she's gonna tell us where, the, where, where it goes next um okay so yes <laughs> is this, this is okay, yeah the, this this picture here is okay so and this is what q was alluding to that uh i think it was nine days before Black, uh, uh, George Floyd was announced. Uh, was uh, the, the became public? The Obama uh, Foundation org, uh, his Twitter account, had a thumbnail of this exact picture right here, and it's got two roses, and it's got George Floyd. But again, this is before George Floyd was even um, th that whole thing even went down. Um, and oh wait, it was before he died. Yes, before even yeah, before even and we knew about him, Obama's. I know. Uh, I thought we didn't know about him for a while after he died, but I could be wrong with that. No, the uh, one second. I don't know what date he died on. So, uh, where's my? Sorry. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, Q is basically saying here. He lays it down here in a second. Um, let me try to find it here. But Q is basically saying that the Obama uh, Foundation website had a picture of George Floyd in that mural. But again, it, they, they it, no one knew who George Floyd was was at that time. It was like several days before the event even went down, and it was a thumb. It was a thumbnail, and, and, and Q gives you the code to go back in time and prove it to yourself. Um, you could leverage it, and it will tell you. It will show you clearly that the Obama administration on their Twitter account had a picture of George Floyd. This. Uh, one of these pictures here, this picture here, um, before that anyone, anyone knew who George Floyd was. And again, it's got that rose here, and you see that A in it for anarchy. Okay, uh, anarchy. So that's interesting. Wow. Um, mm. uh, George Floyd, too, he's got tattoos here, but he doesn't have one in here. Uh, mm. Much of thing. Oh, the other thing, too, is there's wow. a lot of weird Satanism. A lot of these, uh, yeah. There's a lot of Satanism that's being revealed in these riots. And this is mm -hmm. one clear example. Um, here's that. Uh, okay, I guess I had black power in the middle of the rows. Yes. Um, okay, I got a couple more things here. Um, let's see. George Floyd has a twin brother. Did you know that? Is it identical? I thought he had a twin or... in the basketball or something. No, he's a twin brother, and his brother slips up and calls him. He's called uh, George Greg. So listen to this. Hmm. You guys hear that? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, he said Greg calls his brother Greg. So that was interesting. <laughs> uh, that doesn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah, I. This was your twin brother. Curious, exact twin, identical twin brother. Um, yeah, I'm kidding. Um, okay, hang on. Here's that again. Uh, suspicious mystery grows debating Obama's tweeted photo of George Floyd. Um, I don't. Uh, I, I think Angel, you know about this guy. Um, he is. 
he's outsourced the outsourced the truth, but he posted. He's the one that found this. Proud this was a, yeah. yeah, this was a a bu Actually, listen. This is two minute. Two minutes. Is that okay if I play it? Yeah, I think so. Not hearing any sound. Oh, you probably haven't started yet. You're not hearing it. Uh. -uh. I didn't hear the Greg thing either. Yeah, me. I, I, I me saw either. it. I saw it. Okay. Okay. Well, basically, okay. So it's just basically saying this George Floyd picture was held up, held up and posted on the Barack Obama Foundation website. You go, you could actually look at the code and see it was there before this. Any, any, anyone knew who George Floyd was. Right. But again, they, no one. He, I don't think they expected anyone to know. Okay, that's George Floyd. But if you look at the picture, see, look at, take a look at that picture of George Floyd. It's yeah. obvious. It's obvious that it is a. Uh, it's it's this the, exact picture right here. Right. And right. also, dude, the brick that's a Freemasonry, you can have a hint of Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. But yeah. did you guys did you guys know this? Did you hear about his uh, George Floyd's second grade uh, teacher? On C they interviewed a George Floyd's wow. second grade teacher on um, on CNN. Are you guys familiar They're with that? They're doing it up, aren't they? Well, listen yeah. to this. Did you know about this, uh, Crips? Any of you? No. Do you know what her, na you know what her no. name is? What? Oh, my God. <laughs> her name is Wendell Sexton. This is Wendell high school. Sexton. This is her name. Her name's Wainel Sexton, like anal sex. Oh, Wainel Sexton. Man. Oh, my gosh. oh wow. That's a second grade teacher. Yeah. Okay. She, she supposedly had a uh, had a um a, a his artwork um has artwork that she, she kept all this time because he was such a uh, she made such an impression on him that he wanted to be oh. like a judge or something. And again, her <laughs> name is. Her name is Wayne Sexton. Wow. <laughs> That's, Unbelievable. You can't make this stuff wow. up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Sexton means something, too. I forget what it means. I think it's in, like, astrology. Yeah. It's, it's also an instrument. An instrument, okay. too. So, if I remember correctly, um, let me look that up real quick. Let me see. The other thing that Q said also too, that's uh, just uh, upcoming, said basically the uh, a lot of no notable army generals are going to come back and, and uh, basically come back and uh, uh, denounce Trump, basically saying he's doing a terrible job, like Michael Bolton, all these things. He's just basically saying that's, that's what's coming up next. The D class is starting to be released and all that stuff. And so you, you can see news there. But again, I, I just thought it was interesting because, again, you wouldn't know about that Twitter thing, I don't think, unless Q no. pointed it out. Uh, there are all kinds of things he points oh. out that are just interesting. Um, I mean, what what would they oh. have Trump do? Because honestly, I don't, I don't see what he could do. Because if he if he goes in with the military, they would just say, Guys. "No, I'm not a Trump fan." But I mean, seriously, like, I mean, even if he's all behind this, like, it makes sense that he wouldn't he wouldn't uh, step in because he's just gonna he, he does better if he doesn't if he lets all this madness play out and lets everybody just get real freaked out about what happens if the left or even somebody like Biden who who would just be a doormat for the left uh, uh, gets their way. Like I, I was going to tell you today, I was in Cincinnati and uh, I heard there were, you know, riots and stuff in Cincinnati, but the only activism I saw today were a group of black guys in Trump hats handing out t-shirts that said <laughs> Donald F and Trump, uh, excuse my language, bitch, I'm the president. They were pro Trump <laughs> activists. Now I'm not for Trump, but I was like, this. I would. They'd never show this on the media. That this is the, this is the only activism going on that I see in Cincinnati, and it's the only black activists, and they're pro, they're conservative, <laughs> was, right. and they were being really they were really nice. I should have taken a picture, but uh, they were yeah, handing out these t-shirts. Let me interject something. Um, and looking up a sexton, it says an employee or officer of a church who is responsible for the care and upkeep of church property and sometimes for ringing bells and digging grades. An under officer huh. of a church whose duty is to act as a janitor and who has charge of the edifice, utensils, furniture, etc. 
In etymology, a sexton is a beetle, a burying beetle, and any member of the genus Necrophorus, which necro is, is about death. Um, <laughs> well, I think that's part of the reason the scarab is uh, exalted by the Egyptians. It's, you know, it eats shit. You know, that's what that's what these people are into. Um, and uh, like I said, Correction, that's your... what the demons are into making them into. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, and again, the, the, this, I thought that was just unbelievable in your face. Like, uh, can you make it any more obvious that her this teacher remember George Floyd? From 38 years ago, she has, still has a picture of uh, his artwork, remembers who he is, and her name happens to be – I've never heard of the name Wainel, first of all. No. But it's, no. it's Wainel. Her name is Wainel Sexton. It's, you can look it up yourself. Um, okay. Also, too, I meant to show a bunch of photos. Like, I lost them, unfortunately. Uh, so I'll be a little bit more organized next time. Um, and I also will bring a formal topic next time, too. Um, but uh, there's a bunch of 666s and Upstein pentagrams all over these riots. Um and these people, yeah. a lot of people just, it just, it's heavy with Satanism. Um, yeah. It's its pretty freaky. It, this is definitely uh, well, almost and of like. Of course, we have Chaz now. The, the I mean, that LARP. The, there you go. The, the, no. the, the, the Capitol Hill uh, Autonomous Zone in, in Seattle, where they have, ta so, quote unquote, taken over. Mm. Not taken over. They were literally handed the keys by by City Hall to, uh, to go play this little game where they have their own little. Uh, uh, like autonomous zone where like no cops are allowed in there. They're they've got like this SoundCloud rapper running yeah. around saying he's the police now and it's a joke. And this yeah. little part makes me think this is black propaganda. Like by black propaganda, I don't mean like black people propaganda. I mean black propaganda for the Republican Party um, because yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. Does the, the, the left would be crazy to be doing any of this right now? Uh, all this is going to do is make a landslide victory for Trump. I mean, people yeah. are terrified. Um, people in Seattle are, are scared because they're, these idiots have come over there. They're not in college right now because there's no college. So they're just taking over this area and they're they're making people show ID to get into their own apartments. And, you know, the, this, the, <laughs> you know, I, I, I just think that this is a is a boon for Trump. He, you know, he should send them like. You know, uh, a big care package, and say, you know, thank you for the for the 2020 election because, um, it you know this this actually oh, all the people yeah. that might have tolerated the crazy leftists before, including mm -hmm. you know a lot of uh, a dyed in the wool like uh, Democrat black people who have just always voted Democrat. This isn't they don't want this. Mm -hmm. And this would be enough to move them. All right, no, I can't. <laughs> we can't. We can't have this. This is right. threatening people's sense of security and stability. You know, right? Um, uh, with these what? little brats running around, uh, you know, uh, t t with guns, uh, and uh, you know, these jerks who talk about their constitutional rights when they want to get rid of the Constitution, but when it does, you know, when it when it like you know behooves them or it's uh, something that you know. They can, you know, like, like use like, oh, this is our right of free speech or a second amendment, but they want to get rid of the constitution. So, but, you know, <laughs> they hate the constitution when, whenever their one of their enemies uses it um, for, you know, to defend their rights. But yeah. um, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I mean, this is just be madness to like, especially if they're saying Biden is their guy, nobody's going to think that Biden is going to protect them from these people. No. No. And I mean, how many black people have had their businesses? How many black people have we seen uh, have their lives destroyed by by this? You know, um, uh, and but black people yelling at these people. I mean, they've they've shown us plenty of this to even to even. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't I don't believe that this is some this whole thing is anything anybody except for some psycho college it, age to really get on board with. Yeah, yeah, it's an agenda. We know, we we're we're hip to the fact that they have an agenda and they're trying to move us in a particular direction. But I, I wanted to continue, guys, just for a little bit with this definition of the sexton because there, there it's kind of it's well, you you tell me. Let me let me finish reading here. Historically, in North America, the and the United Kingdom, the sexton was sometimes a minor municipal officer responsible for overseeing the town graveyard. In the United Kingdom, the position still exists today related to management of the community's graveyard, and the sexton is usually employed by the town parish 
or community council. And then it goes on and it says the origin of the name, the word extant, and sacred sacristan, both derive from the medieval Latin word sacristanus, meaning custodian of sacred objects. The sexton represents the popular development of the word via the old French sur gres steen. And it just goes on to talk about all of the different job duties related to uh, being basically a caretaker, but mostly beginning with graveyards and death, but also other administrative duties concerning the management of, of stuff. So, you know, I, I as as we've all, well, I always say words have meaning. I don't think it's it's um, an accident that this is tied to something who's a caregiver for death. Because what are we seeing happening? Something is being destroyed and killed. Uh, and 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 it looks like these people are just literally trying to overthrow America and destroy the country from within. But you know, I mean, that's what I see. What do you guys see? Well, I agree. Uh, that's what the Q says too all the time. That it, it was not, they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't uh, uh, invade, so they infiltrated. Uh, and that's basically saying that every it's stuff that we already knew, but he's just kind of confirming it. But again, that's one thing I like. Again, I'm not a fan of Q. I don't trust anyone. He did not. He, he explicitly said the Earth is not flat, and you got the mm -hmm. space, uh, space force, and all that garbage. Um, but there are I mean, the information. A lot of times, it's just, it just it speaks for itself. You don't does it, you don't need uh, any trust in him per se. It's just there's mainstream information that is often buried or you know, un, not exposed. So he'll he'll bring it to the surface so that kind of gives you a better idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so the main thing that was this week was the George Floyd thing. That absolutely is a hoax. You, I think we already knew that, but uh, <laughs> uh, just the occult nature of it. Uh, the hallmarks all over this thing, not only the, well, the protests, but the uh, that hoax in, in general. Um, I, mean, I think even tonight, uh, a, a Wendy's was burnt down, you know, so no one's going to be able to, it's a point where you, no one's going to be arrested anymore, almost, it seems like, or, or uh, it, it's very difficult. It's law and order. Yeah, it, it's anarchy, exactly. Yeah, um Actually, I, I I have to point it out here because I think this was in the message that I put up. The media, I put it in the, uh, I didn't do this. It was uh, Pastor Stephen Darby, the late Pastor Stephen Darby. He did a sermon about the satanic media. Yes, and I pointed it in, my, posted it in my community uh, chat section where he talks about how the media is an instrument uh, of these agents. But one of the things he covers in that is he talks about uh, the protocols and how they have stated they were going to do all this. And it, at some point they were going to unleash the nihilists. And, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. We're, I made we're a video seeing... about that. Yeah. yeah. I literally yeah. said that they were going to do that in order to drive because in the letters, it says it's not the elders. Of Zion, it's not the protocols. It's actually the, the three world wars letters from Albert Pike that people say, Oh, it's a forgery. Right. But I, whenever they've right. asked them, well, when was it, when was it forged? Cause it, you know, it was still a really long time ago. Uh, so, and it was predicting stuff that happened way later. So I don't really care who, who wrote it. Cause I'm sure it was probably some CIA OSS person. Um, anyway, uh, but, or, but you I, know, uh, or I was going to say, or satanically inspired, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Either way. But, but, what I wanted to make, and then I'll let you continue, Sister Angel. What he said was, the way that you know that it's true is if you see it coming to pass. But go ahead. Well, I mean, I basically exactly. just uh, like, 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 I don't know, it was like nine months ago. I don't know, maybe, maybe a year ago. Um, I made a video called "Unleash the Nihilists," and I said that they would. Um, I just like talking about what Pike said in the letter that they would that they would unleash the nihilists, these people, the anarchy, um, to drive everybody in the opposite direction to show them the the problem with um, like like what like like basically how bloody and awful uh, the world would be um, if you let atheists and uh, uh, basically the left run amok. So it's not an actual attempt to drive people to the left; it's the opposite. Um, that's what Pike said in the letter. And it's also in the process, they would somehow destroy.
Christianity and atheism in one felt swoop. Now, I haven't figured out how they would do that, but that was what he said in the letter. And um, uh, I, 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 I was reminded because somebody uh, commented under my video after this all started and said, oh, wow, this aged well. Because, uh, I mean, when I first made it, I mean, a lot of people were like, no, 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 because they don't want to believe that that um, that the answer to the problem, you know, isn't like basically just being some like right wing person. Like if that's not the answer to the problem, the answer is Jesus and, and everything else will be used to deceive you. But they want to believe they're outsmarting Satan somehow of being conservative. <laughs> As, you know, and, 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 and that's, I, I just, you know, I, I mean, I, I've looked at the, you know, the letters, I mean, they talk about this and, and I don't think that, see, that's the thing. I don't underestimate normal people to where I think that the majority of the public, black or white, is going to see this playing out and be down with it. Oh, I'm smarter than they are, but they're mm -hmm. all done and they just, this is how they want to live. I don't think that. I don't think I'm so much smarter than everybody. I don't think I'm so much smarter than, in fact, the media manipulators who, who uh, play these games and who have convinced us of so many things and got us to, 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 to you know, to push us so far in the, the opposite direction of not only God, but common sense and our own self-interest in this country and elsewhere. Uh, and they did it with subtlety and gradualism. For the past several decades, you know, past hundred years, they were very subtle. They, you know, they did, they didn't, they didn't even stir up much of a backlash because they were so gradual. And I don't mm -hmm. think I'm, I'm so much smarter than them that I don't realize that all this stuff that's happening is going to make people, <laughs> make people turn to, you know, back toward tradition and common sense and, you know, what we'd call conservative or traditional values. Um, you know, like, I don't think that it, it just had that effect on me, but I'm smart and that everybody else is dumb and that the, and that the social engineers don't realize the effect of things like this and what it causes people to do. People who have families and people who are just regular everyday people that want what everyday people want. None of this is in their interest. And this is scary and it's, and it's disturbing. And these people, they don't relate to, and these people are ridiculous. These little snowflakes who nobody likes <laughs> no you know what i mean it's like it's like we're not going to see this what literally a unicorn riot you know which i guess that's a website but that's what it is a unicorn riot or a little snowflake riot and everybody's going to be like oh yeah i identify with them that's who i want i, I want them to win the culture war no way they've been right. jerks they've been <laughs> beating people in the streets they've been you know now we've got them yelling at like the african uh, american I think it was like like an African American council or something or advisory board in Seattle. They they came out and said, "You guys are hijacking this whole cause, um, and making it about communism." And they're getting booed, but it's supposed to be about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. But when uh, the the black leadership of that city <laughs> tries to speak to you and tell you how they feel about how you're representing this whole thing, you start booing them. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Like this isn't going to win anybody over. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that I see, I just don't see how I don't believe it's meant to because I don't, I don't think people are that stupid, including the people pulling the levers. I don't, I don't know. I just, I don't think, I don't think this is how the left would think. This is how we win. Terrify mm. everybody, <laughs> yeah. you know, and put well, Trump in a position to look really good and be the oh, savior yeah. well, we for can, once. People that don't even like him. Yeah, we can see all of that, what you're saying, playing out. I think most people who are aware to how they try to pit humanity against one another, they're not falling for this. But, Brother brother Ben, did you did you finish where you wanted to uh, go with this, Brother? Yeah, I, I just, again, I only wanted a few seconds to talk about it. Uh, next week or next time, uh, I'll have something more substantial. But, yeah, okay. yeah, it's true. I think it's a hoax. That's interesting that you – that's the first time I've actually seen something that, like, you know, oh. I'm like, wow, I guess that he really did originate that information because I've never, I never. No, saw I, that that, it happens quite a bit. I, that does happen yeah. quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I think a lot of things that you might, you might hear of that, that they don't attribute to Q actually came from Q first. But right. again, it's not, uh, it's not, you know, I don't, I don't trust the plan. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm having real trouble. Um, I, I, I can't listen to the. I can't. I can't listen to it. I know that they're doing all kinds of stuff. I'm fully aware it's a psychological operation from the time those spellcasters come, excuse me, newscasters come on from the time they go off. But I, I had a report from a, a family uh, member today that told me that, that somebody was alleged 
to have been lynched up here where I live, uh, not, t not too far from where we are. And I told her, I can't hear that. I can't hear it because I'm praying to God that it's not true. Because there is an element that even if the stuff that we're seeing is a lie. The reaction that will be they real. Right. And, and the yep, victimization a, and the, 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 the fights, the, the, the deaths that will come about is what they're trying to gin up. And yeah. I, I, I can't listen to that right now. I can't. I said, uh, I'm have to try to find out the only way that I can see. And I'm not even sure we can get at the truth anymore because. There was a person years ago, I don't remember what channel, they're long gone because YouTube have dropped people down the memory hole, where they were exposing that these deaths that we were seeing, like Michael Brown uh, and a couple of other characters, I remember specifically Michael Brown, so I'll only talk about that one, where the, the way he proved that they were fake was that they didn't have the death certificates. He, went, he knew what website he could go to to check and with a certain period of time, once that person, they've had the funeral and all that, that there was no death certificate for the person. They didn't have that a 11 victims either, which is right. Crazy. Right. Watch this now. With, co with, with CV19, they have co-opted these doctors to lie and to be paid. They're conditioning doctors to lie. Now, who's the only ones? Okay, you have the only one who can pronounce death is the doctor. He's the one that determines who's dead. You know, paramedics can't do that. They can know you're dead. They'll never say it. They'll, they'll put the oxygen on. They'll try to revive the person. They'll do everything. Take Even if the your head's cut off. They yes, can. they cannot pronounce death. Only the doctor <laughs> or a coroner can pronounce death. So they, they've conscripted doctors who a lot of it, they've been pressured because the hospital administrators, the other people who are above them are forcing them to put CV19 on the death certificate when the person did not die from that. So what you're actually witnessing, it, it's not just about the $13,000 that they claim they were getting for doing that. It's the fact they're conscripting them to do evil and conditioning them to lie and falsify legal documents. So we're not going to even know what the truth is anymore because they're actually conditioning these doctors who will go along with it under threat of being fired or all of these different control measures where they'll make their life miserable if they don't do it. And this is real. My mother has a, a very good friend. She works at a hospital. Person works there uh, roughly 30 years with her. Her husband had cancer for a long time. He died. He did not have the flu. He didn't have a cold. What did they put on his death certificate? CV19. So, y'all, it's happening. So we're not going to even know what the truth is anymore because that's exactly what the Bible says. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? How are we going to get everything, everything, the documents that to try to get at the truth are being falsified and lies. They were doing that already, but now it's going even to the next level with that. You won't know what anybody died from. They could just say whatever. It is quite unnerving. Well, that's why we walk by faith and not by sight because oh, yeah. this, this world is fiction. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I was hesitant to say, well, you know, uh, George Floyd isn't even dead, you know, because I, what I, I did feel was that, you know, at the very least, he wasn't killed for, you know, I mean, you know, they said they work together and all that stuff. And, um, you know, I've heard some people theorizing that he, you know, that he was actually like knocked off because he, you know, he knew something and they were like involved in some sort of money laundering or something at that club. But I think it's much more likely that he just, you know, it's just like another one of these things where, you know, it's all, it's all a setup, you know, um, because, 
you know, I mean, and, and you know, even when things, it's funny because like if they set it up, they also layered in this information that would make you doubt whether or right. not, it, oh, well, well, instead of it being a setup, it's like, no, it's just he wasn't killed for racial reasons. It was Chauvin, you know, knocking him off because because they're involved in some scheme because they work together. Just like, you know, um, with Trayvon Martin, some people say, oh, he was, you know, he didn't even die. It was a hoax. But then you have the other layer where he was actually beating up George Zimmerman and George Zimmerman. They actually have the call where he's actually calling the 911 for help. Um uh, and then on top of that, you know, he, he's Latino, he's not white, um, but like it could even just, but his, his parents are Freemasons. So it's like, what, did they sacrifice their son or is it a, you know, is it, I don't know which one, but he, they're like, you know, they've got, they were wearing, I think his dad's like a, one of the, what are they called? A Shriner. Shriner. I saw him in a Fez. I'm not sure if that's something right. else, but, but um, they always layer in all these things where you, you're, you're not supposed to know it's weaponized. It's confusion so that you also get the people that are on a conspiracy note uh, at each other's throats. No, it's this. No, it's that. No, you're making us sound crazy. But it's like, just like with nine 11, mm -hmm. like, I don't really know. I, you know, I can't say for sure. Like no one died at nine 11. That would be very hard for me to believe. But there's no death certificates. But did they do that on purpose to sow confusion? Right. You know, because you won't know I'm... which end is up. You don't know what to believe. It's almost exactly. it's crazy because even even it, what's horrific is because you don't know what to believe. Then when something does go down, you don't even know how to feel about it. You don't know if you exactly. should have sympathy. You don't know if you should mourn. You don't know if you should cry. The only thing that's safe to do is pray because you don't know if it's real. So all right. I do when I hear this stuff, like this young man that was supposedly lynched up here, I pray and I say, Lord, if it is true, comfort the family, send a witness, you know, that kind of thing. And if it's not true, may the lies be exposed. Is it on the news? What else can we pray? Yeah, she saw it on the news. And <gasps> yeah, I was I like, saw, I, I saw can't. I can't. I said, don't tell me. I can't. We're being inundated with just that would next so level okay. evil, next level evil. I'm praying to God it is a hoax. Because the the <laughs> the only alternative, if it is real, is, is more horrific than it being a hoax. Right. Well, you know, but I mean, it's like it, it would it would be kind of it, it would make me mad if that's just outraged everybody. But then like the man that was killed, uh, David is the name David Dorn, the the set the 77 year old uh, retired police officer who was like shot to death because he was helping his friend who's right. store was getting looted. That's not going to that's not going to cause an outrage. But if some if, if, if somebody gets on, on the other side, gets killed. Uh, and a lynching, then that will, you know, it's like ridiculous. It's like, this is all, there's no special, like, I used to think that I, I used to, I would have been this, I would have been that way. I would have been like, no, no, it's different. He was killed, but it was for greed. It's different if they do it for racism. No, it's not. There's no special, it's all hate. And it's like, that's how they've gotten. I know a lot of these kids that are, are, are down there in Chaz right now. I, I feel bad. I like the white kids. I know how it feels like I was there before it was cool to do. I was, I was all like, I was like totally militant and crazy as an elementary school kid and nobody else was around me reinforcing it. It was not something, there was no Antifa. I was just very, mm -hmm. very angry about, uh, you know, black oppression and, and, and had a huge white guilt and I, and racism was the special classification of, of hate, but the Bible doesn't put it there. It's mm -hmm. making people insane right now, mm -hmm. like insane. They're acting crazy because mm -hmm. it's like they, any amount of hatred on their side is fine. Throwing Molotov cocktails to people, uh, uh, you know, these kids uh, do just they're, they're they're they don't have any any sympathy for the businesses they're looting. They don't have any sympathy for the people that they've killed. Uh, how many black? It was mostly black people in Chicago. Their deadliest day in sixty years, but that's okay. That's okay mm -hmm. as long as it's not racism. It's mm -hmm. insane. It's actual insanity right now. And it's, it's, it's I, I mean, racism is right. ugly, but it's like, it's people, I don't know, they've turned it into an idol or something where it's like, well, it's but hate then, is and hate. then throw into the mix what I keep bringing up, which is general. Now, I think, Brother uh, Ben, I know why it's called adversarial. 
general adversarial networks, and deep fakes. We literally can't even believe our own eyes. If we don't witness it, we don't know what we're seeing. Right. And even if we did see it, yeah. could we determine whether or not, excuse me, whether or not it's been staged? Yeah. Uh, you know, because some of the stuff that we see transpire that may be legitimately have played out physically, in other words, it's not digital, that it still could be staged. I mean, for, take, for example, the fact that pallets of bricks were delivered to these hot, hot zones, which were the city halls, which I believe they did, because they knew that the people that had money, when they opened the courts and stuff back up, was going to sue the pants off of their behinds for their criminality. And overstepping, like in our state, the governor exceeded his authority. He violated the law. And when he did, when it, the, all the way back to May 7th, it was supposed to end. He had no authority legally to continue the lockdown, to continue any me control measures. And now that it's being pointed out, the people who have money, whose lives and businesses have been affected, I don't think they're just going to sit idly by. They're the ones that have the money to sue them. So what do they do? They take bricks and stuff and they go pay a bunch of people to yep. go out there and stir stuff up at City Hall around town. Where is where you have to go to file complaints? The courthouses, where are they? Downtown. What do you want to bet most of the accident. people that got paid are black people and the ones actually rioting and all acting, being all crazy and like doing it for free are the white kids. Because I've seen the black, the black kids that, that have been arrested for looting say it's about the money. And, and, and so they, they had to be paid to do it. But guess who looks bad? Guess who gets to look bad is black people. That's how that's how the media, you know, like that they're just doing it on their own. No, but the white, I bet you that the little, the, it's the Antifa kids are actually the ones doing it for free. You know, they're, I mean, although I know they do pay some of them too um, to, 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 to join in. But I know that that's real because I had that insanity. I was that insane. I, I don't think I would have gone this mm -hmm. far. I would not, but I know for a fact that you you can stir white kids up to where they will do acts of violence like this and genuinely uh, and and tear it on all those statues and just oh uh, wait w when was this guy when did this guy live oh it was 1800s he was racist you know he was awful yeah. he deserved it you know like just tear it all down I know because I used to be that way so I know that, that that you don't have to pay kids to be that way you just have to manipulate them but what I never did actually see. And I tried to find it because I wanted somebody, a partner in crime. I wanted somebody to validate me. I never saw, but, I never talked to a black person that had that, that had that rage. I know they exist. I know that there are some, and especially college kids, but I never, I never, I, they never validated me. They never were on board. Every time I would try to talk to you know, like, guys, isn't this awful? Shouldn't, oh, I hate all these people. And don't you hate them? It isn't a terrible, isn't America the worst? And all white people, they need to, you know, oh, it would be okay if they all just died. They're all so bad. We're, you know, and me. But <laughs> I felt that way. I was crazy. I never had a, a black person validate that. But mm -hmm. when they, they, they pay, they'll, they, you know, these kids in the city, they'll, they'll quickly do these things for money. And also well, the prisoners they release. Well, yeah, that's part COVID. of the dynamic. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. part of the dynamic. They've broken people down to the people who are on the bottom that have nothing and, and have no money. And if they're running ads to come make a thousand dollars or two thousand or five thousand, these people are selling their souls for that little bit of scrap to go out there and just, oh, we get to go do whatever the hell we want. And it just feeds yeah. into the whole if you're already angry and you're already frustrated and you're already upset. And they, first of all, they don't have God in their heart. They don't have any understanding of the knowledge of the truth, which is Jesus. They don't understand. This is not his way. They, they, these are people who have no, no conscience or knowledge or semblance of God, because if they did, they would not be out there doing the things they're doing for whatever right. acts are real that are transpiring. And we absolutely condemn them because that violence, the Bible says, vengeance in mind, saith the Lord, I will repay it. Cause when he do it, he ain't going to miss. He ain't going to hit the wrong person. Uh, he's going to get who deserves to be God. But, you know, what was really, really something and, and just sad. And I say this, I don't give a bloom if it was the worst Confederate person you ever thought lived and he owned the most slaves in history. Here's the problem. 
when you're dismantling that, you're removing the truth of history and what transpired. And this is exactly. this is what is being done. They are destroying even the reference points that people would have uh, two generations from now. Say that really existed. That was real. It shows what They're we destroying overcame, it. Too. We overcame yes. that as a country. It's amazing that we were actually able to come back together as a country after that, the bloodiest were, you know, in, in U.S. I mean, I think it was like the most lives lost in U.S. history to a war. Um, and we were able, not only uh, Southerners and Northerners, but Blacks and Whites. Look what we were able to do. We, we, we stitched together a culture that's all our own in America. It's all, it's all, uh, you know, from Blacks, Whites, North and South. We, we, we came back together and we did not fall apart. We did not get... You know, I mean, we should have just had to go our separate ways and have to at least two different countries, you know, but none of that happened. We all came back together. That's amazing. And I think, yeah. that, that, you know, that's one thing I never thought of until somebody else, because I, I was kind of like, yeah, you know, it's our history. But, I, you know, I don't care too much if the Confederate statues get torn down, even though I understand now that it wasn't all about racism. And, you know, even a lot of slavery was just about slavery. Uh, and not even necessarily racism, because I guess, I, shot to my shock, some black people owned slaves um, and Indians, Native Americans. It was just opportunistic. But but they but I know what it's like to see it in this other light where they, these people were just blood drinking monsters to me. All these people, I don't care who they were, even just the white people that didn't have slaves, but weren't burning the plantations down to me. They were all evil. And, they, and I had no nuance. I had no I just totally bought it all up and I hated them all with a mm. passion in my heart. I hated those people as a child. And um, I would have been so happy to see these things torn down. And now I realize that's, that it's, first of all, it's a communist tactic to do that. Yes, it is. the way a country's history. But yes, also, it, it really doesn't do any honor to the fact that, yeah, we overcame it. And hey, guess what? The America, uh, and I believe England, uh, nobody else had ever outlawed slavery. Or uh, no, I mean, that people still do it. <laughs> and this was yes. the first country, uh, and I believe England too. I don't know how that works, but two two countries at least that actually said we're gonna we're gonna actually outlaw this and take a stand against it to where we're not gonna do it. Most other places, they don't feel bad about conquering other people. They don't feel bad about it. It's like, yeah, great, I'm more powerful than you. I can do what I want, you know. Um, and so <laughs> it's like, and that's being lost in all this. I never mm -hmm. thought about it that way. I never thought about it that way as a kid, that, wait a minute, nobody else even bothered to do that. And in fact, if anybody, uh, any other countries have outlawed slavery since then, it was because we did it first. We started that in motion. Um, and I also didn't know that Brazil had like three, to, like that South America actually got most of the slaves. I didn't know that. I didn't know I that. I don't remember. You don't... Oh, yeah. Th yes, they did. The, the, the slave trade went all over the world, not just America. Uh, hey, the, the British East India Company was one of the biggest slave traders on the earth. But yeah. um, that that being that being said, uh, I do recall Spain did outlaw slavery because Florida used to be Spanish territory. Okay. And and when it it was when they did it was free territory, which is why the slaves in the South were running. They were not running up north to New York or something like that. They were running from Georgia. Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana to Florida because it was free territory. Okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I, I didn't know that they were right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was shocked to find out that just a few years ago, the Cherokee people, I think it was the Cherokee got into sort of a, a tiff with, you know, like the NAACP and stuff because somebody was demanding reparations uh, or no, they wanted, they oh, wanted to be true. entitled to the, to the Native American identity or something like they wanted because okay. they are Native okay. American, and I'm then they were to... like, "No, but you guys were just slaves." No, but the Indians no. said that. No. Okay, now watch this, sister. I can, we're gonna have to end here because it's getting late. We're coming up on the hour. We, we can start with this uh, next week if you like. We can pick up where we left off. But uh, if you guys were to look up, if you're interested in this, this is what's called the 1866 Indian Treaties. And one of the dirty little secrets, Dr. Claude Anderson has been talking about this, and he has been trying to get um, this before um, the courts, because in the 1866 Indian treaties, blacks were supposed to have been included. Yeah. 
and they reneged. Okay. Okay. Who, who reneged? Uh, there was the provision. The government. The government okay. and the Indians. The Indians appealed to the government and said uh, they, there was a senator. It was back in like 1940, and it took him like three years to respond to them. I don't remember the senator's name. I have that information somewhere uh, where they went to him and they said, look, these blacks are petitioning to, to uh, get uh, a part of what we have received as, as Native uh, Americans. And we don't want the, the, the five uh, tribes and all that. And because, and, see, my, my family member, she's one quarter Cherokee. But because she's uh, considered black, she can't get nothing. Her mother was 50% Cherokee and her grandmother was 100% Cherokee. But because they're considered black, they can't get anything. <gasps> Mo I mean, most oh, black yes. people have more Native American DNA when they test them than African DNA, which is this, very interesting. And some people have surmised that there were actually black people here already and that they didn't actually import all of them. And that that would because I can't account for the amount of Native American ancestry that's in a lot of a lot of uh, black people that get tested. It's 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 too high because the, oh. the, the testing isn't very good anyway to identify Native American genetics. Because I, I went through that with mine because I'm part Native American and I had to go it was years ago. It was not easy. You could be a lot more Native American and still test like barely any at all. But a lot of black people were getting like 60%. And, and so people have wondered, there's some people that theorize that they weren't, that black people were here already. A lot of them. Um, yeah. And we know history's bogus. There, so that could have been. There's a lot of different theories, but I'll tell you one that's not a theory is the fact that he had been trying to sue. In fact, when was it? It wasn't last year. It was in 20, I think it was 2018 in November, if I remember correctly. He had a hearing to be heard on the matter concerning those 1866 Indian treaties. And this almost never happens. They just canceled the hearing. What? See, when you schedule a hearing to go to court and all that, they don't do that. Y'all, they don't do that. <laughs> they don't do that. Uh, certain days of the week are for certain types of legal procedures and hearings. And they just canceled the hearing. <laughs> So wait a uh, minute. Why do you think that is? Uh, uh, is it because it would, it would because, because treaties? It is an actual treaty, and treaty supersedes international law. Oh, see, I and was wondering don't if it was want... also it's a blemish to the left, to the narrative, because even just knowing that, like the the narrative is supposed to be that the only people that are that are ever capable of any type of racial hatred are white people, and these Native Americans being like that, doing oh no, there were like there were tribes that owned slaves. And that that yeah, is a historical I, the, fact. Do you know how mad I was to find out that the Indian tribe that I'm that that I'm Cherokee, but then I found out they own slaves too. I was trying to ameliorate my white guilt by being like, yeah, but I'm Native American too. I'm not all bad. And then <laughs> <laughs> they own slaves. I was so bad. Yes. There's a whole lot. Uh, the, our history has been skewed. There's a whole lot. The stuff that they tell y'all is black history. Most of that junk is not black history. If you really want to learn, those who are interested about true black history, the best person I could recommend because he is not a bigot, he is not a racist, is Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, I would recommend any of his videos. Go check him out. Just listen to him talk, and you'll learn a whole bunch of things you did not know. Um, and he's got some wonderful information. Now, that's how it became enlightened that Florida was actually uh, free territory because Spain owned it. And Spain had outlawed slavery. So that's why that's why. Because I, I knew were not Key West didn't all. have slaves uh, where right. I was from, but I thought it was just Key West. Right? But they were union owned, actually. Key West was like yeah. a union outpost. So many blacks had fled to Florida uh, during that time that uh, when Andrew Jackson went into Jacksonville and captured it and drove them out. On the Trail of Tears, it wasn't just Native Americans. Over 30% of the people on the Trail of Tears were Blacks, were Black Americans. Okay, wow. they don't tell you that. And that's how they ended up in Oklahoma and then built themselves up into what became Black Wall Street. And then that got destroyed behind a bunch of evil that went down. So, uh, you know. Yeah, I do know about you, that. If you don't, but, but people don't know how, how did all them Blacks get to Oklahoma? Because Oklahoma wasn't slave territory right how did it get up there well it was because of the trail of tears in See, fact nobody the, much was living there until the trail of tears right right a lot of they, right, it, it wasn't how, yeah. considered like fertile type land and ground and all that stuff that's why they there. gave it to the indians yeah and then they, yeah. And then they found it was a little better than they thought so they took most of it 
back and put them on reservations Girl, in Oklahoma. Uh, we've reached we've reached the end here though, but I'll put some of the links in the description, guys, for some of Dr. Claude Anderson's lectures. Uh, again, we're talking about information. I'm not ascribing to any kind of bigotry. I think the Lord's gonna work all of this stuff out. And, you know, he's he's the only one that can straighten this mess out. But I know one thing, I'm not going to be conscripted into somebody's demonic psyop doing Jedi mind tricks, ginning us up to do evil and destroy, uh, you know, the country that we call home. That's some absolute devilry. And I'm not going to participate. And I don't know anybody who's thinking correctly that will participate in such I don't know I mean I've thing. seen tons of black people and not only just in my town but in Cincinnati I, I not even so much as a dirty look I don't know who's doing this but I haven't I don't I don't think it's catching on you know with there's a silent majority always that has common sense of right. I don't care who who it is there's always a silent majority um and so uh, you know I, I I see a lot of people getting really disheartened but just look around you Look around you at all of the all of the black and white people shopping and dining and doing all their normal things. And nobody's to, is it going on around you? Just like you said about COVID, you know, I, I haven't seen, you know, I know I know it's happening, you know, places. But, you know, until I see it organically popping up wherever there are like, you know, black people uh, where they're just all mad. Like, <laughs> I don't believe, you know, I, I think it's a it's a I think a lot of it's urban, you know, in these cities. And I think a lot of it's uh, very much uh uh, bought and paid for and um uh, i don't i don't I, I just wonder if maybe we'll look back on it a little bit like we do covid you know like wait it never it never actually came to reality around me like it never actually became real in my life just right. like you never saw me even die in a covid right. you know i'm wondering if that's because it seems like that's how they're playing things now they're just waiting us out because they know eventually we're going to figure out like it's not actually taking off it's not catching on mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> around us, but they can scare us for like a month or two. Like that is, oh, it just hasn't hit here yet. The race mm -hmm. rides just haven't hit here yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but all right, yep, that's well, Sister Age, we have reached the end of the broadcast for this evening. I do want to see to leave us. He said he could not stay until uh, 4 a.m., so he actually stayed a lot longer than he had anticipated. And I thank you, Brother Cripps. For joining us tonight, we do appreciate all your insights on the Shawshank Redemption and also sharing with us your experience with your friend who has been um, beguiled, if I can use the word, by the Lordship Damnation Line. Um, Brother Ben, say good evening to everyone. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Oh, yes, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really surprised that we were able to go as long as we were because I don't think really any of us had really uh, a burning topic. Um, and I mean, I, I'm definitely going to plan on bringing one next time. But um, uh, yeah, it was just good good to be uh, to commune with you guys again. Uh, it had been a couple of weeks and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it and looking forward to the next time. Okay, thank you so much. And Sister Angel, would you like to say good night to everyone? I'm oh, sorry. Good morning to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning to everyone. I uh, I'm just now getting back in the house, so perfect timing. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I forgot it's been a week or it had been two weeks. I was I wasn't here last week, so. Uh, good to be back, and I think we did fine. I think we don't even really need to have a topic pre plan. I think it's right, you know, we riff off of each other anyway. So I think it's it's just nice to have it so people know, have an idea what we're talking about, though. I think that's all the main reason we do it. Is, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming out. Um, we had, I think at, at one point, I think the high was about 38 people, roughly, in the uh, the chat this evening. Brother Luke, uh, from, Brother Luke says from uh, CES, a Church of the Eternal Secure came by, Sister Renee stopped by, the Bible Literalist had stopped by at one point in the evening. A lot of these people had to go because, uh, you know, they can't stay up all night. We do understand it. The, the wonderful thing about the stream is that you're able to come back and listen. You know, if you go, oh, I made it three hours, <laughs> you can come back and listen to the last hour. And I also want to let everyone know who is in the chat that if you want to continue talking, I know some of you guys are friends out there and you love chatting back and forth. When we end tonight and the music begins to play on the outro, you will be able to continue to talk for about 
five minutes back and forth in the chat if you'd like to say good night to everyone. And again, I thank you guys for coming out and spending this evening and morning with us uh, talking and considering uh, the different topics that we we covered. And by tomorrow uh, morning or at time early, I will have the links up to the topics that we discussed and other points that I referenced like Dr. Claude Anderson and some of the other things that I mentioned uh, so that you can go and check those things out for yourself. So as always, be blessed, beloved of the Most High God, in the name of King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good night.